everybody, welcome to Frame Trap. It is a very, very special episode. Joining me is a guest. We don't normally have guests, but today we have a guest, and his name is Maximilian Dude. Hey, Max. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm doing. I'm doing good. Uh, uh, it's been a. It's been a while since the game trailers days. Yeah, it has been a while. You couple, came in about a, about a, a couple months now. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like it. Yeah. Uh, since Easy Allies has started, I feel like everything has just been in fast forward all the time. But uh, yeah, the GT days. I think you came in to play Bandit of Two. We came in. I came in for a show with Kyle, uh, yeah. and then, funny enough, my history with Damiani and a few other fighting game guys goes all the way back to like 2007, 2008 with like Street Fighter Four. Yeah. And they would bring me in to get capture of the game to do cool combos <laughs> and stuff. And so they needed you to be good. I actually didn't know this. That yeah, this it, it, and I never really told anybody. But yeah. now that it doesn't exist anymore, I guess it's kind of fine. But we would just go in and like, hey, just do some cool Marvel Two combos when that HD game came out, or yeah. when Marvel. 3 Three came out. It was like, hey, come do this cool stuff, and we can just yeah. play some matches. And that was that was sort of, sort of my early access to figuring stuff out. I would assume <laughs> that was Patrick. Yes. What a fraud. This is <laughs> a, this is before <laughs> my time. Was really, yeah. It was really good too. Yeah. yeah. Game show is exposed, <laughs> man. Uh, before we get too much more into this, Kyle Bosman also oh, yeah. here. Yeah. Hi, also here. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm going to be hosting you through this. I'm Ben Moore. Uh, but man, <laughs> I this is really rattling me. Game show is exposed. Yep. Um, yeah, can you talk about your history with Damiani? Because I kind of know it, but there are times we get people who bring up like, "Oh, hey, I saw Damiani pop up in one of Max's yeah, streams." Yeah, so I've known I've known uh, Mike for a while now. Like, mm -hmm. probably it's actually been about eleven years. Uh, he, he moved out here, and he, he w w was friends with my friend Matt, who's like Simmons slash Doctor Doom mm -hmm. on on our show, and uh, I just knew him like uh, through 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 Matt as he worked through game trailers. So every once in a while, like you would invite us down, like for Street Fighter things, and that's how I got to know Patrick, and mm -hmm. we started recording some episodes—not episodes, but just like gameplay footage. Like let's get a couple of people that kind of know what they're doing. So me and Patrick right. would just like grind on the game for like 30 or 40 minutes, or whatever fighting game it was at the time. And uh, I, I lived in the area, so yeah, I just passively knew Mike every once in a while, Damiani, mm -hmm. and uh, we would go see movies together and hang out and play Street Fighter Four <laughs> yeah. back in the day. Feels like a lifetime ago. It's just... Uh, yeah, it's really weird to think that. <laughs> I feel like since I, I kind of became aware of you and following you, I don't even remember how long ago it was, but just it seems like year over year, like your growth has been explosive, man. It's been it's been, it's been been crazy, and there there hasn't been like like a Fortnite moment where it's just like, it's going okay, whoa, whoa, and then yeah. like the spike happens. That's actually like never happened to me, even mm -hmm. when... I was working with Capcom for the first time back in like 2011, and we got uh, like assist me like official to be with them. That was a huge deal for me. Um, but that was like right around the time I was losing my job, and that's when I chose to do YouTube full time. And I was like, maybe I can actually make this a thing. Yeah. So it was a good kick in the butt. But ever since then, like from the Killer Instincts to the Mortal Kombat Xs to yeah the Street Fighters and the Marvel Infinites, like everything that's been sort of carrying fighting games ever since like 2011 ish when I started. Um, it's been this like gradual, just eh, pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. It just keeps like it's it's been a gradual growth, and that's I'm completely cool with that because it kind of means that your audience sort of sticks with you mm -hmm. instead of like those spikes. And I the spikes are great, like they're great for channels um, and great monetarily, but usually they don't stick with you. Like, right. And that's the thing, and that's what I kind of appreciate about a fighting game audience, and you get people that love fighting games and love classic fighting games and love the arcade experience from back in the day. They're kind of older, mm -hmm. and as, as adults, you kind of attach to things a bit longer. Right. Like you, you kind of like it for the rest of your life. Um, or if you're younger and you're part of that spike, it, it's really cool for a week, maybe a year, mm -hmm. and then you don't really look into it anymore. So I don't know. I, I super, I treasure my audience because yeah. everyone just sort of seems to, to to care about us just as much as I do. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you just recently crossed a million subscribers, which must have been pretty crazy. And yeah, yeah I, w when we were promoting you on the show, I was like, something I really admire about Max is his work ethic. I mean, you're putting out videos every day, you're streaming all the time for hours on end. And I find that so admirable, but there are also times I almost like want to reach through the screen and go like, hey, are you okay, man? Like, do you need a break? <laughs> there, uh, there. <laughs> it, it, let me it, help you out. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's a good, it's, it's a good suggestion. Uh, I, I'd say right now I'm in a pretty good state. I'm actually, 
getting people that are in the community that are like mods of my my Twitch channel and stuff to help me out with editing. And oh, that's cool. That's been awesome, and they've yeah. actually been a part of big productions like Assist Me. There was an there was an Alien episode that we did an Alien movie where we had a really bad Alien costume, and that was actually one of our mods mm -hmm. that came over to to play that part. Um, so they've been helping me out with editing, which is cool in in some ways, but I still do a lot of it hands on myself. Uh, but in 2014, 2015, I started working on Killer Instinct for uh, the cinematics and the trailers for KI. And that was season two, uh, the end of season one, season two, and season three. So I was doing that. I was working about 60 hours a week on KI from home. Mm -hmm. I was streaming five to six days a week, six hours a day, and I was also putting out two YouTube videos a day. I aged 10 years <laughs> in six months, and I could yeah. see it in my face. Like yeah. I went back and I watched the archives. I was like, oh my God, I can't, how did I do that never again? I just can't, can't do that shit again. Uh I can't imagine what that's like because it, it doesn't happen often, I would say, but sometimes I'll just review a game yeah. and by the time it's out, it's just like, I can't do any more of this right now. Like I need you to need put this break. down. Yeah. yeah. And it seemed like with Killer Instinct, you just loved it so much that it really, from my perspective, it didn't seem like it, it kind of affected the way that you enjoyed that game at all. Um, it didn't. I'd say, I'd say it, it definitely affected my, my competitive history because KI was the last fighting game I was like competitive with and yeah. trying to actually get really good and going to events and winning tournaments and stuff and, and competing. Um, that definitely put a hamper on that as soon as I started like working on the game. But in terms of like covering it and, uh, and appreciating it, there was, it was like straight down to every single day I was like either talking with Mick Gordon who was doing the music yeah. or the developers behind the characters and getting builds of characters as cool stuff is coming through or, you know, seeing concept art for stuff that wasn't out yet and being like, this is going to be so sick. Like that, that whole experience is just surreal to me now. Mm -hmm. Like KI is, it holds a real special place in my heart. Not only because the 94, like 94, 95 KI 1 and 2, I think are just awesome, like slices of life fighting games of the 90s. Yeah. Um, KI ends up being one of the best playing fighting games still. One-on-one -on -one fighting games, one of the craziest, uh, not bad looking considering when it came out. And I think has the best music in all of fighting games today. Mm. Like KI 2013, 2014, 2015. So, um, I'll never take it for granted. Would I would I do trailers and story mode again if they really needed help? If they really needed <laughs> they really need to make this happen, maybe. But um right now it's just trying to focus on my audience. Like right. I just want to focus on making the people that are watching as happy as possible um without going absolutely insane. Right. Uh before we get too much further along, just everything you've been saying, so many questions have popped into my head. Uh to let the audience know, this won't be a normal Frame trap. I'm uh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing that's not a real frame trap. We're just going to talk and see where the conversation takes us. And if we need to go to the next segment, we totally will. But this is going to be a very even more free form than frame trap normally is. So it's we're, our objective today is to not necessarily get through talking a lot about a bunch of different games, but to just kind of take advantage of Max and, and talk about uh, this his perspective and where he's coming from and what he's doing. Uh, it's kind of all about Max today. Oh and God. so my body is ready, let's right, go. <laughs> right, not to put too much pressure on you, but uh, something that I wanted to comment on that I think is kind of similar to us. We're really fortunate that we have <clears throat> this, this audience that supports us. Yeah. And because this audience supports us, we kind of get to do things on our own terms. Yeah. Not, of course, that we're, we're always thinking about how to improve and, and how to reach a wider audience. Like, those are questions that we're having. But having people so directly supports us, I think, kind of gives us the freedom to be like, oh, I want to talk about this, and that's okay. Yeah. Or I want to do this weird idea, and that's okay. Um, and I feel like you know, you're not on Patreon, but you've really kind of gotten to do things on your own terms um, and in your own way. And I feel like you're kind of there are a bunch of people making fighting game content, but you, you've definitely just reached this massive audience that I think there's not a lot of people to directly compare you to, if you think that's fair. A, l a little bit, and I think the only reason that comparison can be made is that most, most fighting game content creators uh, tend to stick around one thing. Mm -hmm. They tend to focus on one fighting game, and I was the same way. It was like Capcom stuff, right. you know, uh, do or die, and it took a little bit of expansion to start playing other things that I wouldn't normally play. And it was, yeah, for the sake of the channel, like let's start looking into other stuff because at the time it was like, you're dealing with Street Fighter Cross tech and like jam issues and all this stuff. It wasn't exactly the hottest of, and like Marvel 3 was just like abandoned completely. Right. So it was like, okay, I wanna 
want to look into some other stuff instead of just playing Ultimate Marvel 3 like all day every day with its terrible netcode. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that kind of led me to meeting up with friends like Kenny and Steve who are frequent on Neo video games we do on the weekends right. and they're huge Mortal Kombat fans. They taught me a bit of what was going to be happening in Injustice when that came out and I actually ended up liking Injustice a lot straight to MKX and MKX was a huge game obviously selling like 11 million copies or something. Um, and that just sort of carried over to everything to this day. So it's not about just one fighting game or one fighting game genre, at least trying everything. And if I like it, it's just like really fun and I can come back to it. That's the cool thing about fighting games. Uh, 10 years later, I want to still love this game and come back to it and play it. Uh, and I think that's something that's really unique with the this kind of genre. Uh, something that I struggle with both personally and professionally uh, even just within the genre of finding games is finding space for everything. Mm -hmm. And I am not as knowledgeable or skilled as you are, so I feel like it takes me longer to be like, okay, I have a grasp on this yeah. at at least a basic level. And like there was an episode where I talked about fighting EX layer. Yeah. And I felt like, ah, man, I can only talk about this so much um, and I just need to invest a lot more time into it. Because the game's weird. Yeah, it yeah. is weird. And that time is also competing with a bunch of other games and other genres and all of the other stuff that we're doing for Easy Allies. And something that I'm really impressed with with you is in the midst of all of this Mortal Kombat craziness, you know, you're finding time for Terry in Fighting EX oh, there. Yeah. Um, or you're bouncing over here, you're talking about Sam's show a little bit. And just, I, I guess the question is, what's the thought process like behind that scheduling um, and, and where you choose to give time to? So, um... Like Power Rangers, another example of a fighting game that came out that is just super fun. Yeah. Like made by a uh, a Marvel versus Capcom tournament veteran, uh, Daniel Maniago, and he's just a cool guy. Uh, and I'm like, I have to play this game. Like it's coming out in between everything, but I can't like miss out on this Power Rangers game because it's like a Marvel versus Capcom, which is my favorite, just my favorite type of fighting game. Mm -hmm. So uh, I loved it, but I only technically got like four hours but you're able to absorb it. And that's just kind of a similar to fighting games in general and you have to build muscle memory, you have to build like matchup knowledge and stuff. These games share things with all the rest. And right. you'll get some fighting games that have some truly unique, like crazy stuff about them. But for the most part, we're dealing with mechanics that have been around since the 90s, mm -hmm. especially in these 2D, you know, hybrid 3D fighting games. So you can sort of be like, oh, this is like that game. Let me try this to see if this works. Totally works because a lot of a lot of the way they function is very similar. So uh, and especially when it comes to Tekken and Soul Calibur, those games have been sharing like moves and mechanics for a lot of a lot of games in their series. Um, it's just having that experience, that like twenty five year experience of just playing these games in in and out. And especially over the past ten years that I've been making videos, yeah, yeah, you get exposed to it fast. You got to go to a trade show event. You got to learn really quick. Right. So for example, like the Mortal Kombat launch event, um, I tried to get on a machine as soon as possible, and I requested one in the back right of the room because mm -hmm. I knew that there wouldn't be as many people that would be like, we need to get you off this machine, and no one came up to me. Mm. So I spent three straight hours. <laughs> that is, Max, that is strategy. You yeah, have to, uh, give me is, the, that the is, back right. That is the matchup. Uh, <laughs> so you go to the, yeah, I was there for three straight hours because I want to get a full understanding of this game right. and how the game is right now, and I, I would call developers over that like made characters. I'm like, show me the cool stuff on this character, and that's kind of just like the aspect of it. It's not that I feel I'm specifically amazing at these games, yeah. but I can grasp them kind of quickly. Um, because eventually being really, really good at fighting games just takes time. Like it's just time and experience. It's so interesting to hear you talk about like Tekken 3 specifically and yeah. and how seriously you took it and how, how much you appreciated it on a competitive level because it, like at that point in my life where I was at with Tekken 3 is, yeah. man, Jin is really cool and Paul's hair is crazy. Like that's just where my head was at. T3 with was something Tekken special. 3. Yeah, it was. It was special, but it was, it was special in a way that I couldn't articulate. Like I just didn't understand what was going on mechanically. I just was having fun playing and it. I, to be honest, at the time, it was 1998, neither did I. Like I was 98, I was what, like, 14 years old or something like that. Right. So I I was going and competing in small tournaments and actually traveling as much as I could with no vehicle. Um, but my, my tournament experience actually predates that to a, a kind of a local event I had when I was like 11 years old when KI came out on SNES. And I love Killer Instinct. Yeah. I learned every character in that game, all their combos, and just learned the matchups just because it was fun. And then would go to a rec room where about 10 to 15 people or kids to uh, young adults 
would be, and we would just play every Saturday for like candy and stuff. And just put whatever you had on the line, and uh, no, hold on. So you would say like, okay, I have, I yeah, have some Starburst. Yeah, yeah, you literally had a buy-in, and people would steal stuff all the time, <laughs> and then it would it would compromise the validity of the match. Like it doesn't have anything anymore. It was it was a very weird dichotomy of being like. Of figuring out how tournaments work. Um, Not to go old man yelling at cloud style, oh, but let's go. That seems Jump like right in. that seems like better days <laughs> <laughs> to me. Anyway, just it, so well, pure and simple. It's it is it was. I think it was pure and simple because you didn't. There was no identity. There was no FGC. There was no. It was just this thing you loved that everyone else around you loved, and you just did it because you loved it. Yeah. So um, I was I was very f fortunate to be like in a situation where you see everyone around you grow because I was the one lucky enough to win for like weeks straight, and then eventually when someone topples you, it's like oh man, everyone else is freaking out that you lost. Well, now I got to get better uh, and try to get that back, and that's that's a fun feeling. That's yeah. that whole that whole everyone learning around each other and. Coming back the next week, oh, I found something crazy with Cinder, and uh, that, that that means a lot to me. Uh, and especially when it boils down to arcades, when I first learned how to play like on an arcade stick, mm -hmm. I learned for Marvel versus Capcom one because like Strider and Wolverine and everything in Marvel one was so awesome. Um, I learned how to play an arcade stick af like after playing PlayStation controllers and everything like that. Um, but you had to play in arcades; so you had to like lose money doing it, and this whole thing was just the weirdest stuff. But there was a quite a few like a, a local group of people that just always played the game in the mall. So I would go there and be consistent, and then eventually like being terrible at the game, and then coming back every single weekend and playing it with these people that were just there all the time, like not an official tournament status. You'd grow around them, mm -hmm. and you weren't friends or acquaintances. You barely talked, but you were that person that played Gambit Strider or whatever. And got better and better and better, and then we're eventually beating people. And you know, then it's like, oh, he's that. There's the gambit player. That I, I think that exists now. You know, to an extent because of tournaments and stuff like that. Because right. like broadcasting and events. But um, yeah, that whole learning experience I think is super valuable. Like the arcade learning experience, and it was dangerous. I've seen people get stabbed because they were buttheads in arcades back in the day, like acting like total idiots and. And you like, saw people get moments. stabbed. I've seen a guy get stabbed over over what specific? Marvel two, <laughs> Marvel versus Capcom two, and that's not that weird. Can you tell the whole story? It's or is not it that traumatic? weird. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so okay. If you're not around it, it's not weird. But I, you, you, you'd see people get super hot headed, like to to the point which, like you see on YouTube videos now, where people sure. go like absolute rage monster. Yeah. But they have like the anonymity slash internet barrier. Um, I, I've seen someone pull a gun on. I've actually seen someone stab, but I don't think it was with like a large like predator like knife that cuts. It was like this person lived, is what you're saying. Yeah, they ran away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I just say, what I <laughs> they were they were able to run away. My ar oh. <laughs> my arcade fighting experience, I didn't have what you had. I wasn't I wasn't going and consistently competing with people. I wasn't part of a scene. Sure, it was just. Every once in a while, I got lucky enough to go to an arcade, especially being in Iowa. Yeah. I got lucky enough to go to a place that had an arcade, and I could spend, you know, a dollar or whatever it was playing a game and just trying to do my best against sure. the computer. And it's it's really funny because I, I hear a lot of, of people within the FGC talk about the glory days of the arcade and how amazing it was. And it's just so funny to me that being like, Man, like bring back the stabbings. <laughs> that's, that's what it's. That's what that's. That's those are the good old well, days. I think it's like I, I don't think that was a part of the good old days. That was yeah. like it was super it, scary. Ju just a joke. Like but, yeah. It, it, it like it, to be super real. It was super scary. It's like whoa, what the hell happened? Because everyone just ran away and we kept playing. <laughs> but it's it's one of those situations where I mean you're in the middle of Southern California and there's there's slices of life all over the place playing everything, so there are things being thrown at each other. From people that come from different blocks of life, right? Um, from different groups of life that sort of conflict with each other, and things get a little hairy. Like it gets a little grimy in some situations. Uh, so I don't think that's a part of the FGC that should be like embellished, but it does carry over to the pop off mentality of the mm -hmm. FGC. You know that that the, that a lot of fighting game. Uh, Productions, broadcasts, tournaments try to embellish, which is the pop off, you know, like the blow up. Yeah. Um, and I'm not about it. Like, I personally find it like, 
I find it like people are trying too hard, you know, to pop off on each other now because it's like a spectacle. So, it, and in, back in the day, it was like people were pissed at each other. People were mad. And that was, that was a part of the entertainment, but it was also like, oh, God, I don't know what's going to happen next. So now it's like it's obviously like a controlled environment. It's a lot different. So that, that still remains, but it's a, like I said, it's more, it's more esports. Are, are you saying that the pop offs are happening as a result of like it, it's just expected? And so they're like trying to feed into it rather than kind of being this, this release? It's kind of like wrestling. Mm. A little bit where it's like it's yeah in some situations you can actually see the emotion and you can sort of gauge like this is a super real emotional crazy moment for this person and that's like super special and other times it's like there's they're showmans you know there's people that are playing the heel there's people that are and they've ar- they've argued this a lot you hear it from the guys back from 2013 to the 2015 like big Capcom days uh, of how they were playing those roles and it's like this just isn't what I remember it being. Mm. And you guys have fun. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit back and just play these old games and do this stuff. So I th- I still find it entertaining. And I, I mostly t- turn into tournament like big stuff if there's a fighting game I'm interested in mm-hmm. and one that I want to get better at. And I want to watch people at competitive levels do really good Yeah. Um, to sort of emulate what's happening. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's just... That arcade feeling is there. It's just it's been it's just been altered and molded in a different way, you know. Do you think that the arcade scene, knowing the people and kind of knowing different groups and different factions and different rivalries, like that personalization, made playing those games more interesting? Because even even for me, as somebody who plays online fighting games a mm-hmm. lot less than you do. When a new one comes out, it's it's not that I'm not excited, and it's not that I don't want to play online, but sometimes it can feel like, oh man, another ladder to grind. Oh, it's intimidating. Um, it, it, not even just intimidating, but it's just a lot of like starting the same cycle all over again. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I'd actually argue that's one of the reasons why melee is as big as it is mm. because their their fan base, uh, not fan base, but their player base, grew up playing melee as like their competitive game. That's like the game they played. They didn't. Most likely didn't play shooters or many other fighting games, but a lot of melee players just play melee. Uh, and that carries over all the way until now where it's still being played competitively. It's still a game that is being supported at a high level with a whole bunch of different you know, prize pools that are bigger than uh, we saw for fighting games for years. Um, but when you play something for like 15 plus years, how easy is it just to be like, I'm just going to play the new other Smash Brothers, or I'm just going to play Mortal Kombat or Tekken or something that's not Melee. So you sort of get that incredibly hardcore fan base that can be a little difficult to deal with at times. Uh, but it's that I understand that mentality. I get where they're coming from. Like I played Third Strike competitively for like almost 10 years. Mm-hmm. And when Street Fighter 4 came out, it was a situation where I, I can't play Ken in this game because like I'm so hardwired to doing Third Strike stuff. So... I get where they're coming from, um, and it's it's a situation where things only last for so long. And I, I personally feel that if you play a fighting game enough, you're going to hate it. <laughs> Every single fighting game at a high level has some horribly annoying stuff to it. Yeah. Every single one. It doesn't matter what you play. Once you hit that high level, there's there's a point where it's just like... There's some stupid busted stuff, and it happens in every single one, and no matter how hard the developers try, it's going to happen. But... There are certain levels that I can appreciate a bit more, like Third Strike at high level I think is super annoying, but at the mid-level it's like the greatest fighting game of all time. Mm-hmm. Like, And that's, once you understand that, I think it's an interesting perspective to look at certain things where it's like, you do, some, you do the same thing enough for so long, you do love it inherently, but there's no way it's not gonna piss you off at some point, you know? As somebody who's been so entrenched in these games for so long, uh, and I, I need to be careful to not Overgeneralize here, but I think there's an argument to be made that there's there's a considerable push to to make the barrier of entry for fighting games easier through things like just simplifying the mechanics or adding things like auto combos. Uh, is that a direction that is discouraging to you, or you think could be handled better? Um, I think it can be handled better. I think it's both. I, it's very discouraging for me personally. I, I am not a fan of simplifying um, fighting games just for the sake of like building an audience because I, it doesn't work. It actually does not have a history of work working where a fighting game has taken mechanics and sort of like lowered it 
and suddenly everyone shows up to play. Like the the big examples are um, like Street Fighter Five is a huge one because it it, it is sim- like Street Fighter Four was sort of simplified from Third Strike, but it was like the resurgence and still a very technical and deep and crazy fighting game with a lot of execution. Um, and SF Five kind of put that even further, where it's just like. Well, we're going to make it all about kind of like matchup knowledge and ground game, and everyone can kind of do everything. Um, but they've changed that. A few characters sort of break that mold. Uh, but I don't agree with it. It was one thing that I was really worried about when Marvel Infinite was coming out, and they were sort of talking about we want to have everyone be able to play this game. Um, and all it ended up really being was that there was an auto combo. You just mash like square, and then you mash triangle, and you get with an auto combo. And the the my thing is that the auto combo shouldn't be what you do. It right. should be the thing that teaches you that this is the starting point. <clears throat> now, now you're at first base. We want to get you to the, back to home, and that's and rounding the bases of like a fighting game's mechanics. And eventually, they're going like, oh wow, I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. Oh my gosh, what else I can do? And that's the discovery aspect. That's the most the most fun part. That's what makes the genre brilliant. So, there. There actually isn't a history of a fighting game getting simpler and specifically toning down its mechanics that brings more people to its like competitive, more people to play esports, more people to do this, more people to do that. Um, SF5 grew as an esports because Capcom sunk a ton of money into it, right. didn't give up on the game, and rapidly changed it to be what it kind of is today, where the Capcom Pro Tour is actually a thing that people care about. Um, but it doesn't bring in, you know, you know, you know what players care about? Characters and stages, and maybe a story mode. People, the more characters, the more stages. That that's what sells fighting games. It's not the fact that. Do you mean broadly? Broadly, yeah. Yes. In terms of like just making, because ultimately getting people just to join tournaments is is a nice byproduct of having your community grow. But as a Capcom, as a NetherRealm, as a as a as a Namco, you want to sell units. You need to get sales. I don't. I don't disagree, but I feel like uh, a. When a fighting game comes out, it's it's always interesting because there's there's all these different fighting games and it feels like they're nailing some aspects and not others. And so something will come out and people will say, I wish it had a NetherRealm quality story mode. Sure. Or I wish it had an Arc Systems like quality tutorial. Sure. And it's just it, it's sometimes it feels like people want this amalgamation of, of a game. Yeah. And it just nothing is is quite landing in that perfect spot for everybody, which is of course, understandable, um, but it, it's surprising to me sometimes that things like NetherRealm will get praised for years and years and years when the way that they do their story mode, and no one's been able to really do something that has gotten the same level of praise. Yeah, Capcom tried. I mean, they literally did NRS-style story with Street Fighter V right. and Marvel Infinite. But I think it coming out so far after the fact really... Yeah. And the quality of it itself. Uh, well, that's the idea, is that they, they try to do it. Right. But it's just not as engaging or fun or good. Like, mm-hmm. it's just, it, like, Marvel, I think MVCI came out the same year as Injustice 2, and Injustice 2 story is really damn good and really fun, and every character feels like they have purpose, and each fight is really exciting, and there's, like, a hype reason why you got to kick this person's ass. And then MVCI story comes out, and it's just, like, it feels like it barely even understands why the characters are there, much less why they're talking to each other. So there's like very few moments as a Capcom fan or a Marvel fan why that story mode was like awesome, and there's a ton why the other one's awesome. So it's it's like they try to emulate it, but I think the thing that it sort of boils down to, we have an example like Smash Brothers, which adds a ton of single player content now, mm-hmm. like a ton of stuff. It doesn't have the Nether Realm style story mode, but it has its fan base. And it's like the best-selling fighting game of all time now, like Smash Ultimate is. So the thing that sold that game was everyone is here. Mm -hmm. The thing that sold that game is that every single stage from everything you could possibly imagine is there as well, like even the old stages. And it's like a legacy that celebrates everything. It's just, it's video games the game. Mm -hmm. And that's what sold copies of that game because on a technical level, Smash Ultimate is technically more deep than than Smash 4 was. They, they actually expand upon mechanics. They had this perfect parry system. They do all this different stuff with spot dodging and how the mechanics work. It's it's way more mechanically deep than the previous game. But do are people going to buy it because of that? No. Like, they, they literally added giant esports 2-1. Like, when things go on the screen, that is specifically for the competitive guys. But that's not what's selling the game. Mm-hmm. Selling the game because Snake is fighting Pac-Man. Like, 
characters always sell these things. And as a natural byproduct, you grow your esports competitive scene. Once people care enough, they'll care enough to play their character, to get good with their character, to be good with their character in front of people, much less host a stream where they're playing. And that natural progression is is what makes them great. Like that natural progression is what actually grows a scene instead of like trying to push, here's five hundred thousand dollars and we're going to have like a big tournament and so many of these things happen for fighting games that you don't hear about mm -hmm. and or happen in very small amounts and it just doesn't work because you have to you have to have like everyone to be invested first before they care about winning money, you know? It's uh, really interesting to the the whole Ronda Rousey voicing Sonya Blade in Mortal Kombat 11 is fascinating to me because, from my perspective, it just looks like something that was done to clearly broaden the audience, and it doesn't seem like it's worked on any level. Like, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I, I'm more plugged in, I think, to to people who are are gaming enthusiasts and and fighting game enthusiasts rather than like a broad general audience, but I'm just seeing. No one say like, oh yeah, you got me. I I bought the game because of that Nether Realm, and, and so it's just. Yeah. I, and I think that's like a big WB like influence thing. Like we gotta, we got, we're gonna get Ronda Rousey. She, we're gonna put her on like the back of the box or something like that. Like it was definitely one of those efforts that was. We need to expand our audience somehow and get into like the wrestling world or you know whatever. And she's she does an okay job. Like we've all played the story much. Man, an okay job. I don't even think I'm I'm willing to say okay. <laughs> there so are just it was a times, good try. Yeah, like a good try, but not something that you would put in the game. I don't know. I don't. And or, ta or have another take, maybe. <laughs> it's just hard because there are other characters that I I thought did so all of it. Well, we're now talking about Mortal Kombat, so let's let's put let's put that timestamp in. But like like Cassie Cage, and there, uh, there I think the reason I bring up Cassie Cage is. Obviously, Sonya and Cassie mm -hmm. talk so much to each other uh, in that game, and like Cassie works for me when she's trying to be a little bit emotional. It, it works for me when she's trying to be funny. It works for me. Yeah. Um, not everything lands, I guess, in the, in the same measure, but like Sonya, at best, I'm like that was passable. Yeah, there was there was words coming out of the mouth. That's about all right. you could say. It was delivering story directly to you in audio form. Uh, but there's a lot of other characters that do really good jobs. Absolutely. And it's funny It's funny to talk about a fighting game and how important voice actors would oh, be, yeah. which is insane, right? Mm -hmm. Like 10 years ago, I'd be like, what? Who cares? Mm -hmm. But it's like, uh, I think in Mortal Kombat 11 especially, it adds a ton to the personification of the character you're choosing. Uh, for instance, I would never pick Cabal because of who he's become. The meme lord. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, wait, what? Uh, what what's this guy What now? happened? See, I feel the exact opposite. <laughs> you love him? I love Cabal in this. Like... The intro where he's just like turned away from his opponent and pissing, and you're just staring oh, that's at Kano. it. Or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up Kano and Cabal. I'm yes. sorry. Yeah, Cabal has got, yeah. the, Cabal got the spins. Okay, Cabal got the spins. I'm with yeah. you there. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Yeah. For, I had Kano in my head. Yeah. But yeah, Kano, I thought they did a really good job with. Yes. Cabal, you're completely right. Yes. My but, bad. But yeah, and then like some characters you really grow attached to because you're like, oh, right. this is a great performance, great like facial capture, like this this is a character. Yeah. Okay, and I don't want to I don't want to give too much away, but a perfect example of that for me is is Kotal Khan, whereas in MKX, I I think Kotal Khan looks really cool, and mm -hmm. I love the idea of of this dude like calling down the sun and burning his opponents and like bathing in their blood and just the whole aesthetic that he has. But the story mode just did nothing for me. And there are some frustrating aspects, I think, with how Kotal Kahn goes in Mortal Kombat 11's story. But it's like, oh, wow, like, Netherrealm... Got a good part. Yeah, he, he, he had a part to play, and they actually developed him. And they didn't do it with everybody. Like, Aaron Black oh, is not really comical. developed. Yeah. But it was interesting because Ed Boon did this thing with Wired where he, he talked about every single character in the game, and he was like... Right now, like there, if you go through like the the a tower ending for Aaron Black, you do get some more on him, and you'll get yeah. some more on him in, in the the intros and the the quips back and forth. But we want him to be intentionally mysterious, and I I said it in the review of Mortal Kombat 11. Like, clearly, they can't give the spotlight to everybody. Sure, but the people they do give the spotlight to, it makes sense, and I feel like there's a good mix of old and new. Yeah. yeah. Um, I completely agree. I don't know someone who just played all the story modes. It was this is the reason why MK9 story is so revered because it's 
It's like super long. It literally transpires the events of MK1, mm -hmm. 2, and 3, and it feels like it ends every single time. And then all of a sudden you kill Shao, like spoilers, you kill Shao Kahn in MK9, and then he comes back hobbling around, I'm doing okay, yeah. and it just goes on. I'm like, what the hell? Is, where's this game going? And throughout all those events, you get like the Cyberland Quay, you get the Mortal Kombat 1 events, you get to relive sort of everything. I love a tournament arc. Yeah, and a go huge, back to a tournament. It yeah. is not even one, it's yeah. like multiple tournament arcs. Yeah. So <laughs> it, was, it was a great idea because they had to essentially get Mortal Kombat fans back on their side, which is why MK9 still has like the best roster of every Mortal Kombat game, which is why everyone reveres it so much. They had to work hard after like the PS2 MKs to sort of get people back, and it worked. Like it worked super good. But it's one of the reasons why MK11 story does a similar thing where it's just like, okay, we realize that a lot of the stuff people remember about Mortal Kombat is the old stuff. Right. So we're going to have to find a way to inject the old stuff in with the new stuff again because MKX was just new stuff. There was no callbacks and throwbacks. It was Scorpion and Sub-Zero having tea together and that was a cool arc that grows those characters. But there wasn't a lot of like nostalgia fan service. Well... Kind of the, the the concept of where Mortal Kombat X was going with the story, like Cassie Cage is a good example, where it's like, okay, this is a new character, but it's a mix of Sonya Blade and Johnny Cage. Yeah. And so you you kind of have that sensation of like, I, I feel like I know you, but you're also and new. And that's the part that's actually kind of neat. Yeah, and you, you get a best of both worlds situation, but what I was really frustrated with Mortal Kombat X, and I have, admittedly I haven't played through the story mode since it came out, so yeah. I may be misremembering, but... I just never really felt like I got to know anybody enough. Not and it really. just felt like it was the, the story was being pulled in too many directions that didn't quite line up. Whereas in Mortal Kombat 11, I feel like they do the time travel stuff and the the new characters seeing old versions of themselves a lot better. It yeah. just it's I, a great gimmick. It's such it a, it's such a good like we need we need a story hook that's going to keep people engaged and also have references to the old characters and also have new stuff that's going to be happening. And the thing I keep mentioning like Avengers is about to come out, right? Like Endgame is coming to come out. I don't care at all about the action scenes. I don't care how the good guys are going to fight the bad guys. I want to see the good guys talk to the bad guys. <laughs> like, seeing characters <laughs> sure. like, it was the same thing with the Deadpool movie. I don't want to see Deadpool and Cable fight. I just want to see them quip and talk right. to each other. So uh, this game does a lot of that. MK11 has a lot of characters just discussing things and events. Johnny and Johnny is the best because Johnny Cage now is, is such a different character. Yeah. Um, and obviously he has elements of that, especially through things like like his Fatal Blow and Fatalities and all that stuff. But he's a much more serious, much more grounded character. And having the old version of him just be a shithead was so amazing. And watching Johnny Cage get sick of himself, it just felt like a really brilliant way to kind of fold both sides of that character together. Absolutely. That I thought was really, really smart. Um, what did you guys think of Kronika? Kronika is, <laughs> she's a take, right? She's not Shao Kahn. She doesn't have that kind of threatening, like, final boss yeah. attitude, right? She's got her own type of thing. Um, I'll take it. I, what I like in, 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 a, in a story, uh, it's hard to not do this with spoilers, but, uh, you know, like Rising Conflict, I think she spends a lot of time away. Uh, not interacting with our heroes, yeah, you know, and so like uh, that part of it's like okay, um, but hey, it's like at least something different. It's something that makes this game unique. She like you know that's the final boss of this game. Maybe she'll appear in a game later on. We're collecting characters again, but like she was Eleven's hook. Eleven all happens because of Chronicle, mm -hmm. so I'm cool with that. I think she's better than Shinnok. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, Shinnok. Is it everyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's and it's like you, when you think about like the pantheon of Mortal Kombat bad guys, you essentially have Shao Kahn, uh, Shinnok, the Deadly Alliance, which is Shang Tsung and Quan Chi, and then Onaga and Blaze, and those are super throwaway from like the MKPS two days, mm -hmm. and then they reintroduced Shao Kahn again in MK nine, and they reintroduced Shinnok again, so it's good that it's a it's a new take. And I don't, I don't feel like she's like a ten out of ten like bad guy, but I think it's like a solid seven. I think it's pretty good. Like she does a good job as far as setting things up, and I think her plight and the way they write the character um, is effective for getting the story from point A to point B. But also like her intentions make sense. Right. Like I get where this 
this like transient like interdimensional being sort of thing is 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 working and cooking things in the background um so they definitely integrated a lot of and the way they tie that into the entire events of mk which is the whole point of the story um i think it's pretty smart so yeah, i she, like her she's made to that she's yeah. made to like motivate us getting a human Liu kang again right like yeah. it's just like it's she's there to serve that purpose i completely agree with you um and i, I think that's where i'm coming from with my perspective on chronica is that she is very serviceable and her motivations lead to extremely cool some of the best stuff in the story mode but just just as a presence i'm oversimplifying this but it's kind of just like <laughs> raiden you mess with my plan like it's not <laughs> menacing it, like she's definitely not menacing and i i don't like shao khan right i love shao khan and mortal kombat 11 even reminds me of that where it's like this is a guy saying you suck comically. Mm. He has this giant hammer. He's laughing at you. It, it's just kind of fun to take him on. And I don't get that same enjoyment with Kronika. And I don't I don't want them to just do Shao Kahn again. I think that's a mistake. And so it's kind of a hard problem to solve where it's like be different but equally memorable. Yeah. It's not a it's not like a an they, easy challenge to overcome. And, and they try to make Kronika like an actual like character, like her intentions and her plan and right. her like her will of the game and how she's conducting it. Like you get where she's coming from, even though she's not like a very empathetic character, you know? Mm -hmm. That's not really a spoiler. But uh for the sake of like fighting game bosses and what makes a good fighting game boss, to me it's all mystery. You have to have a character that's at the end that 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 actually doesn't have a lot of backstory. That actually doesn't have a lot of screen time because Shao Kahn even is a is a great last boss in MK9, but as we could talk about spoilers in MK9, but he gets killed in the story and comes back hobbling around, mm -hmm. and he obviously has weaknesses and he's arguing with people and it's like this sort of ruins the mysticism of Shao Kahn, you know? I hear that, yeah. And what you remember of him is just like him getting up off his throne and pointing at your ass and and beating the holy hell out of you. So I think when it comes to select fighting game bosses, like the more mystery, the kind of better, and you can sort of build the story of your in your head about like what the heck is actually going on, what makes them so evil and stuff, and why they're doing it. So to you, who who is the best final boss in fighting games? Bison, like Street Fighter Two Bison. Yeah, he's just the evil, crazy dictator that mm -hmm. looks looks inherently evil, has crazy moves that no one else can do, like and mobility that no one else really has except his bad guys, because Vega it's like, did Vega teach Bison how to do the flippy dippy? Like, you don't you have to you have to make up those stories yourself. And it's right. the it was the mystery of it. And then Bison really loses a lot of his like his like really charming bad guyness in in Street Fighter V when he's in the story like a whole bunch and I mean, he's a comically good, goofy bad guy still, and it's it's effective. But I think that it's one of those situations where less is more. Mm -hmm. Like, you just sort of have your guy in the background doing stuff, and I think like sort of like Eye of Sauron kind of thing, and have their minions, and then you don't actually see what they are, and then you finally get there, and oh my god, what the heck? And then you can really get creative. Like uh, Marvel 2's final boss is kind of yeah. weird. Just yeah. like this freaky monster has got like weird freaky phases, yeah, right? I actually personally love the the last bosses of Marvel versus Capcom games because they're things that are giant and bigger. Yes. Like MVCI's last boss is insane. Like, uh, and actually, one of my favorite things about the game is the fact that yeah, like Sigma and Ultron like meld together to make this big, with all the stones, make this giant, horrible, hobbled monster that's a face with a head and arms. It's like, I think that's neat, like having Apocalypse and Onslaught and all that stuff in the end. So um, it's just because it's, you need, I think you need to have a last boss that has a lot of big polar differences. And they, they need to feel like they are on another level in comparison to everyone else. And in Street Fighter 2, there's that, because Bison's crazy, you know? So a, a disconnect that I always have is Having that boss uh, appear in a game and it feels so powerful and menacing and mysterious, and then later down the line it's like, hey, now you can play as that boss, yeah. and that's that's really exciting. But it's always weird when it's like, and they're not very good. It just it kind of ruins <laughs> that mystique. Uh, or they're nerfed. Yeah. Or, or, True yeah. ogre. True ogre is a good sure. example. Yeah. <laughs> He's got like a cool snake arm. He breathes yeah. flames, and it's like, oh, this guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's just it was just every the AI time it that happens. made him in interesting. Yeah. yeah. Or even, mm -hmm. I guess, just having your friend play it and do like the cheesiest stuff possible. Like it changes your perspective yeah. of how you view that character. Less is more. Yeah. Um, uh, steering back to Mortal Kombat 11, though, uh, kind of watching your reaction to Mortal Kombat 11 as the game was was coming along. Um, I remember you saying like I I haven't been able to play as every character in the roster yet. 
people feel a little limited. I just kind of need to find my character that clicks with me and I feel like I can do a lot of cool stuff with. Have you found that character in Mortal Kombat 11? Um, I got pretty lucky because, yeah, Noob Cybot was in MK9 mm -hmm. and a few Mortal Kombats before, but he just was a really cool looking character. Um, super edgelordy kind of guy. But his gameplay in, in 9 is not that great. He just chucks like shadow clones at you and that's like the most effective thing you do with them and then you kind of get combos. Uh, luckily, in, in MK11, they go like super combo heavy on this guy. Um, there's there's tournament variations which are kind of limiting for characters in ranked mode, but the cool bread and butter of the game is the fact that you get to choose which moves you put on the characters. It's mm -hmm. like really fun. And you can still pick people online in player matches. And he's got some of the dankest, craziest, most fun like combo conversions that are in the entire game that I've discovered so far. Uh, obviously, my own personal experience is not necessarily true to the overall experience, but I feel like I've fought noob cybots online that are just shadow spam, the like clone spamming and teleporting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to see more of that. I want oh, to see man. more of the the crazy combos. He's he, he he's got a lot of potential, and it's not just like how long the combos are. It's 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 converting to. So it's like mm. you have a game plan when you're playing the game. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk back and forth, and the whole point is to get that hit to convert it to something like. I have four different attacks that sort of do things, but what do those things lead to? Does it lead to pushing you towards the corner where I can get more damage as a result of combos? Does it lead to a hit confirm from mid-screen where it's gonna put me into this this stun state to grab the hook and then pull him back down? And he has a lot of that. Like he has a even more than most characters in the game. So the game is definitely more combo limited than, you know, games like MK9 and MKX. But um for the most part, it's like, how good does that feel to do? How good is it? How much fun is it to do these combos? And believe it or not, yeah, Noob Cybot's a ton of fun. Uh, Kyle, so you've played through the story, yeah. which allows you to sample a bunch of different characters. Uh, was there anybody that you gravitated to or surprised you? So you don't get to play as Collector in the story, but you I know. did put. I've played a lot of Collector since. Yeah, I really like the. You collector. like what is yeah. it that you like most about Collector? So the Collector is introduced as just like this. Uh, I don't know. He, he's like one of those just bad guys who's just clearly evil, clearly greedy, loves Shao Kahn, is loyal to him for some reason. Uh, he's got six arms. He's just uh, uh, like bad. He's bad and not made to be likable in any sense. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that aspect of him. Uh, and he turns out he's got cool moves. Yeah. My favorite thing is just like uh, he's got like a little a ball that's basically a tr projectile. It's like a chain, mm -hmm. but he can like charge it up. And so, like, you can hold down triangle, charging up this ball and move around and then let it go whenever you want it's to. A good, it's a good gameplay mechanic, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, like, things like that where it's just like, oh, this is actually just fun to do in the middle of a match. Fully charging up that, that chain that shoots out yeah. and getting the crushing blow. It, it feels like a mental victory over your opponent. Like, yeah. you let this happen. Yeah, you saw me charging. Um, Max, you could probably speak to this uh, better on a competitive level, but uh, I really enjoyed the variations in the sense that it was fun just messing around with things or having those moments where like you go away to to go grab a drink or something you'd think to yourself like oh wait what if i tried this move in this situation oh, yeah. and it just kind of naturally led to those things and even that fed into it's like oh if i want to do this brutality i have to have that move. have that move equipped yeah. which like is that worth it over some other move and i just found that process of of tinkering really enjoyable it's hard to say how long that appeal is going to last um, especially since, like, in Ranked Online, you, you can't do that you, like, stuff. Like, literally, they're locked out of it. Right. Uh, how there are some moves that you cannot select. Yeah, so you can, only, you can only do preset variations yeah. in Ranked Online. And in the preset variations, there's absolutely moves that are just not used. Yeah. That is insane. Right. Yes, it is. I've, I've thought at least what, like, every move would be covered in no. one of the presets. And that's what we were hoping, was yeah. that the very, like, the, your normal variation limitations are three points. Yeah. Most special moves cost one point, and then some cost two or two. I think there's maybe some that actually cost three. Really? There's like, there's like modifiers that are like, this will make that thing stronger, so you have to use all three to make that move the best, I think. No, well, like that, that. that's specifically for like single player stuff, I believe. I feel like, like two is the highest I've seen, but yeah. I'm doubting myself I think Garrus might have a time travel thing where he can literally go back in time that might cost three. Right, cool. so that was kind of, that was kind of the, the, the trade-off that I saw in my mind where, yeah, you're limited to these specific things, but that allowed them to get crazier for the things that you can't include. Sure. And that seemed like a reasonable trade-off to me. Yeah. Um, but I don't at know. the same time, it's like... Uh, f a fighting game balance is... 
it, it's 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 like a it's like a crazy horse that you're never going to tame. Hmm. No matter how hard a developer tries to balance their vanilla version of a fighting game, which is like the launch version of a fighting game, like the non-updated Ultra Super Editions, XLs, whatever. No matter how hard devs try, your fighting game is going to be horribly imbalanced, and it's going to be broken at some point. Players will always, no matter how much playtesting you've done, no matter how confident you are that your system is impeccable and you can't break this in any way, it people are going to find the dankest, stupidest stuff. I mean, that's, that's super abusable. That's kind of the appeal of MVC two, right? Like that's not a balanced that, fighting yeah, game. Yeah, that's uh, and that's and it's not a thing to say that balanced fighting games or imbalanced fighting games are bad or good, you know, in general. Right. It's just that everyone is going to put in an effort to be a designer and be like, I think this should beat this. I think this should beat that. This should be a good thing on them. Their strength right. should be like this. It's going to be broken. Players are going to break it. Like you get the you get the game in the hands of of so many people. There's no way you're going to account for that many possibilities. So it's mostly how the devs respond to it. So you have all these characters, and you hopefully they have enough tools. And uh, in MK11, right, it's already happening. Like there's already some characters that are like obviously can do more than others. And it's like the characters that have their their core game plan is one thing. So I don't really buy into like the balance aspect of it because. One, if it's fun, it's fun. Like, people are going to have fun. Number two, if it ties into how the developers think, like, this move should work with this move, you can just do it. Like, is it, it's going to take, like, an extra day to figure out how you can have this move counter that or, or whatever. It's like, that. I don't think that's, an, that's a huge endeavor of, like, balancing the game. Because to be honest, MKX had three variations that all had different attacks, that had sometimes had different normals, that all had different special moves and right. different combos, potentially. And they balanced that. And of course, in MKX, there were some variations that were obviously better than others, but you still had variety. So they already went through that process. Like that game was what was balancing hell uh, because they had so much. And this one's admittedly less because now the competitive variations limit you to this or this, and that's it. So I don't really. And it, what's funny is like I don't I don't kind of I kind of don't buy that either yeah. uh, because of like how long button checks take right like it would take somebody like two seconds to select their moves off of like the default settings. So this and this this is what I was thinking on the way here. You know when you go and actually pick your moves in MK11, mm -hmm. you essentially go to customize and there's like a move window that comes up that has little icons for what the move is and it explains it. Yeah. How hard is it? I mean, it's obviously not there, and UI artists and everything have to put that in. But to get that window to pop up on the versus screen and just customize blip blip and you put this this and this and then after you choose that and it goes to like the versus screen where you see the characters there there yeah. should be three icons for what that move those icons that they use in the menu that just represent what the character has and you have all the visual information as a competitor to see that oh they got this this and this and maybe you don't know the research like you didn't do the research to know what those icons mean or what they are, but that's a part of the matchup. That's a part of like learning the game, but it's giving you the info so that you can do, you know, the homework if you want to get really good at this. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of like actual competitive play, yeah. having a window that comes up and people just go bink, 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 and it takes just as long as ch checking your buttons, because as a competitor, you're not going to hover around the screen for 30 minutes. Like it, it's... There are 10 options, and you scroll down the list, and there's maybe one next page. It's not huge. It's not like selecting gems in Street Fighter Cross Tekken, where there's like 100 of these things. Uh, sometimes I just wish there was a, a standardization process for certain things, um, like Mortal Kombat 11 does, and I believe MKX does this as well, where you can just tag things in the move list and have it appear yeah. when you're fighting your friends. Yeah. It just makes the process of, of learning That's a and great thing fun. in this game, yeah be so much more enjoyable and it's just like please please include this everywhere everywhere there's no there's no reason <laughs> not to uh yeah so going going back i guess to variations have you had fun with it um i so i played the beta a lot and the beta allowed you to customize variations similar to how the game's releases but in terms of playing ranked matches all the characters that i've tried so far the moves that are the most fun aren't available in the ranked variations. No way. <laughs> so I just no. I just play player matches right. where you can make your own. Can you give an example of that? Um, like for example, Noob Cybot, the one character I put the most time into, yeah. uh, has a combo extension through a teleport, and he has a combo extension through a hook. Both of them lead to like a bouncing state where you can sort of get an extra an extra thing. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have the hook. It's just missing from his competitive variations. He has the teleport. But what it means is that as a character, you do certain strings and attacks. And this is, like I said, it's not about how long the combo is. It's about how many ways can you get from point A to point B? How, how many ways can you convert? 
And when you have the hook and the teleport that does the bounce, it means that several other of his strings become way more effective at converting damage. This actually does more damage if you do it this way. This one, this, this combo string that normally leads to no combo, now actually leads to something if you have the hook. And also leads to something if you have the teleports. And now you get big extensions. It's like it opens up gameplay for the character. And so do you think in pre-selecting their presets, they thought that was overpowered? Or they just didn't think that that was a good combo? Like, they didn't realize how I strong that could be. Like, I don't. And it, yeah, sure, the combo does a lot of damage, but Noob Saibot's still, like, a super mid-tier character in terms of, like, the core gameplay mechanics. It's pretty mm. pretty obvious. We know what makes a character really good so far, just from playing the game enough from the beta and now. Mm -hmm. We don't know who's the best, but we know what makes a good character. So what, what makes a good character in Mortal Kombat 11? Uh, strong mids, long-reaching attacks that sort of, like, cover this distance. Characters that have strings that are either safe or leave you an advantage. Special moves that you can cancel into that are either safe, that don't leave you in a, in a punishable state, or characters that have uh, powerful ways to control neutral. This game is very neutral. They, 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 they pronounce it as being neutral heavy, but it's Mortal Kombat, it's not. Like, I, I'm, I'm Sub-Zero, I slide. Mm. <laughs> Done, neutral's gone. I'm Scorpion, I teleport. It's just, I screw neutral. Like, then there's several characters that have that. I'm Johnny Cage, I have Dash Kick. Like, if you want to make that option, that option is there to not want to play that game because that's Mortal Kombat from the first game. Um, so having those options is good. <clears throat> and characters like Scorpion, which don't have a ton of really powerful, like, poking tools, they have some. He gets that teleport that literally blows up every other character's efforts at any time. So stuff like that is really good. And it's still argu arguable who has the best, but whoever has the most powerful, like, close-range strings are really good. Whoever's... Whoever has really good long-range projectiles, like, I've dealt with a ton of Liu Kangs that just do low fireball, fireball, right. fireball, fireball, and since this game has no projectile collision, they just go through each other. Yours is either too slow and him is, like... And then Liu Kang's also pretty good at close range for the most part. It's... Th those seem to be the core things that make a character. Like, how good is your projectiles? How good is your, your reaching attacks that sort of are able to hit confirm, much less whiff punish? Because that's a big part of this game is hoping somebody throws something out that they miss, and then you responding with that, and then getting your full combo. So you're saying Collector is top tier? Uh, I think Collector is really good. <laughs> no, actually. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I, I think it's really depressing. I guess talking about things on a competitive level and being like, okay, here's what's really important in this game. All these characters don't do that, so they're not super competitively viable. Like that. That's just. I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening here, but that kind of tone, I think, is is just so disheartening. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. It, it, it comes down to the core mechanics of the game, like what mm -hmm. the game allows you to do as characters. And the, the best example is uh, dashing before was useless in right. the beta. It was literally useless. It, it was slower than walking. So they made dashes faster. Um, and some characters... The way dashing works, they, they dash and they cover this space, but it's either front-loaded or back-loaded. So if they go from point A to point B, they either lunge like, like normal humans would dash, or they move forward and then go, uh, in the end. So it's a weird animation like thing that they chose to do. But as a result, when you dash in this game, you can hold block. So you can stop your dash and, and hold block, which allows for a sort of wave dash to happen. So characters that have front-loaded dashes where they cover a lot of space at the start of their dash can press block and then dash, and then block, and then dash, so they're just going boom, 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 boom. It looks like they're running. Uh, this is like the core mechanics of Tekken as well. Tekken has all about movement. Being able to back dash and forward dash really quick is hard. Like it's the hardest, one of the hardest things to do in the game, mm -hmm. to do it reliably and fast. And there are some characters in MK11 that can literally do Tekken-style dashes uh, across the screen. Sub-Zero is one, Garrus is one. Um, there's a few others, but a lot of characters are backloaded on their dashes where they get a lot of space at the end. So you can't cancel the beginning into a block. They just don't go anywhere. So there's this really cool mobility thing that's in the game that's come as a result. And it doesn't look like incredible. It looks like Tekken wave dashing. It always looks kind of bunk. But it's it's like a it's like a skill barrier thing that not everyone's gonna be able to do this. This this is hard. So that's just tap tap forward R two. Pretty much forward forward R two, and then on some characters if they're front loaded in their dash, yeah. forward R two forward R two forward R two, and it's not you have to do it quickly. Like, got it, got it. Really fast. And if you see a character like Sub Zero, they can go from full screen to here, boom 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 boom. boom. Like it's it's cool looking. It's almost just as fast as a run from from Mortal Kombat X in many ways. So. 
I think stuff like that is neat. You get this executional barrier of moving your character around because that was one thing in MKX that yeah, everyone was kind of up in your ass all the time because of running and it made the game crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but you had to be careful with it. Like if you, you were running, so you're not blocking while you're running, you can get hit by stuff. So I kind of, the fighting games that usually have a, uh, an executional like requirement for its mobility and there's like levels to it, like what if I do this, can I get better at that? Marvel vs. Capcom games are big with this, Guilty Gear games, like anime style games are big with it. And I like that it's an MK11 right now, but it's super limited because some characters get it and some characters don't. So it's like, all right, well there is, they, they just want, they wanted to make dashing better. Like that was their goal. We're gonna make dashing better, but they probably didn't account for the fact that some characters are gonna be able to do this crazy stuff and it other characters don't. It sounds accidental. It's accidental. Yeah. <laughs> it absolutely, everything in fighting games, I almost guarantee you. Did the devs plan on this? No. Right. Absolutely not. Uh. The, what you're talking about kind of seems in line to me with the changes that they made to amplify and just increasing the dash speed in general. But it, but it was crazy to me at the reveal event being like, why, why in the world do I have to do all of these button combinations for just for just ex? Like that just doesn't make any sense. There's some things that are like, yeah, we're gonna make it more mechanically difficult, but we've already set a way to do it from the previous games. It would like be the equivalent of S Street Fighter ex moves. Suddenly, instead of pressing two punch buttons or two kick buttons, now you got to press light punch, light kick, and heavy punch. And it's different for every single one. Light punch, medium kick, heavy kick. It's like, wait, why? Like, why would... What's wrong with the other way? There was no reason. Like, they didn't have... And so they, they almost didn't have a reason as much because they turned it back immediately. And people are like, I can't amplify my moves because I have to remember this extra thing. It does, that's not adding depth. That's just more weird stuff that I have to remember when learning a character. So... Yeah, it's, it felt like arbitrary. Like we don't we don't need like this. Why isn't it like the old way? And yeah, it works fine now because it's kind of like the old way. Um, so, and I'm trying to think of other things that changed since like that reveal event and the betas. But the the big one is definitely dash speeds and amplifying, and the overall speed of the game is a lot better. Like this game felt like a very slow fighting game. Do you think it's still too slow? I I think it's I think the speed of the game is is fine now. Like, I think they changed a lot to make it a much better, much, much better, more more responsive, tight fighting game than it was from the first events. Because I was really worried at the first event, and we were admittedly talking about it several times, and we told developers, and a lot of other people, you know, agreed with us that it's a very slow fighting game, and it didn't feel like the characters could do a lot. Uh, the mobility stuff, like being able to do this crazy dashing stuff, does open up character potential, which is neat. That That's a core mechanic thing that'll make every character better. Um, but MK11 is a very, like, safe approach. It's a game that feels like it doesn't want to have characters to have a billion options for the sake of balancing, and that's, a, that's why a lot of people compare this to Street Fighter V. Mm -hmm. um, it's core footsie gameplay. And I feel that way with some... I feel like some characters are obviously way better than others. Like, some characters have way more options, and I'm getting a lot of people that are like character experts that have been playing Shao Kahn over the past few days, and they're like... Shao Kahn seems good to me. He seems he seems like okay at the start and then the more I'm hearing of people playing him, everyone I've heard multiple people say he feels incomplete. Like I can't I can't do anything more. It's just his range felt like such right? a valuable tool tool. Um Well, the big thing is like how good is his range? Is it safe? Sure. Like is sure, doing sure, sure. all that stuff like if is it if if it's negative 7 frames or more, then it can be punished completely. Like, I feel like that happened in your stream last night oh, where you're playing God. Kotal Khan, very yeah. hard, and you just were going through his moves. It's like everything is unsafe. Yeah, literally, everything I do is unsafe. So the the very hard difficulty, I do not recommend it for anybody. And going through the hard parts of the story on V Hard is it took me three hours to get to chapter three, <laughs> and you can beat the thing in about that time frame. Um, and the reason is like the the the, the AI is just aggressively. Uh, aggressively evil. Like, it just waits for you to press buttons, and then as soon as you press something, it presses something one frame faster. So when you say negative seven, is it seven frames for the hit to happen? That's that startup. Ne ne negative seven refers to, like, on block. Uh -huh. How this the recovery time. That's I have seven frames to recover from that. For my fist that. to come back to my exactly. body. Exactly. Okay. Um, and it's it's different between, like, startup, hit stun, block stun, but usually when people say if it's, like, negative or positive, they're talking on block. Like, how can I throw this out and not worry about getting totally jacked up after? And I just want to say, uh, 
for anybody that's confused by this or anybody who wants to have a deep understanding of this, I do think the tutorial in Mortal Kombat does a good 11 job. does a great job of explaining frame data yeah. and, and what these terms mean and, and going through them pretty systematically. Yeah, it's, it's, you need to know why I can't just throw out Liu Kang's like, like dragon kick all the time or do Sub-Zero slide or always do Scorpion's teleport. Like People will be annoyed by that, but the game is trying to teach you that this stuff has been unsafe since since Mortal Kombat has ever existed. Mm -hmm. And that those moves, if you know they're coming and then block them, can be completely punished for a lot of damage. And that's what the game's trying to teach you. So, yeah, there's just some characters, like Kotal Khan was a great example of just going through his strings and just looking for anything. And he had like one thing that wasn't horribly negative on block. And it just made it very hard to approach a computer in any way because all of Kotal stuff is just big wind up into thing and the computer's just like, nope, and would interrupt you immediately. But, uh, but isn't that super boring where it's like, okay, I'm so limited on safe options. You're not options. getting better at the game. Yeah. Well, you're n not just that, but it's just like, I don't, I don't want to just do the same thing over and over again. And that's kind of, exactly. And that's kind of where the, the big worry of mine was when we were first playing MK11, when like the mobility was very limited. At least, we, you know, people are going to get better at the mobility. There's going to be a different type of play style. And it's ultimately the big thing with Street Fighter V is that every other character sort of plays like everyone else's character. Mm -hmm. Because the executional barrier, things are so much easier to do now that it's kind of hard to argue like Tokido playing Akuma does the same combos as a platinum, or I'm sorry, like a diamond Akuma in Street Fighter, which is like a pretty decently high rank. Um, it's just that Tokido has more matchup knowledge and player knowledge. So they are doing the same things but one person is just doing them in a way that's different, but looks the same. You know what I mean? And that's the part that's difficult to Street Fighter V is that everything kind of looks the same after a while. It just seems like an impossible nut to crack because I, I think to give players that personalization where it's like, okay, you have th these five different Akumas and they all look super different because the mechanics allow for it. Like on a general level, how many people are going to be able to appreciate that and how much does that matter? And like, I just, I just don't envy anyone designing a fighting game and trying to conquer all of these things. Yeah, and well, there, there's very specific things you can do. I, I was on like the cutting room floor when, when Killer Instinct was being developed and they opened, they, they made the game very mechanically open. Specifically for the fact that the, the guys that made the game were big fans of the Marvel vs. Capcom series, Dark Soccer's, and Guilty Gear. All very open-ended sort of fighting games, Dark Soccer's 3. Um, they specifically took those design elements where they're like, we're going to give the players the chance to figure this out. We're actually going to put it open. We don't know how. We're going to test it. If it's working, we're going to let them let it happen. And later on, if somebody finds something that's crazy, does that fit into the design document of this character? Like we have, this is what this character does. This is what they do. This is how the game works. Do they complement each other? Okay, people figure out some crazy stuff. Does that still fit in with the character? It does, leave it in. You know what, it's, it's cool, leave it in. So as as being around that, it, it's it's a choice. Like it's, it's not a thing that is like, how hard is it to add um, player freedom to a fighting game? It's not really like, if you made every, if you gave every character uh, Mortal Kombat Nine style pop-ups, you know mm -hmm. where MK9 you didn't need to spend meter on combos, you essentially had strings that led to pop-up states, and some characters could go and dash forward and and punch you and continue that juggle a la Tekken, you know, uh, and that was a choice. That was a choice that they were like, okay, we want every character to sort of get combos and have access to them, and some obviously don't. Like there's right. characters like Jade and stuff, and several other MK9 characters just can't do it as well. But um, in MKX, they made it so that a lot of those pop-up states cost meter. So that was a big change. And now in MK11, you, you, there's no pop-up states anymore. Like for the most part, not a, char a very few characters actually have combos that lead to something, that lead to a juggle state. You instead have to combo into a special move and then amplify that special move to get something after it. And that's about all you get because the meter is only two bars now. So it's like it, it got... Progressively, in terms of like what you can do with the character, a little bit less and less and less. So, so I have this mindset that I want you to challenge, and it's something that's been driving me nuts for a really long time. Okay. Uh, I, not just fighting games, but games in general, I love getting better at. I love mm -hmm. learning. I love improving. I love just climbing that mountain. It's it's my favorite thing. But I think what's so important in that process is I, I don't want to do it if I don't understand how to get over that mountain. Yeah. And 
For Mortal Kombat 11, something that I like is in the process of improving, when things go wrong, I feel like the speed of the game and the mechanics of the game, it's very easy for me to be like, ah, that's that's why I got messed up there. That's why I didn't win that round. Like, I, It's just very easy to look at and understand. And it's a reason why I actually prefer one-on-one -on -one games over tag-based games is I enjoy chaos. Yeah, I, yeah, and I think that chaos is, is fun and exciting, and I definitely enjoy it to some degree. But what I feel like kind of puts a damper on, on that drive to get better is it's like, okay, dude hit me, and I'm just in the air for what feels like an eternity. And, and sometimes it's just so fast and so crazy, it's, it's hard for me to like reflect back on the match and be like, okay, wh where did I go wrong? And obviously that's not insurmountable, but I just think kind of at first blush, it can feel discouraging in a way that I, it's, it's harmful to a positive mindset, if that's fair. So uh, what you're saying is absolutely true. And this is why, why I recommend anyone that is like, I want to get into fighting games, which one should I play? And I'm like, whatever fighting game is about to come out that is looking pretty good, that has characters that you like, that might have a decent amount of people playing, play it on day one. Play it with people as they are learning that game, mm -hmm. and you can sort of learn with them. Because when you jump into a fighting game, and you're on day one, and you get paired up with the guy that's on day 627, <laughs> GFL, bro. Like, yeah. it's not going to go well. And that's going to be, that is the, that is going to happen in MK, in MK11. Absolutely. Uh, the only counter that I have to that advice that, I, that I've been finding in MK11 uh, is I think you're totally right, but getting in at day one, I feel like it also reinforces bad habits in a way where well, like like you're doing you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing but they're working because everybody is still learning and that's fine because like, that's a learning process sure like you need to you need to eventually drive stick and suck ass at it until you learn how right. to get it to fifth gear and right, you're okay right, right. so you need to I think that 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 reinforcement that like oh god I can't do slide from full screen or teleport <laughs> yeah, at time right. it works every once in a while but that's there's different kinds of players there's people that don't want to think about whatever they're doing and they think just doing the moves is okay and you know what? It's satisfying blowing those people up. Yeah. It's satisfying learning the fact that, oh, you know what? Well, I can actually stop Scorpion from doing this if I just play him at this range and then make him feel pressured. And he all of a sudden goes, Fuah! and pops to the opposite side, and then you properly punish. There there needs to be a point where your bad habits need to change. Um, and everyone at the beginning has bad habits, and that's fine. Like, that mm -hmm. that that growth process is, like, the whole point of fighting games. It's like the, that, that learning thing is actually fun. So... It, it really depends at the end of, like, you come here 10 years later, are we still going to be figuring things out about Mortal Kombat 11? I can't tell you because look at Smash Melee, you know. Like, every, everyone says this game is mechanically deep. It was not designed to be mechanically deep in any way at all. Players broke the game and found and found holes in frames that they could take advantage of and things that the developers in no way intended for players to do. And that could definitely be a thing that happens in the future of this game. So even though you're at day right day one and you're fighting someone that's pretty good right now, everyone's kind of still newish. And it's fine to feel that, oh, I'm doing stupid shit and it's working. That's fine. That's completely okay. But is it going to be the same stupid stuff you're gonna be doing like a year? Is everyone gonna be doing the same thing against you? That's that's the thing I don't we don't know right now. Yeah. And that's my big my big fear for a lot of fighting games. I hope that there is an element of discovery for these characters, an element of discovery for the mechanics that leads us to the point where, oh, I can do this, or maybe I can do that. That really fun aspect of fighting games, you know? Uh, so I want to talk about kind of just, I, I guess, the, the culture surrounding fighting games. And uh, last episode, we were talking about how I was playing the MK11 beta, and a dude rage quit. And I was like, what? Like, what? Why? What are you getting out of this? It's just a beta. This doesn't matter. Um, but... The more I think about it, I kind of understand. Like I'm not it's not okay. I'm not condoning it, but I get when people are popping off or sending those messages or rage quitting. Like when you're playing online and fighting games, sometimes you just see so much or sometimes it feels like a race to a bottom or like you're just having a bad day and you're losing repeatedly. Like that wears on you and I think it's just people trying to express that in probably not the best of ways. Yeah. Um, and I, I do have to say, just as a quick anecdote, uh, in the process of reviewing Mortal Kombat 11, 
I played a casual online match and there was a guy with a mic and I was like, no, like this is going to be awful. Like, everything I know has trained me to believe that this is going to be an awful experience. Were you on mic too? I was not on mic. Oh, so he was just talking to you. Why would I be on mic? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he he was on mic and I, <clears throat> it, it was just like the, the fear that came into me because I could hear him like making sounds in his room or whatever. Like oh, I just God. heard it. Like but he maybe had, in the background. Yeah, and I was just like, <laughs> okay. And I was just like mentally preparing myself for a shit storm. And it didn't happen. He, it was so much fun because like things would happen, uh, violent, crazy things, you know, Mortal Kombat, of course. He'd be like, oh man, that's cool. <laughs> or he'd be like, oh wow, really nice job there. And at the end, he was just like so polite and complimentary. And I felt bad and I was like, I wish I could be like, hey, thank you for making this match more fun. And I guess ultimately, Max, what I'm trying to wrap this all around to is... I don't want to sanitize fighting games or, or, or like the culture surrounding it. I think that would suck. But sometimes I think we could do, we could like keep things fun and competitive and emotional while also like doing a better job of bringing people into the fold. Because there, there are just times where it's like, Fighting games are so awesome, I wish more people could appreciate it. And I, I really think that's ultimately all I'm trying to say is once you see something great, you just want to share it with people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the entire basis of my channel and making movies and everything that we've ever done is that it's just sharing that feeling that you have of, of learning something and discovering things and the camaraderie we had in arcades and keeping those relationships and everything like that. That's like... That is literally the spirit of fighting games, of having like your training buddy and your friends to play online that are just there all the time. So, I mean, I get what you mean because it's like the polar opposite of what we're used to, which is the sort of like crazy, toxic, like rage monster stuff. That and it, it's it's hard, right? Because like hearing you tell those stories, it's like, oh man, there's there's kind of this this mystique around it. It sounds fun. It sounds dangerous. It sounds exciting. But it's like at the same time. That can also be bad. Oh, it's absolutely. a hard thing to process. Like, and, and that's the thing is that there there were absolutely some people that were just like super buttheads, like people that were just not the ones that and the ones that you would ever be friends with or or even want to fight against or anything like that, or you just want to see them lose. Like all those type of like human economics still translate to when you're online and you're just gonna run into a total d-bag and have to deal with some guy's stuff as he gets all mad at you in messages, like. People are people, like, regardless of the situation, it's just singling out the good ones. <laughs> right. Singling out the experiences that you like and the ones that make things a lot of fun. And some people, like, naturally gravitate, like, a lot of internet naturally gravitates towards, like, the rage monstery stuff because being angry is generally more popular mm -hmm. than not being angry. So I, I understand because anger is a, is a very heightened emotion. And positivity is a thing, or just in general, not being angry about some things and being critically, like, just being critical about some stuff is, people aren't used to it. It's like black or white. So it's those situations where there were some people that were definitely just super chill or some people that were just super mad all the time back in the arcade days. And that still translates today to, to these things. It's just that back in the day you were in person right and if you were you know on that complete end and a complete butthead about everything and no one liked you you got stabbed <laughs> like <laughs> like it's just it was just a bit different and now there's there's this level of of an anonymity for everything so of course i understand why people are being that way like i get mm -hmm. i get mad at the way people are playing but i know i'm not mic'd up and i'm not screaming at a dude and it's yeah. just like oh well i have a weird theory on this so like fighting games in particular is you versus one person and you're beating each other up. Like even if in a racing game, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, like the other person wins, it's like that person didn't beat me up. They're just faster. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, you're playing like Overwatch and you get shot. But it's like, yeah, that person shot me. I'm on a team. Like this is one-on-one. -on -one. You are fighting another human who has another health bar just like you do. Yeah. Okay. I think it does lead to some of it. So go ahead, Ben. Sorry. It's just, uh, I, I've had... I feel like multiple experience in Overwatch yeah. where we sometimes it feels like we're seconds into the match and like the slightest thing goes wrong and you get that guy that is like this fucking team is the worst <laughs> thing ever <laughs> yeah. just like and like if no one on the team maybe even did anything wrong it's just like something slightly negative happened cuz that's the second half I want to go on though is that I think that the fighting game barrier is 
sometimes good for it. You need yes. a certain maturity to get good at fighting games there to is put a, the time there's in. There's a great, great quote. I, I can't remember who it was from, but it was it was from an article of That's someone that, point. that mm-hmm. frequently does play fighting games and has played them for a very long time. And uh, what is it? Well, they, they use the term like like to make yourself feel powerful. What is that? What is that term in games where it makes you feel really powerful? Uh, um. In, I, I just think of an empowerment or like power fantasy. Power or, fantasy, yeah. Most 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 video games are power fantasies that put right. you in the shoes of a character that is a like a power fantasy. And in fighting games, when you play other people, it's a reality check. Yeah. And that's hard. Like that is that is not a thing. And I'm just used to it because I've been doing it for like almost 30 years of my friggin' life. Yeah. But when you think about it, and you have those situations where people haven't been exposed to this kind of thing, this very fi- fighting games are like very niche still, all things considered. And there's these team games and shooters and like league and all this kind of stuff where people use that as their competitive basis. Suddenly you're on a situation where there's no one else to blame but yourself. Right. People can handle that. Like people just aren't used to holding up or being responsible for that. That I'm just not good enough. It's it's something that I think is is very attractive about it and why I keep playing fighting games even at the casual level that I do is because th- there is an honesty there. There is a like you just kind of owning up and being like, no, I, I, I suck and I need to get better. And there's there's not necessarily an easy way to do that. It's just, I think the time for me where that kind of flips and becomes a bad thing, like Twitch is a really interesting example. And I've had personal experience with it, but I've also seen other people who are, are way better than me, thousands of times better than I am at, at any given fighting game. And like, Chad is just like incessantly bagging on them for like oh, yeah. a small mistake. Like they might win... Ten matches in a row, and then, the and then they have like you up, yeah. yeah, and then they have like one bad match. It's like, what? Like, what are we really doing here? Like, what are we trying to accomplish? I'm not saying that, like, you can't call people out when they mess up, but sometimes it just feels like it's so exaggerated to a degree that is like, a, not even fun, and b, not helpful. It's it's it is one of the most challenging things when when learning a new fighting game with like an active chat room that's there, like an open one where everyone can sort of communicate and contribute, because you do have your usuals that have been watching this stuff for a long time and know how it works, but especially if you are, yeah, broadcasting or something, and then you're learning or coming back to a game that you haven't played in like eight months to a year, and everyone has continually played. And you just have to get blown up for like a solid hour and a half before you remember how the game plays and right. get good at it. It is super demotivating. Like I, I'll say, there there will be some games when certain audiences show up that I just have to go into subscriber mode when I'm playing in like ranked matches because mm-hmm. I just can't read the chat room. It's 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 one of those situations where I would have to just like close it and just respond like I'm talking to them, but I can't read that stuff because I'm. it's super demotivating. And mm-hmm. as, as a person that has to do all this stuff and I admittedly can't practice them all the time and I have to come back after a year and a half of not playing like Street right. Fighter Five and relearn how to play it against people that have been playing it every single day for a year and a half. Right. It's challenging, much less you get, you're the target. Like there's a giant red circle above your head when you go online. So everyone's like, oh, he's online. I've been playing this game for six years. Let's get him. Right. <laughs> like, and that's really, it, it's a, it takes a, a next level of patience, and there are definitely moments of burnout as a result of that, where it's just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a break from this for a little while, and then we're gonna come back. But it's like, for my, my burnout's like three weeks, hmm. and then it happens like once a year around February. But I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's very challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes, it takes a, another level of mental preparation. I feel like uh, sometimes people hear conversations like this, and it's like, oh, you want to censor people or you want to remove you know the competitive ribbing or the rivalries or you just want to make everything so sanitized essentially for lack of a better word and it's like no that would suck that would suck if we're we're policing this so hard that you can't have any fun that you can't poke at each other like no one i don't think i don't think anybody really wants that nobody really wants that but i don't think it's bad to take a look at this and be like well how how could this be better how could this be more helpful again like kind of getting back to that central point of how do we share this awesome thing with people? Like, isn't that what we ultimately want? Yeah, it, it, it is. And in my experience, the, the best way to do it is just to, to empathize with others and to be able to actively communicate why you like something. Uh, and that that is a skill set that is not easy when you think about no, it. No, it's yeah. not. It's like not describing easy. why something is awesome and making it and making it feel that way for other people. 
And it's, it's like the one thing that people constantly say that, well, Max playing this fighting game and having a lot of fun made me go back and play it, and now I'm having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Being able to communicate that as it's happening live and explain why it's so cool is something that has taken me years to do, like eight, eight years of practicing that. So, and I get it, like why it's like, if people ask why is it hard for me to get my audience, because the usual thing people sort of go to is anger. Anger is a very easy thing to empathize with with people. Getting getting on someone's like, we're mad because this is happening. We're mad because that's happening. That's that'll that'll get you an audience fast. But in the same time, if you if you do that, and all of a sudden you do something, they're gonna revert all that energy that the same you reflect back to you. So you're in like a very wish washy like you're in like a riptide trying to fight this stuff all the time. But if you are around people that yeah empathize with others and you like sharing your experiences of why stuff is awesome, you get some of the, the coolest chat room and some of yeah. the, the coolest like community, which I absolutely have, of people that have that grew up with this stuff like like we did and are communicating to new people why it was great and why the new stuff is also really cool too. Um, I have to ask, just just because of your experience with this and learning and dealing with so much of this, did you did you have an early phase where the response was anger, or did like did you just kind of figure it out before it came to that? I, uh, I in in mine, I I never really had the response of of anger. Like I definitely would make videos talking about issues, but being specifically angry, like only in some situations where is it like really rough. And it does, I don't like things to come across as I'm just mad mm -hmm. about this. I want it to come across as this is the reason why people are upset. This is the reason why I'm not super happy about this. And this is what I would do to change it instead of calling people names and just screaming your head off. And constructive criticism is something that once, once again, it's one of those things that when it comes to fighting games and, and the internet, it's, it's hard to convey to a lot of people because it's either yeah. like you like it or you hate it. So it's like, I don't hate this game, but I just, I think this aspect of it is what is holding it back. Like Dragon Ball Fighters was a great example. The Super Dash like ruins the game for me. It's one of the most beautiful games I've ever played. The first three months of the game was incredible, but I just couldn't deal with that online anymore. It just, mm -hmm. it was too, it was way too frustrating. So I stopped playing the game completely and a lot of Everyone else that I was talking to that was playing Dragon Ball that loved it before it came out and as it came out did the same thing and they all had the same experience. So you sort of empathize with people like if they change that I would go back and play the game. But do I have anything against it? No. It's like would I like to play Injustice 2 a whole bunch? Probably not. It's a very projectile based far distance fighting game where you don't where that's heavily encouraged. You don't have to think about it too much. But does that make it a bad game? It doesn't. Some people probably love that. It, all the other stuff in the game is incredible. I'd give it like a 9 out of 10. But do I want to play it all the time? No, it's just not for me. Man, there, there's a lot that you said there that I, I want to touch on, but I have a question that I've seen a lot and I think is, is very complicated where you're somebody that's, that's covering these games and I, it is fortunate enough to speak with these developers and, and go on trips and stuff. And I, we're, we're in the same position. We have, sure. we have the same benefits happen to us. And I think that understandably creates a... a small sense of distrust amongst some people of like all right they're they're being positive about this oh, yeah. because of these opportunities and you can see the logical thread there oh yeah and you know in your own mind you're trying as hard as possible for that to not be the case um but it can be a, a hard thing i think to convey uh is how much of that have you had to deal with and do you think it's a problem that can be communicated better? Um, I don't think it can be communicated better because it just it, it just involves whatever creator, whatever platform you have to be as transparent as possible and mm. like hopefully they're not lying. There's no way to tell if somebody is lying or not regarding a situation, but when it came to like the two the two greatest examples are obviously MK11 and uh, Marvel versus Capcom Infinite and I still stand by that MVCI is the best playing Capcom fighting game since Capcom versus SNK2. And they they nailed a lot of stuff in it. But I am extremely critical of why the game fails in terms of its roster selection and visuals. Right. And that's what that ultimately led to the game's demise because that's what sells fighting games. Like mechanics don't. Unfortunately, unfortunately, gameplay doesn't sell fighting games. I'll see you like retweet combos from Infinite oh. all the time, and they're like, "Yeah, that's that's sick. This is, this is super cool." <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunately, so like, the game has like this gray filter over the whole thing, but it right. looks really cool. And like no competitive scene left, right? Like I don't even very know who's small. grinding the combos. You know, very, it bums me out. Very, very small, and that's 
and that's the thing. I, I love the game. It's some. Of the, it's it's probably one of the. It's my favorite Marvel vs. Capcom game to play. And yeah. I have to. You have to be very transparent about that because at the time, uh, even though I was speaking positively about this, people were flipping out like I was the defense force getting paid off to shill the game. But at the same level, since I was being critical about all those things in in video form as well, about why the roster's bad, like why the story mode didn't do anything for me, why the game is like, you know, why I'm giving it the score I'm giving it, people blamed me for the shortcomings of the game's sales and why it eventually died. So there's there is no like appe- how how could they there's no appeasing anybody like there there it's like I said it's black or white they're going to go to completely one end of the spectrum or the other. And it's either you love it or hate it. Mm-hmm. There's, it's it's, and that's why it's so hard for me to communicate constantly. Like why I think Dragon Ball Fighters is one of the technically the most beautiful fighting game because it executes its visuals in a way that is better than and the source material even looks. It's better than anything Dragon Ball has ever looked before, and it's got some of the best visuals and the the controls are amazing. I think it's mechanically fine, but there's some things that I just don't, I can't bring myself to play this game because it stresses me out. Mm-hmm. So. People think you hate it because right. you said the one negative thing. People think you absolutely love MBCI because you say it's a great playing fight. You know, that's, or people think that I now hate Mortal Kombat because I'm criticizing its, you know, microtrans not microtransactions, but its progression system. Even though it's like, yeah, the game is mechanically really fun and it's got the best online of every fighting game. It's it's hard for people to understand or even have access to that information. But if you go out of your way to articulate these points repeatedly yeah why do you think there's an unwillingness to accept some level of nuance there uh not everyone's like that you've met people like that oh absolutely yeah this is just the way you're, you're sort of the way you're hardwired so and I, I think i think being empathetic or trying to see things from a different perspective is a is a unique trait mm-hmm. that you know we kind of get exposed to more and more now with social media that some people just don't have that. They just want to see people get blown up or, you know, uh, and that's, that is, that is an aspect of it. So all things considered, there are, there are people that watch my videos that think I'm just the greatest player of fighting games of all time. I I see that a lot. I am beyond Mm. average, like absolutely beyond average because I don't have what it takes to, uh, to be great at these games, which is time. You need to just grind. You need to play the same guy 80 times and then play another guy 80 times and then do that for seven days straight and then do it every single week throughout the year if you actually want to be good at it. It's, it's about experience and you need that experience. So when I think about the the last, let's say, four years of fighting games, it is, it is crazy to me the number of things that have come out both big and small. Mm-hmm. And I think both you and I, and you especially, are fans of a lot of this. Mm-hmm. What, do you do you ever have the the sensation of guilt of man this new thing is coming out and I want to cover it and I know my audience wants me to cover it but I also want to keep grinding away on this thing like the, I, I guess do you feel like a, it ter- it's almost like a relationship Ben it tears at my soul yeah <laughs> it, and it's it's a thing as a competitor that grew up wanting to be good and understand these things and practicing parrying literally everything in third strike every single day, every opportunity I could just so I can get good at that game. Yeah. It, it absolutely tears at my soul that in, in my current position, it is not beneficial for myself or my community to just do the exact same thing over and over and over and over. Hmm. And I've, I've been willing to accept that ever since I started working on Killer Instinct back in like 2014, 2015. And that's when I truly like branched out and started playing a lot of, a lot of different stuff. And However, the the return in terms of how people sort of approach you and they value your opinion because you're sort of like an overarching expert that plays a lot of stuff and understands things at a level and I'm able to pick things up fast, like that's a skill set that I also learned to develop is that I can sort of pick up the mechanics of a fighting game really quick and go toe-to-toe with developers before the game is out and they're like, yeah, you know how to do kind of the hard things really fast. Um, but keeping up with it, is the thing that is just very difficult. So right. there's some fighting games that come out where I'll just I'll just sink a holy crap ton of time into. Like Killer Instinct was one of them, mm-hmm. and I played I played a ton of it, especially season one. And then MVCI, I admittedly played like a ton because I just loved the game for the first few months and got pretty damn good at it too. And I would say also MKX I found to be a ton of fun too. But 
the online, the launch online really hampered that experience. But yes, for what you're saying, I wish I could just play Tekken 7. <laughs> just play a whole, just keep playing Tekken 7 because it's so good. I wish I could just keep playing and the online also supported Guilty Gear Exard <laughs> because it's just so good. Like, and it's, it's so much fun. Max, I agree with you so hard. <laughs> Tek Tekken 7 is, is phenomenal. It is it's, great. I Before Tekken 7, like I enjoyed Tekken. I played a lot of Tekken Tag Tournament. I enjoyed Tekken 3, but I wasn't really a, a Tekken guy, and I, I still don't think it's fair for me to call myself a Tekken guy. Mm -hmm. But Tekken 7 like was kind of this, like, the the clouds parting and I was like, holy shit, like this is doing so much right for me. It is it's really good. And I and I had that enthusiasm and I talked about it and I streamed it and I played it and I dropped it because I moved on to, to other I, I review a bunch of different things. I do this show where we talk about a whole bunch of video games. And I I it like you said, it tore up my soul when people are like, Yo dude, why don't you play Tekken Seven anymore? You must not love it. Like that must have all been it hurts. phony. Yeah. And it's like n no and I see where you're coming from, but it's like if, if I do that, it comes at the cost of all this other stuff, and the thing on that side of the other stuff is also my job. Because people are now like, why aren't you doing this new thing? Why aren't you right. covering this right. brand new right. game? Right, and so it feels like, sometimes it just feels like a, a road where it's like, I have to pick a direction, and like it's not going to be right in every sense. I, I say this a lot where it's, I, I feel like at any given time I'm actively playing 17 to 20 different fighting games. Right. It's it's a juggling act where it's just, you don't know what the hell you're doing and then someone literally throws in three more balls and you're like, holy mother of God. And it's, it's and then you have to like completely switch it up where I now I have to get good at Sekiro, you know, right. really fast. And I have to try to beat this game in two days or something like that. And it, and it comes to a boiling point. Like there was a point in Sekiro where I was like kind of frustrated with a bit of the a bit of the core gameplay because uh, I just didn't have enough time. Right. Like I just didn't have enough time to have to sink in and learn every single boss's like parry pattern all over again. And and I had to come back to it like a week later and then really enjoy the final experience of the game. And that's just because we're in a very unique situation that not a lot of people have to deal with. Some people just get to buy that game that's that works for three months and they just get to play the holy balls out of it for right. a long period of time and get really damn good. And I wish I could I wish I could do that. I wish there was games also that made me feel that way where I just wanted to do that all the time. Yeah. But in in terms of keeping an audience, it and here here's my here's my rebuttal to this whole thing of why it doesn't like just give you grief that right. you can't just do the one thing that you love so much. When you take breaks from things and you are you're 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 revisiting it, you're reminded by how much you love it. Right. Because after a while, yes. you do something too much. Like I said, it grates on you. You you you're like, oh, this is crap in this game. I remember this stupid mechanic. Like right. even Third Strike, like I said at the high level, is my favorite fighting game of all time. But it's got some dumb shit. Like at the at the highest level, there's some broken stuff and broken characters, and it is horribly imbalanced. But at that mid level, it's incredible. So when you take a three month break or a six month break and you come back to the game and you sort of like get those couple of matches, you get back on the bike and figure it out, you're back at that mid level really quick and you're playing with people that hopefully are doing the same thing and it is the most fun. Right. It is so incredible how much fun it is. So another thing happened with Killer Instinct recently where we would just jump back and tried KI and we're listening to the music and watching all the uh, the ultimates, like the the the, the ultra slash um, like fatalities of the game for the most part, and just forgetting that that stuff is in there, and then watching it again and seeing how cool this character is in their costumes, and you're like, this game is the bee's knees, man. It yeah. is just the sickest thing. And then the music kicks in, and the it goes with the action. You're like, that shit goes away when you're when you're playing it all the time. That, and that's what I tell the people, and that it's just kind of a hard thing to understand when you're playing a fighting game. And you've been playing them a lot, you see the graphics for two hours. And then after you've understood how the game plays and you're figuring things out, the graphics are gone. You're just figuring things out. And you're just understanding the core mechanics and you're learning how to get this optimization better. And I think for some people that, that period will be longer. For me, it's two hours. And I'm not, I'm not seeing the crazy cool explosions anymore. I'm just seeing my opportunities to get from here and there. You're but seeing you, the numbers. You the see, you're essentially seeing the numbers, <laughs> and then but you come back to it and you're reinvigorated. Why? This is why Dragon Ball Fighters is amazing. Look at this game, dude. The right. beams are huge. The cinematic. You're you're reminded of all those things that make it make it incredible. Max, I just had I just had a moment 
where I, I was thinking about this conversation and how much I was enjoying it and the, the perspectives that we were getting. And on Frame Trap, multiple times throughout the three years of this show, we've had moments where we've lost audio or something's been wrong with the shot. And I just, I'm having a moment of panic. And I just like, I love this so much that I just want to make sure everything is going okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I am just going to go check the mixer real quick in the middle of the <laughs> show. I know that that seems horribly unprofessional, but I just, I love it so much. I just want to make sure that it's like recording okay. at mm -hmm. the very least. All right. So, so I'll you want right us back. to keep talking? Please, please. Okay. okay. Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> so you were playing Cetrion? Did you play online? Oh no, you know I'm sorry. Collector. Collector. Did you play online? No, 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 no. So I don't really play online. Any, any. Uh, and admittedly, like, I'll play one or two online. Completely fine. And yeah. The majority of people don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so collector is mostly to raise coins to use in the crypt. Yeah. Like so, I was just kind of trying to like get some revenue going. Uh, Which is a challenging process in the game currently. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but like, thing is, I love the crypt. As it's Mortal Kombat Disneyland. Yeah. Yeah! Wow, that's really good. That is perfect. Ben, are we good? We are we are thankfully good. Okay, I want to okay. issue an apology to the audience for that that horribly <laughs> awkward interruption, but... I've had those we, moments. We've all we, had that moment of panic. We are, we are good, and like I, I can just like rest a little bit easier. Yeah. Yes, we're good. Once things get beyond that hour mark, you're like, oh god. Yes, yeah. It's like... I Because... You know, you you drove all the way down here, and I'd hate to be like, "Hey, man, you want to do another hour and forty minutes?" <laughs> Let's yeah, go. I just I just like don't want to do that to you either. And like so. we got to act surprised about the stabbing right, a like, second time. Like, right, right, right. Whoa. Somebody got stabbed. Wow. <laughs> that sounds crazy. Yeah, you just you lose so much, and we've we've had to do that before. I don't know if the audience is fully aware, but we've lost entire episodes. We've lost twenty minutes. We've lost like more than an hour. The wonderful thing of being audio tech. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and. You, you've had to do it. I've had to start the show over again. And it's not that you're being disingenuous. You're just trying your best, but it's, it's not the same. The magic isn't the same it's okay, when ben. you do it again. If if I had to talk about the stabbing, he would have stabbed him. And then <laughs> and then in the next story that we had to repeat, he would have amplified it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then it would have got a juggle Two stage. hits. Yep. <laughs> and multiple, Mixing it up. It would have been better. It would have been even better. <laughs> just <laughs> this golden spark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he would have uh, broken away. But we're talking about the crypt. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're talking about, crypt. We're talking about ben, Mortal Kombat. This is my Disney hotake. Life. Is I love the crypt. Okay, I too love the crypt. I too love the crypt I, itself. Yeah. Right. I yes. think the crypt yeah. is very lovable. Yeah. It's just how there's just there's too many layers for enjoying what it's offering. Like imagine. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe a way to kind of focus this is imagine you go to Disneyland and you want to get on Space Mountain. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, to get on Space Mountain, first you need to go over here, okay? And then you need to collect one piece of something at this spot, and it may not be right, so you're gonna need to re-roll it, and then you need to go over here, and you need to get another thing. And like, you gotta go to the dumpster, eat a bunch of trash. Yes, eat yeah. a bunch of trash, <laughs> which you don't enjoy, but trust yes. me, Space Mountain will be worth it. <laughs> and then you go on Space Mountain, <laughs> and they're actually like, Sorry, we mislabeled it. It's, it's Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And it's like, what? Wait, I what? ate all that trash for Space Mountain. But, but still, Shang Tsung is there. He's like, this was my favorite pod. Right. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just, it's just kind of this, <laughs> this roller coaster of emotions yeah. where you want to interact with it, but it feels like sometimes they put so many layers into it that like your enthusiasm kind of drains. And I know that analogy went all over the place. And well, And then you wonder, didn't I pay to get into this park to get access to these things? Right. Why yes. can't I just get on it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've seen people kind of come back at this criticism and be like, "Okay, you could a you can just ignore it that it's that it's just cosmetic stuff, and b you don't want to unlock things like don't you want to play this game for a while?" And it's like, yes, I, I hear you, but Mortal Kombat 11, like everything you do, every match you do. It, it's almost like it's taunting you when you just get one heart. Like you're, it's not something that you can completely ignore. Like it's always in your face. There are daily challenges to get currency. Everything you're doing is kind of feeding back into the system. So I, I, I almost feel like it's something you have to be aware of. A, and B, like, it's not that. Of course, people want to unlock things, but it's okay to talk about how the process of unlocking is, and if it isn't fun or it feels grueling and you just don't want to do it anymore, I think that is totally valid. Just because you can unlock things doesn't mean the method for doing so is good. So I can already tell that you've had people that are like, just get good at it. 
Right. I've right. already tell. I can already tell the way he's describing it. You've you've had people that are like in the defense force right. of of Mortal Kombat or NRS, and they're just completely like, regardless of if they, even if they played it, they're yes. just like, I'm going to be okay with it. They've already made up their mind. Sure. So, I'm in a similar boat where. I have put a lot of time into unlocking things and figuring out how they unlock and the way it works. And there is a perfectly good reason why there's articles about it. There's a perfectly good reason why the game is being heavily review bombed from a lot of people on Metacritic and Steam, because it is bad. Uh, it is, in, in comparison to the previous games and even in comparison to Injustice 2, which was not great either, like the way their unlock system was was jank and all over the place and inventory management was better. Even Injustice 2 is way less than what MK11 is setting up. And here's and here's why. Here's the, the, it ultimately boils down to how do you get money and currency? Well, you got to play through the Towers of Time. Towers of Time are similar to the previous Mortal Kombat Towers where you go through a tower and you fight characters. Earn stuff, cool, right? Injustice 2 was sort of the same way. There were bosses with more health. You fight them and it might take a while and you have to get better at it, cool. In Mortal Kombat 11, almost every single tower has these things called modifiers, <laughs> or not augments. I think they are modifiers. Where yeah, they're, you yep. get access to them, but the way you get them is completely random. And in the crypt, you have to go unlock them and stuff, which is why the crypt gives you some easy money at the start. So you go to the crypt, you get a couple of modifiers. It's like a missile, like si Sector's missile. You get Cyrax's net, and you, they recharge during games. So if anyone had played Mortal Kombat X's... Uh, uh, like the Easter Tower, the the Fourth of July Tower. They had they had holiday events in MK11, which were essentially I didn't know that. That's cool. They were test you like it was really cool. They had a Christmas one where Santa was crying across, and you can throw <laughs> presents at people. <laughs> it was just goofy, and like things would be flying in and blowing up all the time. It was insane. Yeah. Um, it was an insane, really fun one-off. MK11's core single-player experience revolves you doing that and being good at it and trying to find a way of managing it, and it is impossible. Like, it's one thing for you to understand how a character fights and get good at fighting that character and learning the matchup and punishing. MK11 puts all of that in there already with very hard AI, but also sticks in the fact that they have access to three, sometimes four elements where the screen is just going to freeze you randomly. They're going to punch you, but you're going to you're going to respond and get them and get the counter hit. But they shoot missiles even while they're being hit, and you do have access to things to counter these, but the acquisition of them is random. Yeah. So so that's that was my biggest thing, especially prior to release and then right at launch, is you would get into some of these tower fights and you're like, okay, they have a modifier. Uh, let's say when I get close to them, the screen just turns pitch black. That is, a, that I, could, is I didn't hear about that. That blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th that's that's a hard thing to deal with. Just not being able to see your opponent yeah. is a very hard thing to and deal I with. And I guarantee you there's some random modifier you can buy that prevents the screen from going okay, black. But, but, that's, that's <laughs> but you thing. can't get it. So, like, for example, you mentioned that characters can freeze you. There is a consumable that you can get to prevent the freezing, but you're not working with the sa same rules that your opponent is working with, where they can freeze you whenever, and your consumable, well, you'll, you'll well, pop it, it'll be on a long cooldown, and it, the effect doesn't even last very long. Yeah, and even if you get to the next match that has the same cooling thing, right. it doesn't stay. You have to use right, another you have to use one. A, you have to use it again, and yeah. it's a limited resource. <laughs> and it's, it's just like Mortal Kombat 11, there seems like there's so many things where it's like they, they just took it like 10 steps too far. It's like... I'm all for a cool, interesting challenge. I'm cool with it being weird. But then if you do all of this, and they can do it whenever, and they don't have a cooldown for these abilities... And they're a computer. Right. <laughs> that is not a person. That right. is not going to screw up. And it, it to, to allow it to be hit is a computer saying, I am allowed to be hit. Then why do they have so much health in it, on top of all this other bullshit? Yeah. And it goes even further because it's like, okay, well, what else can I do against this? And it's like, well, your gear, you can augment. You can get augments to increase different aspects of your character to make it easier. And it's like, okay, how do I do that? These are the slots in the... These, these are the slots like in my gear. backpack. You have to gotcha. level up the gear right. to get you the You have augments. to level up the gear yeah. individually to get one slot on it. And then you have to level it up again to get another slot. And the slots are random. So... They also have different sizes. They have different. I didn't even know they had yeah, different sizes. Yeah, they have sizes. like triangles and circles and tiers and, and like, like flames. stars yeah. and like flames. Well, I knew that. Yes, so I knew that. Get, I knew if that. You, if you get an augment that's a circle shape, that's yeah. really good. 
gives my character like 15% more health. Right. If your gear doesn't have the circle shape, you can't use it. Right, exactly. So, so they do get good. Like so far, all I've seen is like three percenters. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So that's what I was going to say. But I haven't had anything. I've put like 30 hours into this game. I have had no augments that are actually really good. <laughs> right, and so, so that's... That is my ultimate point with Mortal Kombat 11 is it's like, okay, I'm running into this problem. The problem seems like it's way too much. How do I fix it? The way to fix it is just so convoluted. It's not like just go here and do this. It's like go here, grind this thing out. Then you might have a chance to get something if you don't get random rewards that might eventually help you. It's just like, it's all so vague and all over the place. And in Elder Realms credit, Towers of Time are way more manageable now. Yeah, I am getting through things better. that I could not get through. Yeah. They have tweaked things, they have tweaked but health, they have made things blockable. But there is still some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that um, is really bad. And it just, it just seems so baked in that I, I don't know how you fix it completely. Uh, to me, the, the best way to fix it completely is turn modifiers off. Uh, I t- look at the things that are like passive changes and stuff like you hit the opponent and you know maybe you do poison damage or maybe some opponents have more health and only you have access to those crazy modifiers like missiles and nets and rain but the enemy has more health and maybe they're harder as a result so it kind of counters that fact but having them do it to you and you doing it back is not it is some of the most unfun stuff i've ever because it breaks what a fighting game is it breaks Mm -hmm. the fact that i'm going to learn my character and get good at this it is. It just turns it into a completely random slog right. of just. Well, I'm just going to hope that they don't do it, and that's how I end up winning a lot of these fights. I just, I, I just I jump kick in a whole bunch and pray that they didn't do it. And oh, right. I randomly missed. Okay, cool. I, I won. Do I get any satisfaction from that? Absolutely none. Right. It was like the same thing as I was going through story on V Hard when I eventually beat it. It wasn't like a wonderful triumph that this is done. I didn't do anything different. Like at, at the beginning, I was learning how the fight was, but I had been doing the exact same thing for the past 45 minutes and getting closer and closer and closer and then not close at all. Yep. But then the computer just chooses to let me hit it a whole bunch. Uh, doing, I was doing Aaron Black's character tower and before they fixed it, I, I was able to conquer it, but I would get through it mostly fine and then I would get to the very last fight and it would just be such a huge spike where it's like I don't even I don't even want to do this anymore and it's just it, it just felt like I, like it no matter what I did everything was wrong and things were so stacked against you that it was super demotivating but now just with you being able to block more things and them having far less health it's it's still somewhat challenging but conquerable, which I'm way on board with. But I think it's just there's just like a frust- frustrating lack of transparency. Yeah. So like the crypt is a good example, where it felt like at launch everybody was like, "Hey, are all these things randomized? Wait, this thing isn't randomized, yeah. but is in a different spot." Like there were all these questions like that. We were figuring it out day one. Just like, so how does this actually work? Yeah, how does this actually work? And I I, I imagine even from like a, a an even more casual perspective, like. Does everyone playing the game even know that augments are in it? You know, and it's just yeah. I, obviously they're trying to keep the crypt mysterious, and that's cool in a lot of ways. And I don't need you to solve the puzzles for me or tell me how to get through every door or anything like that. But it just felt like when it came to rewards and how you move forward and how you do things, there could have been a lot more explanation, a lot more being like, hey, here's what's going on. And then it leads to an element of mystery where they didn't explain the crypt at all pre-release. Like there was there was a trailer that shows your a, your crypt character walking in and talking to Shang Tsung and he's like I got a bunch of crazy shit on my island have fun and yeah. then it cuts out there and they never talked about it after that right and then it comes out and it is the way it is and it's like did they specifically just not mention it because they knew it was gonna go over really bad like I don't I, I have to give them the benefit of the doubt here because and that's why I'm, I'm, I, I trust people at face value so right. I'm gonna assume there's no nefarious intent when they did the, the the combat cast where they were talking about the like hey here's what's going on we're fixing it yeah. When they brought up the crypt, they're like, oh, wait, don't say that. Don't mention that. So I, I think they're just very proud of a lot of the cool stuff that's in there and, and the moments that you see yeah. and the things that you uncover. And they, they have every right to be because that stuff is legitimately very cool. It's Mortal Kombat Disneyland. It's mm-hmm. awesome. But it's just like the nuts and bolts stuff regarding chess and currencies specifically, I think, could have been communicated and you wouldn't have ruined no. a lot of that surprise. Uh, so, go ahead. Go ahead, Kyle. So I think... Um, uh, Smash Bros. World of Light is yeah. a kind of good example of how to do modifiers in a fun way. Yes. The, some of those matches I actually have a really good time in. You know, they have like an electric floor or this guy's huge and has like breathing flames, right? But for some reason, like it's fun. I don't yes. know what the difference it's is. A, it's a fine line. Yeah. Like, well, 
Because yeah. I think you're still playing Smash, essentially. Like, you're still able to play your game. Yeah. Blocking this, still blocks. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, in this in this one, there is literally attacks that hit you that are yeah. unblockable, and you can't have... Like, there was one with a huge energy beam that dude. just gets shot across. Like, there's one where you just, you, you just don't have meter. Yeah, yeah. You just, you don't, just don't have, have it. You just don't yeah. have meter, or you're poisoned the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and all of the enemies' recoverables seem to go at three times faster a rate than any of yours do. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there was one with Jackie, and I, I bet you a lot of other people ran into this because it's it's a it's a progressive tower. Like you pretty much kill the tower, new one comes up, kill the tower, two new one comes. So it's like stage five, and you're at stage seven, uh, and it's always there. There's one with Jackie, and there's one with Cassie, and they assist each other. This is where I dropped out. This, this one right here. This is this this is the one where yeah. everyone is like, oh my god. So and it's they called have, like easy still. It's just like it says, beginners. Yeah. It says a beginner tower. Yeah. That shoots there's a Kung Jin arrow that can shoot fast and it's like practically invisible. It shoots out and if it hits you, you're trapped. You're stuck in a trap <laughs> state. And there's Takeda missiles on the other end that are unblockable missiles, which they said will be blockable eventually, but they, they they shoot down and they blow your ass up and then they also have the other characters so Jackie has Cassie uh, doing stuff to you. So what happens is you try to start the fight and then Cassie comes out and then you block Cassie and then you go in and you start punching and you get a hit but here comes, as they're being hit, Takeda's friggin' arrow hits you as you're doing combos and while you're in the stun state she kicks you and the missiles come in and blow your ass up. You lose 60% life. Yeah. There's no way to stop that. I have no consumable to counter this. It, it almost sounds lucky. like a joke. Like you're just you're just like concocting this like crazy situation. It's not. I'm like this isn't even a video game anymore. Like. And I think about World of Light, and there were there are absolutely fights in World of Light where I was pulling my hair out, and I was like, this is bullshit. But and it like, felt like mad. you you're getting better. Well. Yeah. To me, it was more like, all right, I'm just going to go a different direction on this giant map and come back or sure. Or, or yeah. like, what is behind this? I don't like need. In a, in a way, and you don't need it in Mortal Kombat 11, but like the difference is, so in, in World of Light, you can unlock characters that way if you if you find them on the map and you beat those challenges leading up to that character. But you can also unlock them other ways just by playing the game. And so it feels like, okay, this sucks, I don't want to do this, or this is frustrating me. There's another path, yeah. whereas like, sometimes it feels like in Mortal Kombat 11, it's like, if I want this gear, the way forward, like, I'm very limited or it feels like getting there is super frustrating. And, like, I think about all of the skins that there are for a character. So, like, Aaron Black is my dude right now. I really want to focus on him. But the thought of getting everything, it's just like, this This isn't fun. Well, I mean, and it's and this is another thing to tie it all together. If you haven't, if you haven't come across it, each character has about, like, 60 skins. Um, and these are, like, M mostly the same looking things with different colors. Yeah. There's about four different actual models per character, maybe four or five. And then you have the gear that's on the characters, which is largely very throwaway. Like, the gear changes very little, but if it's a mask, it can make the character look cooler. Yeah. But usually the other things are like you change a sword, you change a belt buckle, you know, you're, it, it's very minor. And then you have all the other things which are unlocked via the same process, which is brutalities. And then you have uh, the padding. And this is, this is where the game gets rough. There's so many variation icons. I think somebody said there's like 2,000 total variation <laughs> icons that could be for every character. And they have three, each character has three sets of variation icons. It's like 30 different designs for your variation, but they give you white ones, yellow ones, red ones. And those are all different. So on top of that, you have all these variation icons, but you also have the concept art. Concept art that could be hundreds of pieces of concept art are in the same boxes that you get gear, that you get costume items, that you get brutalities. And then there's character cards. Character cards, concept art, and the icons, all this stuff would come through natural progression before. You essentially play your character, level up, and it just gives it to you. Oh, congrats, you did this many matches, here's your character card. It's all in the crypt. All of it's in the crypt. So even though they're like, yes, you can get, there's 600 boxes throughout the crypt, some things are set, some things are not, it's guaranteed that all these items are randomly throughout the crypt in a, in, in a way that is not very controllable, and even the ways that are controlled are limited. Like, you go to a box that is the same for everybody. I want a Noob Cybot box. You go to it, it's the same Noob Cybot box for everybody, but it costs 250 hearts. Yes. And it gives you one skin, a couple pieces of gear, I think a brutality, and a couple of other things. But even if you think of that, I'd have to open up 50 of these boxes if I wanted to do that. And 250 hearts... I mean, explain how you get hearts. Mm -hmm. You could spear random enemies in, in the crypt that give you one heart each. 
and you can do fatalities. Fatalities give you one heart. Brutalities give you two. And some challenge towers maybe sometimes will give you like 10 to 25 on average. Well, so there, there are times where it's like the heart. So there's there's completion rewards for the towers where if you just finish it, you're guaranteed to get this stuff. And then there's performance rewards. Oh, yeah. Sometimes and, I don't hit those, dude. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, the, that's where and, most of the hearts and are. And oftentimes, yeah. the heart <laughs> is the final thing on the performance reward. Yeah. Yeah. And... Sometimes the, the the how you raise that performance, like there are times where I'm like, I'm not really playing any better, but I'm not getting, or I'm not really playing any worse, but I'm getting more rewards or less rewards. Like I'm, I'm it kind just of on happens. The, yeah, and so it's so frustrating when you need hearts so desperately, and they're the very last thing, and you're like a few thousand points away from hitting that target, and you don't get the twenty five. And it's hearts. not like it's not like a, a huge. This is twenty five hearts. You'd have to do that ten more times. Right. To get one of these boxes, so you can you can have the AI fight for you, and I was like, okay, I was <clears throat> working on the the MK11 script, editing it, and just doing it. And I was like, I'm just gonna periodically, like, have the AI do. I'm gonna have the AI do an endless chow, and I'm gonna grind it out. It is way better. It is way better, but after hours of just kind of casually checking in on it, I had a like a small handful more of hearts. It's just it's just not enough. And I think you said on stream, you were like. They could increase this to like you getting ten hearts with they a fatality. They could literally increase and it, it would tenfold. still feel like a lot. It would still lot. take forever. Yeah. yeah. So now it it takes and and ultimately it boils back down to even if you get that one box from what people have discovered, there's like one box per character that gives you cool stuff. You would still have to find fifty other boxes that have those skins if you were to get all the skins for your character. But the thing is, that doesn't exist. There's only one set box per character, as we've discovered right now. And I think most of the crypt people have kind of figured out at this point. So all the rest of the stuff, like half of the gear is spread through random boxes. Random boxes that can cost between regular coins that are a different currency, or like green stuff, which is another harder to find currency. And still getting currencies is difficult. My issue, my, my big issue that I try to stress to everyone is that I just want the brutalities for my character. Right. Like, brutalities actually change gameplay for me. I have to, I'm gonna end fights differently. I'm gonna go for different things during a match. Like, it's one of the coolest parts of MKX because you get to access to these finishers and I'm gonna be secretly building in the background to do this crazy brutality. Right. It actually those, is gameplay affecting. Like, in my don't opinion. block for the whole second match. That's hard to do. Exactly. And your opponent doesn't realize, but you're like, I'm gonna but do But I'm gonna get this sick finisher. Yeah. So, fatalities, every character gets two. One, you don't know what the hell it is, but you can still do it. You actually have access to it. Right. And yes, it's as simple as, as just looking it up. Uh, but when you start and you have like, do you, how many brutalities do you start with? I think two. Two, for, two per character. Okay. Two. And, but the, the first one is always like the it's classic generic, up, uppercut. I think a, everyone's got yeah, the so everybody, universe, everybody, yeah. everybody has that. Yeah. And you start with just one fatality. And even when you get two, you just find yourself being like, man, like these things are long. They're long to watch. Or at least they feel long because I've been doing You've been them, them over and over and over again to get this one heart over and over and over again. And I just wish I had more. And you're totally right. Like you just want that variety because it does affect how you're enjoying the game. But it's there's not a great simple way of getting it. Yeah. Like and to get those brutalities, all we've really deducted is that they're between boxes that cost five thousand to nine thousand coins. So you have to run through. But there's no way to guarantee you're going to get it for your character. You're mm -hmm. going to get it for Cetrion, you're going to get it for Random. A at least in Injustice 2, when you got gear, you just got gear. It, you didn't get icons and all this other padded stuff to sort of fill out the fact that, oh, well, they're going to get gear too fast. It it's like Injustice 2 system was actually better. So now I'm in this boat where I just want the stuff for my character, man. Right. Like, I, I did not have a personal issue unlocking the crypt in MKX because I wanted the brutalities. Like, when I was playing a character or doing a week of and learning a character, I need to be able to do the cool stuff with them. Yes. And, so, when, and when you're saying unlocking the crypt, you, you're specifically referring to the $20 money to... The, the $20 pass. Yeah. So, and as you just said, you can't play a game for more than a month, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and even even in MKX, if you wanted to unlock everything in the crypt, it yeah. would take you like solid three to four months of playing every single day and trying to get currency to unlock everything. Yeah. I just I just have to say it's always frustrating when you unlock things for 
Like you're, let's say you're going for a specific character and you're getting stuff for another character. That's a frustrating experience. But I feel like there's always one character in the roster where you're like especially mad when you get stuff for them. Yeah. And I think Cetrion is Cetrion is, that. is absolutely. <laughs> everyone's character is Cetrion. Like, I opened oh a Cetrion uh, heart chest. I was so mad. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you're like, <laughs> I spent... Oh, it's the worst thing. You're like, not Cetrion. And you I thought this Cetrion would be cool. So yeah. It took eight hours to get these hearts, and now it's just, you get a Cetrion skin. It's like, yeah. oh, great. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you my crypt hang up right now. Uh, some of the So some of the exploration is tied to stuff you do outside. And like one of them was cool. It was like, go do 10 mercies. I'm like, that's fine. I'll, that's yeah. fine. I'll go do that. Yeah. Uh, Right now, I cannot progress until I get skeleton keys. And skeleton keys are just raw randomness. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going around opening every box. I ran out of money. I'm broke now. Yeah. And I have zero skeleton keys. Yep. So I can't progress in the crypt until I just find a skeleton key. Yeah. Uh, we didn't, it's killing me. We didn't mention this in the towers, but something else that I think is like just completely needless uh -huh. is... so. I wanted stuff for Aaron Black, and the, the the way that they kind of sell you is they're like, hey man, if you spend 25,000 coins, we'll give you a tower specifically for that character that oh you want, where God, you're guaranteed yeah. to get stuff, and it's like, okay, cool. Um, and you get, so you get things for completing every tower, and then you get things for completing all the towers. And to get to the last tower, not only do you have to be everything else that came before, but they throw on this stupid, you have Stupid. to uppercut a hundred times or something like that. So in the case of Aaron Black, I had to just throw 50 times. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm going to throw a lot. Like, this is going to happen. But it didn't count the throws you were doing before. It only counted the throws you were doing after you unlocked the tower. And you no could only way. get the throws in towers. Oh, so you just, just have to why? throw a computer 50 times. Which like, is weak because you know it's keeping track anyway. It's all in your character card. Oh, yeah, card. it's in your character. But, yeah. but it only starts counting them once the tower is unlocked. And so it's just... It's just <laughs> Exactly what we're. I don't know what I'm saying is it's like I'm looking at it. And it's like, why? Why so, do this? It's not like I didn't put in effort to get here. It's not like I didn't climb through a whole bunch of other things and a whole bunch of other modifiers. Like, why do this thing? This I'm, isn't fun. I'm gonna amplify this. Okay. <laughs> Once you beat that tower and you've gotten all that stuff done, stage two pops up. Yes. More towers. You have to. You have to spend twice towers? as many. But now coins. you have to spend twice as many coins to get access to another skin and more stuff. So it's 25k to get in the first. 25k. House. Then it's 50k. 50K. I did not know there's. And a then you get through, and it's way harder. Characters <laughs> have more goofy, crazy laser sword things that are flying at you. Yeah. But then you get towards the end, and now you have to do 75 fatalities once the tower is unlocked. <laughs> That's not it. The last one is, uh, I think, 50 brutalities. That's so hard. That Yes. And that's specifically difficult. Like, you can't, the AI does a lot of fatalities on its own, mm -hmm. but it's still taking me, like, days for it to eventually get to the point of, of it just grinding for eight hours a day of just doing stuff. I haven't even gotten all the fatalities yet. Brutalities, I'm at, like, four because they don't happen very often. I don't, I'm not even going to think about it. Like, I'm just like, I, I think that's the end of my road right there. Yeah. Even if I want this skin, I'm not going to get it. And I, I can't speak for you, Max, or for you, Kyle, but I, I don't think I would get so riled up about this or spend so much time trying to explain this to the best of my ability if I didn't like the game. Like, yeah, the and that's reason, why you're passionate about right, it. Right, yeah. the reason why I'm so mad and I'm, like, ragging on this so hard is because I'm really having a great time playing the game and I want to keep playing it, but it just feels like this, this thing that is making it so hard to enjoy. Yes. I, or... or it's not that I'm not enjoying it. It's just hard to enjoy fully. Like I, it, it's just like I want to go in for that big hug. For me, it's and it's this bad smell. For me, it actually it actually affects it because brutalities affects the things that I enjoy about playing the characters. Yeah, and it's one of my favorite things in Mortal Kombat X, and it was worth the value to me to just get them all unlocked because you couldn't do it unless you found them. So, it's not even it's it's the fact that the game doesn't respect your time at all like if you just want to get that stuff it's you're just going to eventually randomly happen across it if you play eight hours a day for months and there are still special moves that were unlocked in injustice 2 like robin had access to his staff that was uh from injustice 1 where you can literally get a staff and it's a cool special move that he can do i never got it of the entire time I played Injustice 2, I never got it. That's this, way worse. That's yeah. That's I real, that's bad. Never had it, and, and in this situation, there could be a moment where I've been playing MK11, and the next NRS game is coming out, and I just never got that noob side about brutality. Yeah, and that's what is like, dude. Like what? 
I, I, I'm willing to pay money for this. And yes, what they're saying, and a lot of people are like, the game is so microtransaction heavy. It's not. Mm -hmm. Like, the, there's very few microtransactions where the game is just every once in a while. You can buy this brutality for five bucks. You can buy this skin for five bucks. You can buy this, like, random gear for three dollars. But they're once a day cycles, and they're only like five. Yeah. So yeah. it's like five random things that you and the, that currency you get through playing the game too. Like but the I crystals. still think I still think that feels weird, right? It where, does. Where it, you're you're like you're you're right where you're you're super limited on what you can buy in this store and it's it changes daily. But I think that kind of entices you to spend money when you see them because you don't know when they're going to show up. And so if you're like, oh man, I really want that Scorpion Luckily, mortality. Luckily, in, in these situations, I've had enough crystals because the AI is doing a bunch of bullshit in the background and actually <laughs> earning crystals, which is a uh, dollar per hundred. So when I see a brutality, I just buy it immediately because I usually have enough by them. But that's because my AI is in the background grinding every single night when I go to bed. Which is an insane thing to say for a fighting game. Yes. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it, my AI is grinding my... I'm a, this this <laughs> cryptocurrency is... A, my, my 1080 Ti is at back... Like, dude, uh, this is the game. Yeah. So, all things considered, how much easier? I'm gonna and I would propose this. This is a, a little thing we came up with last night. I'm gonna propose this. You know, when you go to customize your character and you see all those skins and you see the fact that some of them are in the crypt, right? Some of them are also unlocked via Towers of Time. Towers of Time, I get it. It's a thing that's gonna come up every once in a while. You gotta pay attention, tell your friend, Noob Cybot Towers up, or you know, Aaron Black Towers up, it's got a skin. All right, I'm gonna go set my AI, or I'm gonna do it myself and get it. So it's like 50-50. Half of the rewards are in, they're in the crypt, half of the rewards are in the towers, and the towers, you gotta just go do it. How much better would it be if the mentality was that the chests in the crypt are relatively inexpensive, and you can get rewards that are pretty valuable, or you can go to that list of all the skins and they actually had coin numbers next to them, but they were more expensive. Mm -hmm. I want this coin. I want this skin. Right. It's 100,000 coins, which is expensive. That'd be so good. Boxes, boxes yeah. are like 15K boxes are can, can get you great skins and you could randomly come across it. But if you were just like, bink, I want that red costume right there. It cost me 200,000 coins. That's a lot of coins. I can open up like 10 boxes that are really good and get a chance at it, or I can just get it right now. Because that's the one I want. Because yes. that's the one I want. Yeah, you know what, that's the solution. How much, that's, that's really so nice. much better. And yeah. yeah, it's way more expensive, but you at least have a goal. You're at least striving towards that goal. This 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 fight gives me 10,000 coins. I'm gonna have to do this fight 20 times, but at least I know that I'm gonna get this thing at the end of it. Yeah. In the game currently, that doesn't exist. Uh, Kyle, I do wanna go, go back to you. I, I feel like, uh, this conversation got taken away, rightfully so, because all this stuff is super worth talking about. But you were you were expressing like some joy in the crypt, and I don't think huh. we fully touched on where that joy was coming from. So I just sure. wanted you to get a chance to talk about that. Yeah. So <laughs> the crypt is on Shang Tsung's island, uh, setting of Mortal Kombat One, right? And so there's just so many nods. There's so many areas that it's just fun to explore. Uh, considering that, like, you've only seen these in the backgrounds of cutscenes before. Uh, and, like, you see, you see areas. Uh, you see the pit. You can walk around in the pit. Like, that's mm -hmm. cool. You can walk on the top of it and everything. Yeah. yeah. And, and, like, so it's just, uh, it's a unique area. Uh, I get the incentive to, like, want to explore and find more chests. Like, I, I get the frame of mind behind it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And just, If like, it was self-contained, it would be so cool. Yeah. It's, like, it was the coolest idea they could have had for this idea, but then just, like, uh... Sorry, we were going to the negatives already. Um, <laughs> it's hard, man. Yes. It is yeah, hard because yeah. you start thinking of going through it and what you have to deal with. Yeah, it's just nice vibes. It's 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 got like a little bit of Metroidvania, right? Where you like get an item and the item allows you to access new yep. areas yep. and things like that. It's, and, it's cool. Yeah, and without ruining anything, they so a lot of those items you get, they, they present in very cool ways. Yes. yes. Um, and... Outside of like the chest and the rewards and the currency and all that stuff, Brad and I were here in the studio running through the crypt, and we just both had moments where we were like, "Oh, like did you see that thing happen in the environment? Or yeah. now we have to deal with this? Or how do we get there?" It's great. And so you're like, "Yeah, just just as a thing that you're exploring, mm -hmm. it's fun." And ah, oh, man, I, I I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but there's just like things gonna, I want to. I'm say. gonna make it better. So you guys have seen the Mortal Kombat One movie, right? Yes. yes. It's been a while, but yes. The uh, Goro's lair, when you see like his throne and his, his dead ass like on the throne, when you go right, there's like his dining room. The dining room is modeled exactly like the <laughs> dining room from the movie with like the, the meat and the big tables and like what all the ninja guys came out and Sub-Zero froze that dude. 
if you go to the main dining, the dining table, at the other end of it is a skeleton holding a turkey leg and it's Kano's eye. Because Kano in the movie was at the head of the table no eating a turkey way. leg. No way! It's it's awesome. Like there, it, it is Mortal Kombat Disneyland. Like, yeah. And there's things like that throughout the entire thing, like all over the place, references to the movie and stuff. It is so cool. Yeah. And but well, <laughs> right. Kidding, and that's kidding, the thing is that the, no, yeah. it's a big but because when I think about that stuff, conceptually, I'm like that. That's as cool as you could have made it. Mm -hmm. Like if you were to put this in a game and and th what you're referencing and how you're presenting it, and like we. I don't even think we said this. Maybe we did. This game is just gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It's just gorgeous. It's fun to look at. Like, <laughs> your characters look cooler than ever in so it's, many ways. It's like, for example, NetherRealm games have always had a weird, like, ism to them, like, visually. Like, mm -hmm. characters modeled are kind of odd, and the animations are a little, like, quirky in some situations. You can look past it for gameplay. Um, for me personally, like... The character models are just so sick. Like, Liu yeah. Kang has always been a big aggressor to this, where if you look at him in MKDC and MK9 and even a little bit in MKX, he's a character that's, like, naked from the chest or from, from the waist up, so he looks a little weird if you don't get the perfect modeling correct, and his animations could be a little off in MKX and stuff, so... You look at Liu Kang in this game, and he is the sickest looking, like, <laughs> most bad. Like, Liu Kang, I'm saying Liu Kang looks badass. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. He looks badass in this game when he's doing all of his stuff and he's yes. whipping around the nunchucks. I'm like, this game is awesome, man. Yeah. You see Sub Zero and and Scorpion talk to each other. They're older than they. They look like they're in their late fifties now, mm -hmm. and they look awesome. They like, do. Yeah. They are the sickest they've ever looked. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, Max and Kyle. Uh, so there's a running joke with this show because it's it's one of the longest shows that we do at Easy Allies, and uh, we've kind of built up this mythological like, oh, there's going to be a five hour frame trap at some point, <laughs> and I actually don't want to subject you to that um, for for a bunch of reasons and for other. It makes the whole thing like exporting and uploading become a bit more messy, and so we do. I feel like we could talk about Mortal Kombat forever. Uh, but we are going to move to the next part of the show, okay. uh, where we talk. Where it's caught in a frame trap, and what this is is we play a little game, and usually I have the panelists compete with each other. But I thought it'd be fun to I, I, I'm calling this the test your might challenge. All right. And so I'm going to test your your Mortal Kombat knowledge, and this might be way too easy. Uh, we'll have to see. Am okay. I allowed to answer if I know the answer? Well, what I'm going to do is I have Mortal Kombat one and Mortal Kombat two, and I want to see. How many can you remember the entire roster of both games? And oh, Mortal okay, Kombat cool. One okay. isn't as bad because it's only seven characters, but then you go to Mortal Kombat Two and there's quite a bit more. And so I just want to see right, how fine. many characters right. you can name. That's fine. Plus you have to remember Mortal Kombat Two, who returns and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. there's a little bit of trickiness there. Um you know what, Kyle might be fun, hmm. and we haven't done this before. Uh let's do it with Max. I'm gonna have you actually leave the room. And then we'll come back and I'll, I'll okay. have you test your mic. Okay, cool. I'm yeah. way down for that. I'm way, yeah. way okay. down for that. All right. Should I leave now? Yes, leave okay. now. I'm going to chop at this ice block. All right, Max, I'm sorry to delay this even further. No, but this is okay. We have, uh, we have wonderful sponsors who sponsor the show. So before we get to the game, I'm just going to read out the sponsors very quickly. Our first sponsor is Greg, the Dark Knight Kettering. Thank you, Greg. Next, we have Zoteg who uh, has some new copy for us. He says, do you play Final Fantasy XIV? Are you in the Crystal Data Center? Search at Zotig on Twitter for a link to the to an Easy Aid Crystal Discord server. Did you play Final Fantasy XIV? I did, a little bit, yeah. Okay, because I know you were big on eleven. Oh, so yeah. I didn't know if... I, I've, I've dabbled in XIV and got to like level 50-ish okay. and uh, played a little bit into uh, the expansions, yeah. not even at like Knights of the Round or anything. Um, but that game, like uh, once again, it's Final Fantasy Disneyland. Yeah, like, it's just the best of Final Fantasy All Stars, and that's yeah. this was so cool. Uh, is it just like a time thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. I just can't do it. Uh, but yeah, I think it's awesome that Zoteg is is looking for people to play with. Again, search him at Zoteg on Twitter if you want to hit him up. Uh, after that, we have JoJo's Dent Co. Thank you, JoJo's Dent Co. Next, we have Accounts Payable, and Accounts Payable does something fun. <laughs> We've gotten pretty goofy with this. We've shouted out education. But uh, they, they give us a free shout out. We can call attention to anything that we want to. Is there anything that you want to call attention to, Max? 
Anything? Anything. It could be a concept. Uh, a concept. Yeah. Like uh, I said, we've done education. <laughs> I I would have to give a shout out to uh, my community and yo video games in general. Nice. Kenny Stephen Simmons for reliably showing up every single weekend for the past f almost five years uh, for the stream. Uh, without all that stuff working together in an awesome community, I would not be here. Awesome. Next we have, oh yes, cool, great. Thank you, oh yes. After that, we have Gift of Heaven. This is somebody that's making their own RPG. Uh, Gift of Heaven is an RPG being developed by O.M. Hawkstelter. In Gift of Heaven's promotional short film, Symphonia Anathema, you will dream the seven sacred dreams which prepared the little boy named Otis to become a hero. You can watch the first sacred dream right now on Gift of Heaven's official YouTube channel. In this dream, we find the transcendent wizard apotheosis speaking from his radiant aspect directly to otis's soul with each statement the wizard makes otis's soul is granted one brief brief glimpse into the echelon of ultima which mortals call enlightenment but when Apoth apotheosis speaks from his shadow aspect a different kind of gift is received thank you uh gift of heaven i think it is so cool that you are going and, and making your own game and making your own promotional film for it that's awesome it's a bit different than rpg maker back in the day on playstation one I've never messed with RPG Maker. Was oh, that a is. thing for you in, our, in, in PS1? We have, I, I, I have dabbled in it, but also dabbled into Fighter, fighter Maker. Yeah. Oh, there's some fun, stupid Dude, stuff. Dude, do you have videos do. of this? I, I, they were so long ago that I don't, but we need to go back and do like a like a Fighter Maker, Fighter Maker 2. Yeah, that'd be fun to watch. For a broadcast. Our last regular sponsor is Blue. Thank you, Blue. And of course, last but certainly not least, we have our mega sponsor. River Horse Incorporated, come learn about how to kickstart your career in the high-tech world. Our friends over at River Horse can teach you the ways of the ServiceNow platform. ServiceNow was named the world's most innovative company of 2018 by Forbes. With over 4,000 customers across all industries, their Now platform has become the way to make work better. The Now platform introduces a wealth of job opportunities. If you're just coming out of school or are looking to advance your, in your career, there are many official ServiceNow courses that can help jumpstart your options. With River Horse, you will learn to master your ServiceNow capabilities through hands-on, real-world instruction. As an authorized training partner, our edu their education advisors are able to teach over 12 official classes. They offer both public and private classes to suit your needs. Join River Horse at Knowledge 19 in Vegas from May 5th to the 9th, the industry's biggest conference of the year. Learn more at riverhorse.com. River Horse will be teaching in the pre-conference training and hosting several events throughout the week. Reach out to them on Twitter or email to join them and get some free swag. River Horse is proud to support the Easy Allies and look forward to supporting all allies that work in the IT industry. You guys have more sponsors than I've ever had. Wait, you lucky guys. We are. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about how grateful um, your community is. I mean, these these are people that follow us and are giving us a lot of money each month to That's sponsor awesome. these shows. So, yeah, it's... It is it is awesome. So thank you to all these people. I do feel a little bit bad for Kyle that I've just stranded him out there in the middle of nowhere. Probably could have been structured a little He's bit better. He's in the better. same boat I am where I'm like contemplating what the first roster is and yes. what the second roster is. All right. So test your might. Who are the... Oh, so to clarify, I'm just talking playable characters. Okay. All not... Right. The, the stuff that's hinted at, not the secret stuff, none of that. Just okay. playable characters. So you can tell me how many characters are in Mortal Kombat 1, right? Yes, seven. Okay, so seven. Scorpion Sub-Zero, obviously. Yep. Sonya. Yep. Kano. Yep. We're at four. Oh my god, I just had every single one off the top of my head. Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Kano. Um, I can tell Raiden. you who's... Yes, Raiden is correct. That's five, right? That is five. Uh... Johnny Cage. Yes. Reptile's not in one. <gasps> there is one more. Um, you got this. I do, and the thing is I just played these games and I just thought about it and then I was thinking about how all these amazing sponsors. Anyway. Um, do, you, do, you want, uh, do you want me to tell you who you've said so far? Yes. Okay, so you've said Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Raiden, and Kano. I didn't say Sonya? You did say, did you did say Sonya. Say Sonya. John, you've said Johnny Cage. Oh, uh, no, Shang Tsung is a boss in MK1. Um, my God, man. I'm going to be so disappointed with myself if I can't remember this last character for no reason. 
You you know it. I do. It, it's just it's just I think the the whole like listing is yeah. It's, you off. it's the listing, and I'm going over like characters that are later. Oh my God, Scorpion, Sub Zero, Kano, Sonya, Raiden, Johnny Cage, uh, Sonya. Mm, I'm literally thinking of the song in my head. Mm-hmm. The 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 damn thing because I think I feel, I feel like I know MK2's roster better. Uh, There's so many zero. hints I want to give, but it would ruin the Raiden, whole thing. Johnny Cage. Oh my god. You know what? I'm actually gonna I'm gonna flip the coin and give me a hint. Just give me a tiny hint. Not not even something so small because my head is warped right now. Oh man, it's it's. Uh... Liu Kang. Yes! I can't yes! even. Thank we, were, you. we were just talking about it. Yes! I can't even, like, it's the listing of it that's messing me up. I was okay. thinking, like, what what could I say about Liu Kang that wouldn't be super obvious? Like, okay. If you said Bruce Lee, that, that you're yeah, done. Right, yeah, right, right. Like, what could I, I say? It. You I did it. it. You did okay. it. All right, so. Damn, I feel so embarrassed that to, that took that long. To catch everybody back up, the playable characters in Mortal Kombat 1, we've got Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade, Scorpion, Sub Zero, Liu Kang, Raiden, and Kano. Good job, Max. Okay. Are you are you ready I'm for ready Mortal for MK2. Kombat 2? I'm thinking right, of that one more. I think there's more. 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, there's 12 characters in okay. Mortal Kombat 2. Okay, let's begin. Uh, Scorpion, Sub-Zero. Yes. Reptile. Yes. Uh, Jax. Yes. Katana. Yes. Melina. Yes. Johnny Cage. Yes. Um, Shang Tsung. Yes. Shit, now it's getting weird. Um... Raiden. Yes. Kano's not in it. Sonya's not in it. Correct. Um, they're chained up in the background. Max, what did we just go through? Oh, Liu Kang. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just thinking of the first one. So you were you were on your lap? No, you have two more. You have two more. Yeah, I think we covered all the characters from Mortal Kombat One. You did. Yeah, these are two new ones that were introduced in two. Two new ones introduced. Melina. You said Melina. I just said Melina. All right, you want me to run through the Kung list? Kung Lao. Yes, good job, Max. Um, one more. We said Jax. He was new. Kung Lao. Who else got introduced in two? Jade was not in. MK2. She was a secret. Um, so uh, I mentioned the Ed Boon uh, character video where he talked about everybody. I can give you an obscure hint. I think I can get this without the hint. Okay. Um, and I think the character might even show up in MK11 in this story. <clears throat> I don't... <laughs> At least that's fresh in my head right now. Um, Liu Kang... And Kung Lao were together. Scorpion and Sub Zero were together. Jax was together. Uh, damn, who's that last damn character? Kenny's gonna be so disappointed with me. I believe in you. You did it with MK1. You can do it with MK2. I did it with MK1, and it it was on the tip of my tongue, and I couldn't think about it. New. We said Reptile. He was also new to MK2. As a playable character. Yeah. As a playable character. I already said Shang Tsung because he was playable. Oh my God! I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to use a lifeline on this one. Give okay. me a tiny hint. I will give you a tiny hint. So uh, when Ed Boon was talking about the creation of this character, for an important visual aspect of this character, they actually used, uh, I believe it was fake nails from this like costume shop to to communicate this aspect of the character. Oh, it's Baraka. It's Baraka. Yeah. Okay. There we go. They oh, used it like for his Shiba? teeth. I was like Shiba. No, it's Baraka. it was Baraka. Yeah. It's Baraka. Um, as soon as you said teeth, that was it. Yeah. Teeth or nails? I'm like Baraka. Yes. Done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So maybe the hint was a little bit too obvious. No, but we no, got no. That. I, 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 I'm so disappointed that no, I, I mean, remember it, it was Baraka. It's one of those things where you know it, but like going yeah. through a list, it's it's thinking hard. of thinking of like all twelve off the top of your head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you want to see how uh, how Kyle? Well, I does? See how Kyle yeah. Let's go get let's go get Kyle. I'm gonna go get him. Hello. Kyle! I don't think I've ever been alone in a frame trap before. I hope you're enjoying the episode, audience. I'm looking at this Nintendo oh. shelf right now. There's some Detective Pikachu statues. That's cool. Test your might, baby. Test hope that your movie might. is Test good. Uh, you know, Max can actually stay in here for this. He just can't tell you anything. He's getting a water. Okay, that's understandable. All right, so... Uh, How do you do? 
Max did very well. Okay. Um, he got through MK1. He was stuck on the last character, but he had no hints. Okay. He got through MK1. Great. He got to the very last character on MK2 with, with no hints and then needed a slight hint for the last character, which All I right. think is pretty great. Well, I have to admit something. I heard the word Baraka really loud. I'm sorry. So, uh, <laughs> we were excited. I, I think I get a gimme for MK2. <laughs> okay. That's um, so soundproof. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there are seven characters in Mortal Kombat 1. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Let me just say I love I love fighting games with lineage and story. Mm-hmm. Like this is good stuff. I love this kind of thing. Okay. So, uh, Raiden, yes. Liu Kang, Sonya Blade, uh, Kano. Hold on, sorry. So you said Raiden, yep. Liu Kang, Sonya yep. Blade, Kano. Yep. Okay. Scorpion Sub Zero. Yep. Uh, You're down to one. Uh, okay. Then who is this? This is where it gets tricky. Is it Reptile? Does Reptile count? Incorrect. Rep. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, stipulation. Yeah. Rep- Playable, playable characters. There okay. are seven playable, no playable characters. Okay, Reptile okay. is not a... Yeah. So I'm on the character select screen. Yes. Who am I forgetting? This happened to me too. Yeah. We're, 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 we're in Earthrealm. Who's another Earthrealm warrior in MK1? <laughs> it hurts, Kyle. I this know. I was there, man. is... Painful. Uh, oh, Johnny Gage. Yeah! Johnny Gage, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Oh, of course. man, the Kyle concentrating yeah. getting up out of your seat was yeah. very, very good. Well it helps. done. It helps. All uh, right, so my MK2. friend had it on Genesis, mm-hmm. and we just did nut punch over and over, and then we saw Reptile by accident, and we yeah. had no idea how that happened. Yes. It's still hard to do. Yeah, it was It was really cool. We couldn't do it for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. We're like, how do we do that? What Re- was replicating that, that is yeah. not easy. I feel like that would happen with me in special moves in fighting games where I would just accidentally do something and I had no idea and it would only come out occasionally with your friends. Fun times. All right. Uh, Mortal Kombat 2. Okay. Uh, just go a little bit slower so I can mark them down. Sure. So, Outrealm is here now. So we have Baraka. Yes, Baraka is one of them. We have Katana and Melina. Yes. Um, uh, let's go back to Earth Realm for a sec. Uh, because... Uh, uh, Ra- we got Raiden. Yep. I feel so nervous. Sub Zero and Scorpion. Yep. Is Reptile selectable yet? You tell me. Is he? Reptile. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson Briggs. Yes. Uh, no Sonya. No Kano. Ooh, uh, well done. We came to the same the same observation because they're chained up, right? Yeah. They're yeah. Chained up. <laughs> uh, uh, Liu Kang, Kung Lao, the Shaolin monks. Yep. Uh, so you're missing. You're missing one. I, oh, so there's eleven. Okay. Okay. No, okay. there's twelve. There's twelve. Okay. I can tell you who you've named so far. Do you All want right. that? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I said Raiden. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm missing more than, than that, aren't I? You are sorry. So you've got you've got uh, ten out of twelve. Okay. You're actually missing two. Two left. Two left. Okay. Um, think of MK2. Uh, oh, uh, Shang Tsung's playable. He's yes. playable in yes, MK2. Yes, he is. One more. Okay, 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 okay. And then uh, Motaro is not playable. Doesn't count, right? Correct. Does Shao Kahn not count? Correct. Okay, okay. Um, buying time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was just talking my way through it. Kyle, you were gonna you were gonna kick yourself for this one. <laughs> Johnny Cage again? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ben. That was a good hint, actually. Yes, <laughs> yes it was Johnny Cage. Twice. You know, you both did a pretty impressive job. Well done, Kyle. I, mean, I didn't know you knew Mortal Kombat 1 and Mortal Kombat 2 that cool. Yes. And it was like, oh my god, I know this. This hurts, man. I bet we could get through three. I didn't write down three. Okay. I thought... Oh, man. I mean, I could... Uh, yo, wait, are we talking MK3 or MK3. U- MK3. UMK3? Oh, no, we can't do that. No, well, because it's actually it's hard to know like who was added at what point, right? Because MK3 is weird. Yeah, because when new MK3 adds a bunch of characters that you would think would be in it, like for example, Scorpion's not in MK3. Right. <laughs> I would have right. said Scorpion, but he doesn't show up until later. We could, we right. could okay. do right. Mortal Kombat 11 and see if we can name everybody. Oh in my that. god! I mean, I, I have to look at. A, I don't. I don't have that prepared. Uh huh. But I could almost do it. I almost feel confident I could do it. Okay. Do you want me to pull up a list? No, 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 no. We got a let's, podcast to do. We got a podcast to do. Let's yeah. move that on. was fun. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah, yeah. Let's go Marvel versus Capcom 2. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I could not do... There's a lot of characters in that game. There's a lot of... When, it, it's not bad you start thinking about it, but when you start thinking about the scope and you're like, 
oh no, I'm only halfway done and I can't think of anything. Yeah. Well, That's where it's like, oh God. That would happen to me as a kid with the uh, original 151 Pokemon, where like I could do almost all of them, but there would be like two I'd forget. Like I'd forget fucking Seal or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's bound to happen. Yes. Can't you need to make up. it into a song. That helps a lot. All right. <laughs> Believe it or not, two hours and 30 minutes in this podcast, we have uh, some other games to talk about. And what we talk about, I think, is going to be dictated by your knowledge and interest in them. Max, if I remember correctly, you have played some Dragon's Dogma, right? Yes, I've, uh, I have I, I beat, like, the, the initial part of it. There's, sure. like, an expansion story thing that happens, like, after you technically beat I, the game. Yes, I'm in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. I never did Bitter Black did Isle. Um, but uh, it just came out on Switch. Did you like Dragon's Dogma? I did. I thought it was, I thought it was fun. Okay. Um, I don't remember absolutely loving it. I did think the combat was really cool. And yeah. I thought the monsters were like, it was that touch of Monster Hunter, you know? It felt like it was the same division where yeah. the monsters feel really realistic. Like, everything they do has a lot of, like, real-world impact. And you can climb on them. Yes, and you, you can, can climb, climb on them. them. That makes them of, feel tangible in yes. a way. Yeah. So it's got a lot of yeah. really good mechanics and stuff like that. But I just didn't, for some reason, it didn't completely connect with me. Like, I yeah. thought it was a good game, but not, like, incredible. So I'm playing it on Switch, mm -hmm. and, and out the gate, it runs uh, pretty well on Switch. Really? It looks pretty good. It's good. So that's nice. Um, I think just w the way that those Joy-Con triggers feel and the way the joysticks feel, I'm not really having a great time. I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but I'm yeah. not super enjoying it in handheld mode. So, But with a pro controller on a TV, I'm having a good time. Um, and it's a game that I have a lot of fondness for, uh, and I look back on my time with it like really highly. The um, wind! Is right. that in the Switch no, version? No, and it's not. Even, it's, of course, they, got, it they got rid of it. It's only in Vanilla Dragon's Dog. Yeah, is that song? Um, but it's exactly like what you were describing. Is the physicality of fights and enemies have a lot of health, and so they they pretty much demand that you find out the monster's weakness. Yeah, and they go out of their way to make monsters feel very unique. Like, oh, okay, fire is really effective here. I'm fighting these weird lizard things that like get up. I need to cut off their tails. Or I'm fighting this chimera and it's got these different parts of it. I need to like dismantle it systematically. <laughs> and, like, yeah, yeah when I piece when by I piece. when I destroy this part of it, it just can't do that thing anymore. Um, and man, it's awesome. It that like. I don't know. I feel like a, a lot of RPGs or action RPGs is all about numbers, right? Mm -hmm. It's all just about like, okay, I need to get my numbers up so I can do more damage. And that's totally here, but just like Monster Hunter, as you brought up, it's really fun feeling like you have to pay attention to what you're fighting, not just like the power that you're bringing forth. I, I hate to use this term, but it's got that Capcom-y bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's got that ca the capcom -y mechanical depth that all their games seem to kind of yes. have. Like, if you just look a little bit further, you're going to see all this hidden kind of stuff they build into their games. That's why I kind of love Capcom, just in general. Yeah, and uh, that capcom -y bullshit extends to the tone. Like, on one hand, it's kind of annoying that your pawns won't shut up, but <laughs> it kind of feels like Capcom-y bullshit yeah. in a way that's super yeah. endearing. Um, and the end of that game gets gets Master very works all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what will it be today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just repeating that over and over and over again. But um, yeah, I was talking about it during a stream, and somebody was like, "Hey, should I play Dragon's Dogma?" And I was like, "Or maybe I was just going off on a rant about Dragon's Dogma." Also, totally possible. And it's kind of a hard game to get into. Yeah, it's tough. Um, because. There's just a lot that you have to keep track of. Like even, and other games do this, but even health, like you'll get damaged. And even if you heal with a healing spell, you won't be able to heal like your maximum health. Like you'll be, you'll be cut off. So you'll have to use an item or you'll have to rest and you have to worry constantly about weight. And there are a bunch of weird items that you have to figure out what you need to do. And it's not always clear on how you progress, progress a quest forward. And you have to pay attention to it being nighttime because things are more dangerous. And so there's just there's just a lot going on. I don't think it's too much, and I think you can figure it out. But uh, even just, like, the pawn system takes some, like, poking at and understanding. I don't think it's always going to be, like, the most intuitive for people. But I think that's kind of why I love it so much is that it it takes this kind of familiar template, the action RPG, and like super does its own thing with it. And I love the way that they try to make pawns feel because you'll be on this quest and they'll be like, I have more information, talk to me because of my knowledge and experience. Um, I'll be able to tell you something, I'll be able to give you information. So they kind of try to make these pawns feel like 
real people in a super cool way, it's not always the most convincing. <laughs> it's weak to fire. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. It, uh, but it's like it's kind of a cool direction to go in, I think. I like the um, the way they handle the, like, the nighttime in that game. Yeah, like the, super. the darkness is really dark. Like, and you need to have torches, and you have to worry about light when you're out at nighttime because nighttime gets like enemies get harder. There's new monsters that show up. It was it was super intimidating when you were gonna take on a quest and what time of day it was. That's cool. So it's like it it, it has like Dark Souls ish kind of elements because it came out around that time frame when that stuff was happening. But the thing I was always curious about is that they never released Dragon's Dogma online anywhere but Japan. No. Mm-hmm. And I was really curious about that because the first moment I played it, I'm like. This game feels like it would do awesome with online. Like you could have four friends jumping on monsters back and some magic person casting all this. Like everyone playing their role. And they have that in Japan. It just never came out here. I would also say that the this story is not the most engaging thing. No, it's the, not. <laughs> the, the beginning is really cool. Um, when the dragon comes and rips out your heart. That's awesome. And the ending is a crazy twist that I don't want to spoil and is really exciting. But like kind of everything in between, like the way that they're presenting it is just... Things just happen. Things just happen. It's yeah. a little flat. It's not all that exciting. Um, but if the, the mechanical stuff sounds really cool to you, it's it's very, very fun. I recommend the PC version as well. Yeah. The like PC version runs much better than the console version did. Yeah, I didn't play a, a ton of the PC version, but what I did play, yeah, it was it was a very good version of that game. Kyle, have you ever played... Dra- Do you even... Okay. I dropped out early on Dragon's Dogma. I did play it. Why? Uh, wasn't into the scenario, kind of as you mm. were just saying. Like, RPGs got to be like, I doesn't, care about doesn't these really characters. doesn't really hook you very much. Yeah. yeah. And my sure. character was just me. Like, it was just, you know, it's just like, go do a thing. I'm, yeah, okay. You, you know? literally run out and start whacking at bunnies. Yeah. At the so start. I know, I know, as you just said, story is very important to you in RPGs. Yeah. Has there ever been a time where, like, the story is disappointing you or not doing it, but the mechanics are keeping you there? In an RPG? Yeah. I think no, dude. Never. I can't think of, like, an RPG where I'm like, the story sucks. Yeah. But I love this fighting system. I like, can't think of that, you know? Yeah. Fighting system in RPGs is just kind of like. I want it to be boring. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be engaged. I want to be able to listen to a podcast. I want to just be able to grind and level up. I don't want to just have, like, an action game when I'm wandering through a woods so for do, hours. Do you, you know? guys in general consider, like, the Dark Souls kind of games RPGs? I do not. They're, kind, they're very action games. Easy game. Allies does. Yeah, because, well, it's it, and they are categorized as role-playing games. Right. Because you have RPG elements on your character, yes. right? Yes. I consider them RPGs, but, like... I don't care that much. Yeah, yes. it, is, you know? it doesn't mean yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. in terms yeah. of what you mean. In, what you, what we, traditionally, RPG, you're thinking about like a JRPG. Yes, yes. I am. You're right. Not like a I, Skyrim 100%. or something yeah, like that. Yeah. When I say yeah. I want a boring fighting system, I'm talking about JRPGs. Yeah, like a Grandia or Man, something Kyle, like that. Kyle, yeah. that yeah. Like, I see where you're coming from, mm-hmm. and I, I enjoy just zoning out or putting on Twitch or YouTube or something and, and grinding it out in a JRPG. Uh, but... Man, some of the sometimes the battle systems are so good that they're just satisfying to figure out on their own, and that becomes like the biggest appeal to me um, a lot of times. So it's just it's just interesting hearing that perspective where you're just like, I don't care. Yeah. Well, I guess it's not even I don't care, but it's like it's not the driving motivator, right? Yeah. A bad story would not save a great RP JRPG fighting system. Because I feel like, and it's been forever, but I feel like when we talked about Brave the Default, I think you liked the battle system, mm-hmm. but it's not what got you in the door. Right. So it's something that you can appreciate and understand, but it's it's not the reason that you're there. Yeah. Cool. So Max, you talked about Dragon's Dogma and how, how you liked the fighting, but maybe beyond the, the story and the presentation, um, you said you didn't like love it. Uh, were there reasons kind of beyond those things that were mentioned that didn't click with you? It was a while because I played it when it when it did come out. But I think the big the big motivator at one point was just to kill the next bigger monster, get better gear, sure. and that was that was pretty much the driving factor. And I I think a bit of the exploration in the game, like there's there's some areas that are cool, and there's some areas that I remember being really annoying. Mm. Like this is just not. Not, not not on the levels of like blight town pain in the neck but just like this is just isn't super fun like it's mm. kind of dry the monsters are what really hold that that game together not the environments as much i remember um so not not exactly the same games but you really like monster hunter world I do. and that is definitely like 
continue killing the biggest monster. So what do you what do you think that Monster Hunter World is doing more for you? I I personally you find in in Monster Hunter World the the levels to be amazing. Like the first if you go back to think about your first discovery of of like the levels and the Elder's Recess much less um what is the Valhazak stage? It's got a great name. Oh my not airy. Uh, oh, the, the no, no, undead, no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the undead dragons, like, pit. And just going through that stuff and discovering all these, like, weird carcasses of monsters. It's yes. just so cool. And then there's yes. a shortcut and you fall through the level. I thought all that stuff was badass, man. And, and it felt like the, the levels themselves, once you actually get better at the levels, you start discovering new ways of attacking the monsters because there's, like, jumping points and grappling points that you can use easier. Max, I think and, I like, can remember. Can knock off the ceiling. Yes, exactly. I think I can remember every other area. Except Dude, for that one. I was just thinking about it. The name of it. it, anyway. The name of it, yeah. It's the Johnny Cage of areas. It yes. is the Johnny Cage of areas. I can't, I literally can't think of it, but forests, it's, it's where Valhazak is. You have Wildspired Waste. Wildspired Waste. You have the Elder's Recess. Yes, you have the, the is it Coral Highlands? It's That's Coral another something. one. Yes. Coral Highlands is another yeah. one. Yeah. And then what's the name of that last one? I don't know. Like, I can visualize it perfectly. Yeah. And I know what you fight there, but I can't think it of the has name. A, I literally ran into this on stream before, and it has a it has a great name. It it has a great name, and I am, I am looking look it, it up. up. Look I, it up. I'm, we gotta I'm, look I'm it not going to subject us to a Johnny notes. Cage situation yeah. again. Uh, <laughs> that pisses me off that I can't think of it. Val Hazak. Yes, that's the name. Of, that yeah. fight drives me insane. Look, I think I think if Monster Hunter World had long stretches of going across a field to the next town, mm. like people would not like it nearly as much. The Rotten Vale. The Rotten, Rotten Vale. Vale. What a yeah, great yeah. name. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, yes, Rotten Vale is really cool. <laughs> Max, it's one of those things where I've I've said like Rotten Vale either just like mentally or audibly yeah. dozens of times. Yeah. And yeah. But yeah, dra okay. Ultimately, to wrap up this Dragon's Dogma conversation, yeah, um, it is a rough around the edges game, undoubtedly. But it is a game bursting with ideas, and if you're curious about it, you're like looking on that because I feel like the Switch has been this great place of catching up on things that you missed or discovering brand new things. And you, like you said, do this on any platform. I don't care. It doesn't have to be Switch. But if you are curious, I do think that curiosity will be worth it. I think it's worth plowing through the rough edges of Dragon's Dogma to see its greatness. This is a weird question, and I can't remember if it was in the old Xbox 360 version. Can you pause the game? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember if it was one of those no, where it's yeah. an unpausable. So you have your, your map that you can bring up, and then you can also pause it, and like the screen goes gray, and yeah. you have a bunch of different options, okay. like uh, status and equipment. For the sake stuff. of like on the go. And map, you actually can get map from there too. What's up? If for the sake of like, yeah, on the go, like gaming and stuff, it's, yeah. if when you're they're like, we're putting Dark Souls on the Switch, I'm like, that's cool, but what do you, right. <laughs> do you have to, like, what if you have to get off the plane, or, you know, like that seems, that seems hella inconvenient, right? Right. I don't right. know how they handle it in Dark Souls. Now that I think about it, because the game has no pause button, maybe yeah. you just quit out and pray to God. Like I'm, I'm good. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, Max, a game that we've talked about and honestly hyped up quite a lot uh, is is Bloodborne Sekiro. Two. No, I'm just <laughs> is Sekiro? You've been playing and and. Uh, trying to conquer. Have you? Did you finish Sekiro? I did finish it. Okay, yeah. nice. What did, What did you think overall? So. Uh, uh, the first six to ten hours of that game, it's like this is the best combat I have ever run into in any FromSoft game. Um, and I absolutely was just loving the hell out of it. A lot of the environments are a little um, a little samey. You know, it runs into that sort of Neo 2 kind of kind of issue where you, you get some cool areas. And then as, as you progress the game a little bit more, like in, in retrospect, my playthrough was really slow. So I was like looking and reading and... Take a yeah. killing. I like my first playthrough of any of a Miyazaki's games. I like to kill every enemy at least once mm -hmm. in general. So um, when it started opening up and you were going to like you know the mountains where all the monks are, n no spoilers beyond that. But I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as I started playing the game a bit a bit more, uh, you can you start to the game sort of breaks down mechanically for me, mm. where a lot of the regular enemies is just an R one fest. Mm. You just woof on the R one button and they die like. You, you start realizing that your own guard gauge doesn't mean a lot if it gets crushed because you can roll out of being crushed. But an enemy's guard gauge, you kill them. Like, they die. In some situations, they might get an attack in and you will die. But losing your guard gauge didn't seem as valuable, you know, as the enemy losing theirs. So being relentlessly aggressive 
ends up being the, the whole game plan. Like actually dodging is not that good. So once you once you kind of realize that, I was kind of at a dead end with some bosses, and then I, I watched some other people that were like admittedly way better, like speedrunning the game, and all mm -hmm. they would do is just whack, 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 parry, 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 whack, 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 parry, parry, and then they would just whittle that bar down. So once you once you sort of get into that habit, every enemy dies the same way. And I, but yeah, except the guardian ape and yes. um, the one the one spoilery hidden boss that mm -hmm. is in the game. Sure, and I love those bosses. And guess what those bosses remind me of? Bloodborne. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to like treat them, and they, they have elements where you have to parry things every once in a while. Yeah. They have moments where you have to get out of dodge and, and address things, while the majority of other bosses in the game is just whack, 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 parry, 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 whack, 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 parry, 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 stab, do it again, firecracker, you know, things like that. Is Guardian Ape the one who No, uh, God, don't say that! Oh. <sighs> don't spoil it! No. No, oh. no, no. Okay, not that guy. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's been out for a I month. <laughs> you don't have to. It's fine. <laughs> we got to talk about why it's great. It is, and it is <laughs> admittedly a great. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I hear you, man. Like, this, this show for me is a constant, like... <laughs> I want to describe a thing, but yeah. I also don't want to ruin it. I'll take and the I, heat for that one. I'll take the heat no, for that one. I mean, I made it a bigger deal by pointing it out. But Let it me just hear it, a, Sekiro fans. <laughs> Let me hear it. Uh, you could just uh, literally go and bleep it out, but that, that takes a lot of extra effort. <laughs> <laughs> I see Ben's face right now as an editor. He's just like, man, okay. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Guardian Ape and and Mystery Boss yes. definitely. Yes, yes, are. yes. They they, enca they encapsulate like the things I like the most, like all the mechanics sort of like marrying each other, mm -hmm. instead of just uh, at the end of the game, and especially for like the last boss, it's it's very similar situation. It's just knowing the timing of all this stuff, pressing L one, like it's a beat mania game when it happens for the most mm -hmm. part, and then the symbol pops up, and it's either jump. Or it's or it's dodge to get you know the the Makiri counter and yeah. the, the Makiri thing is one of the most satisfying. I almost yes. wish it was more than just I'm just gonna step on this thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's a little it's a little dissatisfying animation wise, but it does do good guard crush. Um, I loved it. I thought it was I thought it was great. I thought the settings and the world is awesome. Like discovering things in the world. It's got that. Oh, that's that, that beautiful, like, I, you have to play these games in the first week when nobody knows what the hell is going on. Yes. So you're just exploring and looking for things and no one has spoilers and everyone's just figuring out, do I feed the fish? <laughs> what do I feed the fish? And can I fight this thing? Like, yes. all these questions that they build into their games make the world just so enjoyable. Yes. Um, and, uh, but did I like it more than Dark Souls, like, 3? I didn't. I like Dark Souls 3 more. I like Bloodborne, obviously. It's, like, one of my favorite games, which so it's a little unfair. But I still thought it was really damn good. Uh, you, you describing it to, like, Beat Mania, I think, is really interesting. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, I don't, I don't necessarily think that you're wrong. It, it is about finding a rhythm, and, like, the, the actual result is, like, yeah, you need to parry everything and R1 everything. Like, that's, that's true, but... I don't know how much you like rhythm games, but even though I was like technically doing the same thing for a lot of stuff, the different attack animations and the timing and and, and getting that it right, it still feels good. It still feels good. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Sure. I don't think it's mechanically bad or anything. I just I just got more of a bit of, uh, and I think what it boils down to is variety. I I can't. I, I can definitely attest they tried to stick variety into the game for the combat yeah. with the different type of arm attachments with the different type of ninjutsus, but ultimately. What it really boiled down to, there's a patch coming out for this game, by the way, like a, a big patch that mm -hmm. is adjusting a lot of things. I didn't hear about this. Single player game patch, yeah. Um, a lot of that stuff is relatively useless because they tie it to a spirit emblems. Mm -hmm. They tie it to a currency that it takes this to use, you know, the firecracker. It takes this to use the upgraded ninjutsu stuff. So even though I spent a lot of my time and money upgrading that stuff, um, not a lot of them seemed very useful. Mm -hmm. There was a couple that are obviously like, Boom, boom, every single enemy, like yeah. Ichujin, you know, I think is what it's called. And Firecracker also being a stun state for almost everything in the game is great. Yeah. The majority of skills just didn't feel like it was worth spending the spirit emblems on. So skills, yeah. Wait, wait, man, it's I don't think it's out yet, but we had a spoiler mode on and spoiler mode is where we can talk about uh things like the Guardian Ape. Mm -hmm. Um and we went into different aspects of the game, and that was something that I actually criticized where I thought the combat arts were 
really all over the place for me where I found some that was like, this is amazing. And others where I'm like, I'm just not going to use this. And that so, was a weird feeling. Yeah. Um, the Shinobi tools, it, it's been a common complaint. I actually kind of liked how super situational they were in some, in some cases. Some of them are neat, yeah. Because it kind of led to moments <clears throat> where it, it felt like solving a puzzle. Like, oh, I have this. But I, I, I understand on some level, like you wanting to use something more often. I want to do a little bit different than just like having to quite literally whack, whack, parry, parry. And right. you can almost treat every single fight, every regular enemy sort of the same way. Yeah. And at at least in some of the other games, like Dark Souls 3 has a lot of like weapon variety. It's got a lot of different things and weapon arts that are attached right. to that stuff. And the same thing with Bloodborne with transforming weapons and the fact that you have this parry system and, you know, different guns and blunderbusses. And it... Ultimately, I was kind of hoping that, yeah, like they, the, the weapon arts needed to be more effective mm. or just have different ways that you would use them and attack, attack different enemies. Because it feels like they built the whole game around this really cool like counter and parry and yeah. balance and ballet of the sword fighting clashing, which is awesome. 25 hours in, though, I was like, man, I've been doing the same thing to all these bosses. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, I, I think just in my brain, because when I, when I think about a traditional souls board game when you approach a situation it's like okay i i can like especially in dark souls it's like i can just use magic if i want to mm -hmm. or i can you know potentially use these consumables or i can or use shield all or these, whatever I, yeah, yeah. I can use a ranged weapon or all you know i could use it two-handed or one-handed like you options is a big part of it whereas to me, Sekiro was like, n there's no way around it. Like, you got to R1 and parry. And I don't think and these other things will just modify it a little bit sometimes. And like I said, I don't think it's like a fault of the game. I don't think it's a negative. I, yeah, but it, I, I hear what you're saying where like after 25 hours, you just kind of got... And they and they do it. That's kind of attested because it's 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 rough to compare this game to Souls games because it shares a lot of similar aspects. Mm -hmm. Like it's just impossible to ignore that oh, the absolutely. world and, and a lot of the mechanics are, are very not? similar. Yeah. But it is, a it is ultimately a really good Tenchu game. Mm -hmm. is is really because they even admitted that's what it started off as it was a tenchu game they added too much stuff to it and in natural japanese fashion oh we put too many new things let's make it our own new thing so they did that they called it sekiro and they took out like rikimaru and all the other characters that were from tenchu so yeah it is uh, by far the best ninja stealth assassin game there is by a long shot but for as much as your character is like a shinobi and about shinobi arts, you don't get a lot of shinobi arts. No, it, it really feels like it's like a game about the a man and his blade, yeah. which is mostly a samurai game. Which is like it's a little like it's kind of not as focused as I would think it would be. And they do there was a big thing from Miyazaki about the storytelling, how they want to like really emphasize the storytelling and really get you to be empathetic of Wolf and his plight and everything like that. Didn't exactly really get that like the story's okay yeah. and it it goes along i'm curious what what you think about like the story of the game and the characters so i i like a lot of aspects of the story some of which i can't get into i would agree so w wolf just on his own i'm not that empathetic toward he's a man of few words yeah. as we described him in the the spoiler mode However, I do like his relationship with Kuro a yeah. lot. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like this this masterful storytelling. Like everybody looked to this, it's changing video games. But I think relative to from software games and can, and consistent relationships, yeah, it's it's more constant in a way that I felt was effective. It's much different. Yeah. Where where you and him start and where you go and how you interact, I do think is pretty cool. Not amazing, but a, a neat little thing that I appreciated. And in it's the game. a lot different than the usual very passive storytelling. Like, right. Yeah, you're you're in a, you're playing a FromSoft game where you're just talking to characters a lot, and you can see that they're not great at it because the moments where you're talking to a character, you're like your camera's locked into the position, and you just are listening to them di dialogue in this camera shot, which is a gameplay shot, and you're just like, I've been here for five minutes, and I'm just spinning the camera around looking at different things, and it's like. They're obviously like trying to do something different, but it's still it's still sort of stuck in the old in the old ways of the previous games. There are, there are definitely moments where it's like they're def they're used to doing things this way yeah. for sure. But ultimately, it was like enough. I I adore this game. I and I appreciated all the ways in which they tried to make it different, and I would be super on board for more of this. I would. Ultimately. I I, I kind of want them to do. I I don't think I would be down for a Sekiro like two even mm. even though they're they they have so many different projects they could possibly do i 
I would like to see them go in like crazier directions. Like there was even a, a small conversation of how much of a fan Miyazaki is of Escaflone. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> like a, a guy running around in, in like a biomech, like crazy, like, and that's like, setting of Escaflone is super Dark Soulsy, like m- medieval, like Western that he loves. And I'm yeah. like, man, that would be incredibly cool because a lot of a lot of these games are great because of like their setting and right. and the world and to me then the main character of all of all of Miyazaki's games isn't the main character or your created character it's the world right so whatever he wants to make like everything has been really good so far like even even people have gripes with Dark Souls 3 I loved it yep. I thought every place you went in that game was awesome yeah Dark, Dark Souls 2 is my least favorite and I love it yeah and it's still right. it's like Dark Souls 2 I think is the uh, the least best of all of the FromSoft recent games, and it's still like an eight and a half out of right, ten. Right, right, exactly. Uh, Kyle, yeah, I, I don't know if you've been following this at all, Max. Uh, talk to me about Dreams, man. Dreams, Dreams is the uh, <laughs> it's the the software that allows you to make games. You know, it's it is a uh, media molecule, made a little big planet. Uh, now it's just uh, you can make everything. Uh, ben. I thought I'd have a better time with Dreams. It's an early access right now, thirty bucks, right? Early access. We're not the game's not done yet, and to me, it like it's not ready for me. Wait, I'm so not ready for Dreams. So it's like a single player, like make your thing, but it's an early access like beta. So early access is just the tools. Uh, apparently, there will be like a campaign when the game finally Ooh, comes okay, out. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but also, I think they're just kind of like let's let these problems exist now, and we'll fix them by the time we're putting it huh. in a box, you know. Um, it's it's surprising to me uh, how little they teach you in the tutorials, uh, which are really long winded. They take a long time. Most of the time I spent playing this game was watching tutorials, um, which is frustrating because they like they give you an attribute. They're like, you like this, you like to create, or you like to make music. And every time I was like, I'm in tutorials for hours, and it's like, you like to play, and I'm like, I'm I barely played. <laughs> it's like we know you, you love to play. It's like I'm just I'm creating. Um, it's just like imprecise. Uh, it is to me like like trying to make a sandcastle out of yogurt. It's, it's just what it feels like, you know? It's like I want to build this thing. I have a clear idea of what I'm trying to construct. And then it just comes out so sloppy. And then it's like, oh, well, you didn't snap the grid. You snapped the grids. It's like the grid's not snapping to itself. It's like you have to set the grid to snap to this thing at this time. And it's just like. So you're saying it's like using Photoshop. <laughs> you, I could use Photoshop. I get it. <laughs> well, let's, let's use a, like a program that someone would be unfamiliar. It's like using ZBrush. Like yeah. you, if you just have to figure it out and eventually know how to twist and tweak everything to get exactly what you're looking at. But it, everything's motion controls. Oh. Everything is. Uh, and so it, it's it's so weird that like even if you're using your controller, your PS4 controller, it's still motion controls to oh, position things. I think no. you can like, you can lightly think, uh, hold things down to make them more precise. And also, uh, I this is way rude because there's some really good stuff out there. Mm-hmm. I expected better levels at this point. I expected people through the beta to like make better stuff, and you see the best of the best, and you're like, yeah, this is really good. But do you think they're running into the same issues you are, or just just like the usability of it is just super? I think that's rough? it. So you you know now the people who made like pretty cute little levels that are like really good, you know the effort they put in. Yeah. And it was not a weekend. You know, it was a week or more. It was just right. that you know how hard the people who are good at this had to work, and it's like I'm not willing to put in that time. Well, so, mm. I I think it's probably partly that, but. I think about Mario Maker, which mm-hmm. which I I much like Huber, level editors intimidate the hell out of me. Yes. That's just a it's just an intimidating thing. And anytime I peek in, I get scared. I did not feel that way with Mario Maker. I don't know if everybody feels this way, but with Mario Maker, I'm like, boop boop doop doing this, and it just like it clicked. And I didn't I didn't even do very much of it at all, but it was just it was just welcoming. Precise. Yeah. You're making you're making a castle out of Lego. Well, with it, Mario Maker, man, it's just, everything snaps in. It's yeah, perfect. Yeah, I yes. think I think precise is a great word for it, Kyle. And it was also just like, you know, with programs, you're talking about different things. You on some level, you want to be like, I want to do this thing. This seems like how I should be able to do it. Mm-hmm. That's what I felt like with Mario Maker. And even with all of that said. Most of the Mario level, level, Maker levels I played were terrible. <laughs> like, I don't necessarily think yeah. that not all the works ease of, of use translates into high quality. It was a lot of, like, watch it play itself. Oh, or, very true. Here's a lot of 
fire. Like you, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 hard. Not that I'm good at making levels. I'm not. But, but it's like hard to make a bad level of dreams. It's that level is hard. You're already working oh, really sure. hard to make a bad level. Sure. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. realize like why all those people have like the boring puppets with the 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 ice cream cone heads is because like that's it. If once <laughs> you start trying to modify that thing. Basically, yeah. they, they give you a puppet, and they're like, this is your character. Add stuff to it. Change its proportions. But don't change too much. And, like, the reason you don't change... If you make its feet too big, it just stops walking. It happened to me. I'm like, I, I, I can't undo far enough. And so, like... Uh, uh, <laughs> there needs to be, like, limiters on things. Like It's almost like there's, like, a little bit too much freedom in in the customization that yeah. where the game fundamentally breaks down. Right. It's it's and I, I think what they're thinking is that I'm we're all supposed to share with each other. So if I'm frustrated with this puppet, I can just go download a puppet from someone else. Right. And I think that's the early access issues. I think that's why I'm saying I'm not ready for dreams yet. I think someday in the future I'm gonna be like, give me the good puppet. And so I'll have this good puppet that like I can make its feet as big as I want. And right. again like its jump looks good. And you know it can punch. All those things are already in it. It's almost you know? like you would want like a bunch of things to work with that have already been made. Yeah. And then you can throw them in and sort of sandbox them together and figure stuff out. Yes. But right now they want you to make all that stuff that is the core. Mm hmm. So, uh, how where do you start? Yes. <laughs> and well, I just want like a grid, man. I want the grid to be so precise. I just want to like. Here's my bridge. It's blah 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 blah, and like there's not going to be anything sticking out of it. It's not going to be crooked in any direction. That's what I want more than anything. My understanding of dreams and what I remember seeing from like trade shows yeah. is we're going to let you make anything, and it's going to be easy. Because they've been showing this for a long time. Yes, and I wonder if at some point they were like, we either have to have it just be easy. Or you have to have it be you can make anything. Like, yeah. we can't do both at the same time right now. And I think, like, so let's say I did want to just drop people's stuff into stuff. Like, I think I could make a level, but I did want to create everything. Mm. Like, I don't want someone else's mountain. I don't want someone else's car. Can you, so wait, this is so can you take those mountains? Yeah, if somebody uploads their mountain, they're like, hey, here's a mountain, everybody. Hmm. Come get it. But do you think that could help you learn, though? Like, I understand the drive to just, like, want to make stuff, but do you think... Maybe taking that stuff and placing it and just toying around with it will help you when you go to make that stuff. Sure, yeah, and I, like the, that's not the idea of dreams. I'm sure any developer would be frustrated with me, and that's why they label you. So like, some people will simply make mountains. They're like, I don't have any ideas for levels. I don't have any ideas for a story to I'm tell. I'm a mountain guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm strictly mountain a mountain guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm well known for my mountains. Uh, blue mountains, purple mountains, I got them all. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the idea. That's the dream, right? Is I'll pick somebody else from music. Like, oh, I love your tracks. I'm going to take your track. Right. Oh, I love your double jump. That's amazing. Great physics, dude. I'm going to borrow that. Like, that's the idea, right? It's like not what I'm interested in, I guess. So wait, what are you interested in? Crafting. I'll, I want to build my sandcastle. I don't want some other kid's hands in my sandcastle. That's my sandcastle. <laughs> So what's the, mm. like, so from a completely, like, yeah. outside perspective of what Dreams is and just seeing it show up at, like, E3 press conferences right. and not really having much idea of what the heck it is other than just building stuff, how close is this to Little Big Planet? So far. So Little Big Planet is pretty much what you're kind of thinking about, where right. it's like you have a lot of tools to work with and yeah. you sort of throw them all in and see what happens. Yes. This one is like, we need you to make all the tools. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, Little Big Planet has a ton of mechanics. Like by the time you're in three, there is some stuff that's like beyond me, but like, it'll be like, here's a tool. And I'm like, I have so many ideas for this. I can't wait to, wait to make a car out of these engines. It's gonna yeah. work. The character drops in, he holds onto this, the car moves. That just feels so good mechanically. Uh, this is just, it's way more complicated than that. Okay. I have no idea how to make a wheel on an axle right now in Dreams. I don't think I could do it. Yeah, you have to actually build the engine. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and then find gas. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle that, sounds, that sounds super frustrating, man. Yeah. And, like, I get you. Like, you just want to create. You just want... You just want those ideas to flow, and it's just not happening. And I, I, like my impression of this game was like pre-release, and then us playing the levels, and like some of them being amazing. Like I, I'm thinking of that platforming level where it was like, this is a cool game. Yes. This is fun to play. So this guy made this platformer where it had like 3D Mario mechanics where when you would jump, 
uh, the platforms would change like red and blue, just mm -hmm. like Mario does. And he even had like a little shop. So you would like progress through this level and you'd collect coins and they'd be hidden all over the place. And he'd have tables where you could buy different things. Like we put a monocle on our character and it's like, it is incredible that somebody did this. Yeah. And you just feeling like you can't get there. Like that, that sucks because after that stream, I felt like anything is possible. And then I saw a Slack message from you being like, this is too much. Because even, yeah. in, even in Mario Maker, you get like an amazing stage that like, everyone loves and everyone plays. And it isn't just like, you know, some crazy death Mario stage, but it's just a really enjoyable one. You see where they what they did. You see all the pieces that went together to make it. And you're like, yeah. I could do this. It would just take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, you could do that. And, but, but also take a level of understanding and, right. and expertise of what makes levels good. So, Kyle, I know you don't yeah. want other people's fingers on your sandcastle. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. How do you feel about like YouTube tutorials or, or like people outside of the game trying to break this stuff down and make it more manageable? Is that yeah, something you want? I think it's totally possible. Here's how to make a car. Here's a yeah, video about right, how to right, make a car right. in Dreams. Yeah. Yes. I just like from, from the tutorials I've been through, it's so hard. Mm. And my cars keep turning out like crooked. I do got you, like a crooked car that only drives left. So is, is it more of the problem where it's like, even when you know how to do it, it it's not working right? Yeah, so it's it's kind of like, you know, where you take like a painting class and uh, somebody brings their painting, but it was like, oh, we had like a wine and painting class. Here's, <laughs> here's what I made. And it's like, okay. <laughs> All right, but you know, you know that like the teacher was showing them something like really elaborate and really right, nice. Right, you know? right, Like, like you see the original painting and it's this yes. like beautifully proportioned face. Yeah. And then you see like the person taking the class. <laughs> it's like stretched out. <laughs> and that's me. Yeah. So that's the every, at the end of every tutorial. It's just like, don't you like what you did? And I just have like one of those nasty looking paintings. <laughs> It's just always like, it's, like it's beautiful, and yeah. the reason it's beautiful is because you made it. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, <laughs> no, uh, no I'm ugly. I, I did a bad job, <laughs> and so that's what I—that's my frustration with dreams currently. Yeah, Kyle, it's fascinating. Yeah, because a lot of times I feel like when we talk about games on Frame Trap, I think the Mortal Kombat discussion is a good example of this, where it's like, all right, we're gonna try to break this down and be like, here are all the reasons why it's not good and why it's not making it, why it's making us feel this way. I actually feel like your dreams impression is is a mixture of the game being dense and like your own personal frustration. It is there a lot too, yeah. Like this, you, the, the way that you want to create is influencing how you are viewing this game and I find that fascinating. Right. Like a lot of it feels like it's coming from you and that's not wrong, it's just interesting. Right, yeah, that is, that is totally the case. Because I feel like you could flip that around and like you're talking to that person who took the, the, the wine and painting class. Yeah. And they're like, I know it's crooked, but I learned something. Like, that's a perspective you can take. Yes. That's not where you're coming from. Right. Yeah. I just yeah. need to paint this about 100 times more. Right. Mm -hmm. And it right. might get right. really right. good, but are you willing? <laughs> I'm not willing to do that. <laughs> right. I'm really not. Yeah. I, I feel like if I'm going to dedicate myself to a creative process, there, there are other pl ways to do that. Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about Mario Maker 2? That's a loaded question. I'm really excited about it. Okay. okay. I will make at least one level there. I tried making a smash level, by the way. It's really hard. I, Kyle, I don't know if this yeah. video exists. Didn't you? Didn't you make that Mario Maker level that t like told that story with that villain at the end? Remember yeah, about, we like, streamed it. We streamed it, but we didn't like make a video about it. Yeah, I wonder if that stream exists somewhere. This is not a fa fair thing to do to the audience, mm -hmm. but that I really liked your level. That's what I'm trying to say. I liked what, that you were trying to tell a story, and that you you made a Goomba villain. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. There was actually like a running, he was a running villain over, across many levels. That's awesome! Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's awesome! Okay. Are we ready to move on for Dreams? Is there anything Absolutely. else you want to say about Dreams? No, I'm sorry, Dreams. I'm sorry, Dreams developers. I know you worked really hard. I know that, like th this is an insanely hard game to make. I'm just not yeah. ready for it yet. That's fair. I, is it something that you're going to keep tabs on? Uh, final release, yes, but not monthly. Okay. I, I won't be like trekking the dreamscape to see anything new, you know? The dreams reddit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I won't be on there. Um, I can't talk about this very long uh, because I played it on the last day of the closed beta and I only played it for an hour and a half, but I do want to touch on very quickly uh, Warhammer Chaos Bane. I keep wanting to say Crossbane. This is the Diablo one, right? Yes. Okay. So Max, I was going to open this up by saying like, how do you feel about Diablo and or Diablo-like games? Like, what's your history with that? My history with Diablo uh, is on the PlayStation 1 mm -hmm. with a friend playing two-player because Diablo didn't have multiplayer on the first one, I think, on PC. 
and they added two player on the console version. That's there was cool. a there was a uh, I I wrote about this, and so I'm sure I think there was a Battle Net version of Diablo One. Gotcha. But that was like I later. could be I could be wrong on that. But like I, someone someone will correct me. But I think that was one of the big reasons why I wanted to play Diablo One so much with a friend. And we we went back recently and tried and fired up the PlayStation version of Diablo One. Dude, that's awesome. Woof, man. We <laughs> we could barely get past like the first zone. It was it looked like it was on a Game Boy Advance. It mm-hmm. was intense. Uh, but I, I I played a bit of Diablo Two. I got through like the main campaign, but mm-hmm. Diablo Three not so much. Okay, never just, really actually played it. Okay. Just didn't play it. Not, not that it wasn't not doing it for you. It just, I, I, I think it came out at a time where like there's a bunch of fighting games coming out, and I, I did, I was kind of under the boat where the the visual aesthetic of the game just didn't appeal to me sure. very much. But sure, I did, sure, sure. I did try. What the heck's the other one called? By the actual Diablo two devs, the one that's free to play. Oh, no, Path of Exile. Yeah, I did try Path of Exile a little bit. And I'm yeah. like. I very much like the aesthetic look of this game. Yes. And I see people play it at a high level, and it's just like nukes it is coming up. crazy, <laughs> Like man. 80 billion enemies. I'm like, yeah. this is Diablo to me, to be honest. Like a, a billion things flying at you, and they're all dying. Like you killed 60,000 things in three seconds. Like I think that's actually really cool. Yeah. But um, for the most part, that's about my entire experience with it. Sure. Yeah, man, Path of, Path of Exile is a frustrating game for me because it's something that I've – It's it's been fascinating to watch it evolve so much. Um, and they they keep doing like these massive changes to it, and it's something that I've dabbled in multiple times, and like every time I do, I enjoy it. But I, I haven't had that like super deep dive, yeah. like I'm going all the way there with it yet. And someday I'd like to do it. And it's available on uh, Xbox and PS4, and, and I would like I would play now. it on PC. And but, it's yeah. free, like it, yeah, that that game it's is super generous with it's how it's really is free. generous, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, Warhammer Chaos Bane is that like straight up. Uh, and it reminds me, maybe it's just because I've played so much of Diablo 3, but it reminds me very much of Diablo 3 in the sense that I made this uh, Wood Elf Ranger and you can roll around. Um, and that reminds me of like the console versions of Diablo 3 where you're rolling around. Um, and aesthetically, I actually think it's it's pretty cool. There have been moments where uh, I've been like, oh, wow, that looks really nice. Like you go in to like this cathedral and you see a giant like stained glass window in the background. It's like, oh, that looks nice. That does not always translate to the animations. And sometimes I wish moves felt a lot more powerful than they did. And so I'm playing this Wood Elf Ranger and you have this this basic ability where it's like you shoot a stream of arrows. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain way that you kind of expect that to feel right in your mind. It's like, yeah. This was like shooting a water gun, just like a very limp stream. And like mechanically it was fine, but it just didn't have that like sense of, of power that I think I was looking so for. So it's made by like the same developers, right? No, so this, I forget the name of the, the studio, but I had not heard of them before this game, before Chaos Bane. So it's, mm. it's somebody that I'm not familiar with. Um, but some of the enemies are, are really cool. This game definitely like swarms you pretty immediately. I believe I got up to like level 10 or 11. And you go into the sewers and you get these like gross little like hedgehog looking dudes that just bombard. I mean, there are tons of them. And uh, there was a little later on, they all like kind of pile on top of each other. And they like, they're, it's like it's like a bunch of babies in like a trench coat kind of a vibe. <laughs> and they will spin and they'll like all get together and they'll come and they'll attack you. And when you hit them, eventually they'll get to the point where all the little hedgehog dudes will like fly off. Right. It's like, ah, that's neat. That's clever. It reminds me of like the way Heartless worked to build the big stuff in Kingdom Hearts and things right. like that. Yeah. Right, right, exactly, right. Yeah. Exactly like that. Yeah. Um, and so I like that quite a bit. Uh, there's the way that they help you deal with the swarms is they introduce this mechanic called bloodlust. Um, and what it is, is as you kill things, there will be these red orbs that drop and you can pick them up. And what I really like about it so far is the orbs haven't been that common. It's not like I'm constantly having bloodlust. It's spaced out enough where it's like, oh man, I'm in an oh shit moment where I'm just getting completely surrounded. I need to activate it. And once you do, you can just go nuts. And so I could just do this spread shot a crazy amount of times. It's like, okay, that's cool. That's basically, that's satisfying on a basic level. I think the only thing that disappointed me about it, and again, haven't played that much of this game, is it's like, it took a move that I was already doing, and it's just like, now you can do it more and faster. And yeah, it's like, I get, I get you. Yeah, like the idea here is really good, and I think there's, there's something solid, but I just wish this was 
visually a little bit flashier. So is there any uh, like satis- satis- like is there any satisfying way of like building it up or is it just a thing that you have like a resource that No, so uh, the way that you build it up is when you kill things there'll be red orbs that drop and so right. you have to get the red orbs and it'll fill up this gauge. So by just by killing enemies from any distance at any range in any way they get, they drop red orbs. Yes, potentially, but not everything was dropping okay. red orbs. Um, an interesting mechanic with the, the the wood elf is there's like this sprite that you can follow around, and as you use things beyond your basic attack, uh, you'll have a gauge that goes down. It's just like Diablo when you use special moves, there'll be a, a gauge that goes down. But you have this sprite. It's almost like like a Navi from Zelda kind of thing. If you go over and you touch that sprite, you'll actually refill some of your gauge, mm. and an hour and a half of the game is not enough to really analyze like the long-term implications of this. And it was a, it was an online beta. It was a closed beta. It, so there's multiplayer in it, right? Yes, there's multiplayer, and it was just drop in, drop out. Okay. So that's what I was about to ask. Like, so how is that constructed? Do you just like right. keep playing and people jump in? Right. So let's say you're playing on mouse and keyboard. You can just have somebody jump in with a controller, like on the same thing with you. In the closed beta, they said that you needed to be online, but this would not be a requirement for the final game. Yeah. So you can play it offline with your buds it seems like, uh, if you want to, which is cool. Um, but yeah, just following this spread around and the, the idea of like, okay, I need to run over to this thing in combat to refill my energy. I, I like that idea. I don't know if it'll actually play out very well in the full game, um, but it seemed cool. And so ultimately what I'm trying to say about Warhammer Chaos Bane, my, my ultimate impression, I hope I didn't get anything wrong. Not a lot of time with it, but it's like, like a budget Diablo, and that sounds really insulting, <laughs> and it's not, it's definitely not like changing the game, and I don't think it's super exceptional in any way, but if you like this kind of thing, it seems decent enough. I think that's cool. Yeah. I, I, I like it when games fall into that space sometimes. And not all games have to be giant blockbusters. They no. Just, they got to be like a fighting EX layer. Right. It's crazy and fun. Right. I don't need this game to be top eight Evo. I just need it to be fun. This game is not going to consume days of my life, but yeah. I will enjoy the time I spend with it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't love it, but there's enough there that I'm hoping in the future I'll get to check out more. Maybe not, but we'll see. All right. So, Max... This is where things are going to get a little bit weird. Okay. Ooh, I'm ready. It is time for the Hotake. This is this is funny because I have a, a running joke on my broadcast where Hokage is pronounced Hokage. <laughs> well, the leader of the Hokage. Yeah. You talk about Hokage a lot. I, I don't even know what it is, but I I love Hokage. Do you want to know? <laughs> Do you want to know? Let's go. <laughs> Please, you have to do it now. Oh, instruct him on Hokage the way. Hokage is like guy. president. I'm president oh. of Naruto's village. I'm oh, I thought Hokage. it was like oh, I thought it was like a like a like a like a clan. Like my this this my Hokage. They are no. my friends. Hokage is one person. I oh. want to be the Hokage. So I am the Hokage. You're the Hokage. Oh, that's yes. great. Yes. Did, was it was Hokage just like you pronouncing it incorrectly? Or how oh, did that's that my thing. That's my, that's 99 percent of my humor okay. is just pronouncing things wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, and it gets really good reception with it's confidence. Great. With confidence. Yeah. yeah it's you pronounced say, with confidence. You pronounce it yeah. like you've you've been doing this for years. Dude. <laughs> One of my one of my pet peeves is pronouncing things wrong. Like I hate I hate misspelling things uh-huh. and I hate mispronouncing things. Yet for as much as I hate it, I do it all the time. I intentionally all the time. I intentionally do it. I have a I have a small little YouTube video series, but it's like rate the super, where you take yes. like the supers of yes. characters and you just like give them cheese ball like numbers that don't matter ratings, like like nine out of ten or whatever. So I would have a, an episode where we did Smash Ultimate, which has arguably great supers for all its characters, and I'm like, so here we go. We got. Uh, this girl runs in. Her name's Metroid. She's. Uh, <laughs> it, you think it was a girl from the previous one, but it's actually a he under there. We just don't know from this point forward. And I would intentionally do this up, and people are like, "Excuse me." Like I would do it in the most like sarcastic way possible, mm-hmm. and uh, people still get really upset. Yeah. And I get a little bit of satisfaction out of that. Yeah. Because Max, some people find it really funny. There, there are times I swear where I'm like, okay, that was super obvious that it was a joke. Yeah. And sometimes. It's not as obvious. It's either not as obvious as you think, or it just like doesn't come across. (laughs) Exactly. Sometimes, and that's the way it goes. Uh, But for the Hotake, I I asked kind of like a general question outside of like what what you've been playing. Is something for us to chew on? And I know uh, a few weeks ago you actually touched on this uh, with the Yo Video Games guys, but I wanted to bring it up here for our audience. A because I I'm interested in it. I know Kyle's interested in it, and I know you're super interested in it. Capcom fighting games. 
we need another one. Yeah. Y- you said it in this video that you did a few weeks ago. They're not in the most prestigious place right now. No, they're th- not. The, I thought that was a really good way of framing it. But the the question for this is Hokage. Uh, <laughs> for this Hotake is if you were in if you were in charge of making a new Capcom fighting game right now, what would it be? Uh personally and I think the the best bet I would make a uh, I would make a Capcom All Stars game, yes. uh, a game that doesn't do a versus thing where it, it no longer requires S and K or you know Disney slash Marvel to take properties. Capcom, in my opinion, has the the best franchises, characters, and properties of every video game company next to Nintendo. Like they have the ability to make their Smash Brothers, you know, and not Smash Brothers is in like a platform fighter. Smash Brothers is in like an everyone is here sort of celebration of video games kind of thing. Um, and they do that in pretty much Marvel versus Capcom and Capcom versus SNK games of the past. Mm-hmm. So I would I would do that. I wouldn't make it a sixty dollar release. I would I would approach it like it was Killer Instinct. Um, make it a twenty dollar price point. Make a few characters free to play. Like you can just play people online. Each character has like endings and stuff, and expand the game that way. Start off as a small budget. Get people on board and then keep growing it, which is exactly what KI did. And it was risky as hell, like, no one no one seemed down for it, but eventually it was de- developed for four years and went up to have, like, almost 30 characters and four seasons of content. So that's a, that's a lot for a fighting game. That's more than any Marvel vs. Capcom has ever had, uh, by a long shot. So that's what I would personally do. Um, realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think that might be I'm a ways out. Uh, realistically, I'd make Marvel vs. Capcom 4. I would actually take a lot of the basis that they took with MVCI and then do that. But what's really going to happen is Street Fighter 6. Okay, so there's there's a lot to touch on there. Um, I want to talk to you about perception and how... Like we kind of mentioned it before, where people are like, oh man, I wish this had like another realm story mode or whatever. And you talked about how important characters were. Am I crazy, or you have something like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, which sold a bajillion copies, Mm -hmm. reviewed really well, and included everyone. Yeah, literally the kitchen sink. Right, and well, not not everyone, but the point still stands that it's it's just a crazy roster. If you do something where it's like Capcom's it come Capcom comes out and they're like this is a celebration of Capcom, don't you think on some level that inevitably leads to like how could you leave this out or is this DLC? And it, like and do you, it, don't you think the comparison hurts it? It it does and that's why you kind of have to start like as a platform like similar to how KI did. The yeah. game launched with like six characters and the first season only had eight characters in it. Yeah. But by the time like the next year came out, there was like five more additional characters. So it's. Similar, even similar to Street Fighter V, it's like a, a platform basis to to build upon. It's just the barrier of entry for SF5 is what hurt it the most because it was a game with not a lot at the start, promising a lot in the future, but it cost full price. I think you, I think the game should be approached with a sort of like um, a sort of different mentality where maybe we're not going to expand on all these other systems. Let's just make sure the online runs good. Let's give each character an arcade ladder and actually have a boss in there yeah. and maybe make some unique endings or something like that. We'll oh, add man. more modes down the line, which is what KI did too. There's and so many like Capcom characters that you so wouldn't necessarily need to be playable, but you could have be bosses. You can have be ro- mm. references and gameplay or bosses, and then maybe even down the line they could become playable characters. Like There are so many. Like... It, 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 a great example is um, if you look up, there's like a Capcom versus SNK like Neo Geo card fighting game where they made cards for all the popular Capcom characters and it is this giant thing and you look at it and you're like, this would be incredible if this was a fighting game. Um, so that's why I personally think that would be a good idea, but as like yeah, as like an, an investment like getting the Power Stone characters and Rival School characters and Darkstalkers back in their own individual game is super risky. Yeah. Like, and I understand why they wouldn't do that, but them alone is risky, but them together gives everyone a reason to maybe check it out. And we were playing that beat 'em up bumble bundle. Yeah. Like any of those games. Any have, of those games. Those characters. are so good. The crazy cat girl, you know. Yes. She, she actually is a costume in uh, Marvel Three. Like those characters have been in things. So they you have characters uh, like Captain Commando. He has a costume in 
Street Fighter V. Like, the crazy thing is that Street Fighter V has Capcom throwback costumes, and all those costumes, I'm like, I just want these characters in a game, man. Yeah, so... Oh, my God. So something like Mega Man. There are approximately one billion Mega Man games, yeah. and it's taken so many... Uh, iterations and there's there's super devoted hardcore followings for each of them for sure. classic Mega Man for X for Legends for Battle Network and I feel like people just naturally get mad if you don't give equal weight to all of them but of, like of course you can't or maybe well, you can I, I, but it's I, really hard and I don't think people would be like upset specifically if you took like even Mega Man and Mega Man X mm. like they're both characters with completely fundamentally different tools and abilities that they can use to to fight yeah and you just have to make that engaging and interesting sure. uh, so I don't and I understand people will always be disappointed that their character isn't there it's an it's impossible to make everyone happy people are still unhappy about things in the Smash roster that Goku or Superman isn't in or whatever yeah Banjo. you're ne never and even Sakurai said this like he they literally added everything and he's still getting haggled like <laughs> you're not gonna make everybody happy yeah we added everything but yeah. no one not everybody's gonna be happy right. that is just the way it is he had to See? publicly say please stop talking to me I, about yeah. this yeah <laughs> Oh my god, I'm going to break insane. something. <laughs> I'm convinced that Sakurai sold his soul. That man... Like, does anybody work harder than that man? And think uh, about how pretty crazy. Right. Think about how hard he tries to please people. And he cares about that game so much. And there's so much about Smash Ultimate that is insane. It's insane. A crazy person made this game. This man went insane, and you're harassing him over Goku. Stop it. It's yeah. not right. Oh, it makes me angry. It yeah. really does. And that's the thing is that even if you did have a Capcom versus Capcom game scenario where you can't you can't appease every single fan base, but you can grow upon it to hopefully make things better, you're never going to make everybody happy. Right. But at least you're making something that's actually super unique. You're combining all the crazy Capcom franchises like yeah, Power Stone, Rival Schools, Street Fighter, Marvel versus like and all the other crazy kooky games that they had back in the 90s that a lot of people don't remember and the beat em up bundles, you know, and the crazy new Capcom arcade stick. You can get Lynn Kurosawa <laughs> from Alien vs. Predator now. Put like, her in. Put her in. Yeah. Like, and that's and that's the thing that's why I've always loved about Marvel vs. Capcom is that it's about dreams coming true. Yes. Like you, you just could get the craziest characters. Like Jetta showed up in, in MBCI. That's really cool. Like Monster Hunter is one of the most badass fighting yes. game characters ever in yes. MBCI. She's awesome. But a lot of the rest of the game was like Chris Redfield and Spencer and stuff. Eight Dante. so great and Dante being the way he is and stuff like that. It's like there's obviously some parts that were rougher than others, but all I'm saying is that there was a, a master of Capcom fighting games back in the 90s and the early 2000s, and his name was Hideaki Itsuno. He's famous for Devil May Cry because he mm -hmm. pretty much did Day of MC3, Dragon's Dogma, Devil May Cry 5, Devil May Cry 4. And he was Capcom's fighting game guy. Like, he made Power Stone, he made Rival Schools, he made Street Fighter Alpha, he made one of the Darkstalkers, he made Star Gladiator, he made Capcom vs. SNK2. Like, he had a big part on all those games until one day, oh, we need you to work on DMC2 because we literally have nobody. And he kind of adopted the action game guy. How amazing would it be if he was able to bring his fighting games back? Because he's like, Rival Schools is like his baby and Power Stone is his baby. If he could bring those back in like a Capcom All Stars kind of way, it's gonna happen. Now I believe it's that that I mean, if everyone wants him to do Dragon's Dogma two, and I agree. It'd I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people. It'd be That'd neat be cool. to have Dragon's Dogma two, yeah. but I don't think he should be the head of it. I think he should he should expand and do something a bit crazy and different because, as as was explained, DMC five was like his one of his big requests. Like, let me do this, or else like you know, I, I might not be here anymore. And they let him do DMC five, and it ended up being great. So. Right. In my opinion, let him do another thing. Like he he understands what makes Capcom fighting games really good because he's responsible for a lot of them. I have a tough question. Yeah. yeah. Would a fighting game work? Would Street Fighter Six work if it's using RE Engine? Absolutely. You think so? Yeah. Absolutely. It depends on how it's handled. Yeah. And the characters' faces in like DMC Five and RE Two yeah. are stylized. Like yeah. if you look at the actors they're modeled upon, they don't look exactly like them. They they mold some stuff in certain ways. like But they're great-looking faces. But they're great-looking, cool characters. Yes. So you know how they they had the the people like stage out the cutscenes with the costumes yes. in DMC5? Yeah. That's all they need to do. That's where the magic happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As yeah. long as they do that, sure. it'll get, be a great Get the same game. cinematics director to work on like Street Fighter stuff. and I think cool... it would make an impact. I think actually people would say, wow, this one's different. So and Well, and it would just... I, I think if, it would just look amazing visually. Like yes. It would just like... Because 
part of the problem with Street Fighter V, I think some aspects of Street Fighter V look really good and some don't, but I think for a lot of people, it was like, oh, this is just kind of an evolution of four. Like, yeah. it wasn't exciting for people. I told yeah. this to the Capcom guys, even though I personally can see the differences. I know that all these games are different. Ryu does not play anything like Ryu in Street Fighter Four in this game. But you step 10 feet back, and you don't have that perspective. And you're just a person that's looking to buy a fighting game. This game looks like Street Fighter Four yeah. from 10 mm -hmm. feet away. So I think visually, something needs to change. Uh, it either needs to go into an alpha direction, and adopt like a shell cell shaded Dragon Ball Fighters sort of arc system work style, go crazy like not entirely insanely anime, but just as much as Street Fighter Two went to Street Fighter Alpha, which was a more cartoonish sort of like different style. Yeah. Or you do the other direction. Now we're like super cartoony sort of characters that we kind of have now. Let's take this into an insane realistic direction where we actually make a really cool looking gritty realistic Ryu and Ken. Don't you know? Don't make them look super hyper real like. Make them look cool, like yeah. Capcom's good at doing. So, just imagine of getting a trailer with like an incredibly like, you you see like Ryu and Ken fighting in the rain in low light or something like that, and then like the lightning comes in and you see their ripped ass muscles and they punch and all the water goes everywhere. Like yeah. that type of hyper detail can actually be shown, and then the replay kicks in. You see it in slow motion and all ha like. That has a chance to look a lot different than Street Fighter 4 or 5, and it has a chance to look really damn cool. The problem is, is that Division 2, which is the division that makes fighting games, doesn't use RE Engine. They use Unreal. Right, but that's that's not something that has to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. It's just their experience barrier, and are they willing to change? And there is a chance that they're willing to change because, yeah, the Capcom fighting game division went through a huge overhaul over the past year and a half. Yes. Like, Ono's no longer in charge. Right. They brought the guy in from Monster Hunter. Yes. Like, a lot of stuff happened. Is that all after the release of Inf Infinite? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Right after that. Cool. So there was, a, there was like, there's clearly something wrong here. And we haven't if seen I'm, a new if game I'm recalling since. correctly, I okay. think it was September 2018 is when this was happening. Yeah, when there's in the announcement. I think, the announcement, that's right. I think that's the right. announcement was actually in April, and then the actual change sure. was like, something needs to happen. Gotcha. Um, so, all things considered, I would love to see Marvel vs. Capcom 4 look like Marvel 3, but evolved. Mm. I would love to see Street Fighter 6 take a more gritty, hyper-realistic, but badass looking. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to Street Fighter 6 looking like Mortal Kombat 11. Like, I really wouldn't, but Japanese in style instead of Western in style, yeah. right? Like, MK11 has got realistic characters, but they look really cool. Yeah, and they do extremely unrealistic stuff and we're not, you know, we're not scoffing at they it. They do yeah. that in DMC5 as well and yeah. we're completely okay with it. I I think that'd be neat, man. It it took some getting used to at first, but oh, I ended yeah. up really admiring the direction DMC5 took oh, yeah. because it it's exactly what you're describing. It's both very realistic in a lot of ways, but also super stylized. It still felt like DMC. Yeah. Uh it's yeah. Um the Dragon's Dogma thing, it's its so hard for me because I think Dragon's Dogma is one of those... Like, I think it's wrong <laughs> to put an individual person on these, like on too high of a pedestal. There's a lot of people making these games. Yeah. But I do believe, based on my experience with his work, that Itsuno is a guy that like has strong visions for yeah. games. And he loves them. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> they're good visions. And I think Dragon's Dogma is one of those things where... There's something incredible in there, and if you just like got another crack at it, it yeah. could be amazing. And so it's it's hard for me to be like, okay, pull them off. Well, Dragon's Dogma is a weird game too because it was like ten years in development and sure. like all this crazy stuff. Like, so all things considered, it's like here's an idea of what Itsuno can do now with the property. If you like, you give me the budget and let me work it out and let me do it my way. And yeah. you get Devil May Cry Five. Like, yeah. Let, let him it. Do, do it again. Just <laughs> let him make the shot, call the shots again, give him the budget, and just go at it. Because he can, there's a lot of great stuff in the past of Capcom. And I, I love what, as I would like to see just another Animusha or something like that. Right. I feel that's like a safe, a really safe route, and they could they could take some crazy risks. Um, reading just interviews with Itsuno and, and him discussing, like, kind of the, the thought process behind Devil May Cry 5, he was saying that there's a lot of good, like, cinematic action games, but there wasn't a lot of good pure action games, in his words. Yeah. And I really thought that perspective was interesting because I think he's, he's in this great and unique position where he completely understands, 
like the core appeal of those games and what make them special to so many people yeah. while also having enough ideas to make them feel new and to draw new people in. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you're you putting him on Street Fighter 6 or whatever, some new Capcom fighting game at Capcom All-Stars makes a lot of sense to me in that regard. I want to talk to you about your, your Killer Instinct uh, uh, pricing method because I think that's a good idea. Yeah. But do you think it would be a problem of perception where if you charge less or you do some things in a free-to-play way that people will immediately think less of it or think it's inferior because of the pricing method? Well, I think, you know, there's methods that are, like, predatory of people's wallets and, and things with free, free-to-play free sort of things. Yeah, but even if it's not, I just feel like there's a stigma there. There, there absolutely was, and there was a stigma with, with KI when it was first done that way. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, a KI had, like, the most... Easiest way you can play. So you can download it for free. You can do the tutorials. You got access to like one character and that character was on a rotation. So it was like a character in the roster that you would get free for that week. But you can do their story mode. You can do, you can play them online. You can practice with them. You can do training. You can pretty much play the game, but it was just the one character. Yeah. If you wanted to get access to others, you can piecemeal them. And, or if you piecemealed a certain amount up to like 20 bucks, then you would get like, you know, the first season of characters or get the whole thing for, $40 Forty to sixty dollars is what it have ended up being, but over the course of the game, they added a ton of stuff. They added tons of modes. They added cutscenes and cinematics that I worked on, and the story modes and stuff. They added giant like uh, campaign things where you have to stop Gargos and get all these assets and go around the world and get literally consumables like Mortal Kombat, but done in a more kind of fun way. Mm-hmm and uh, expanded the game upon it. And you pretty much have that expansion based on, this is why it has to start off as a kind of a small project, get some cool looking stages, get about like less than 20 really cool Capcom characters that people like, do a low barrier of entry and give people a reason to sort of fall in love with it and an easy barrier of entry. And there can be, the easiest thing you can do to, to get people to be on board and still make money off of the fact that it's free to free to play you can piecemeal the characters, and you can offer, offer bonus costumes. Mm. People paid for the extra bonus costumes, and apparently in KI they sold really well. They had like classic costumes from KI One. Oh yeah, those were cool. And there, it was just neat. And yeah. that cost an extra twenty bucks. Like that actually cost twice as much as it cost to to buy the game. And it came with other stuff like you got to play the original Killer Instinct. But people thought it was worth it. Apparently, it sold really damn well. Yeah, like I think that. Ben, to, to your point about, like, doesn't it make the, the release feel like a less of a game? Mm-hmm. Like, it kind of does, right? It does. Like, like, Mortal Kombat 11, you know, exploded, had a great day, launch day, right? But I think what Killer Instinct had was it sustained itself. So it didn't have that crazy huge launch. Yeah. But it was able, as you just said, like, it's to grow. F- five, four or five seasons, right? It, like went, it went four years of constant development. That's crazy, right? Like, yeah. So it was able to keep that audience there because of the way that it released. And Max, you, you would be the one to. Correct me if I'm wrong, but from, I, I'm not a Killer Instinct guy. Mm-hmm. From my perspective, it felt like Killer Instinct was sustaining itself, but it wasn't like explosively popular. And it it, it really it really wasn't. And the you know the reason why it was on the Xbox One. Sure. I mean, to be completely fair, it took a long time for that game to show up on PC, much less like Windows 10 and everything like that. So that was honestly the big aggregate. If that if that game came out on all systems, it would have been huge. And if it was crossplay, it would have been even huger. Uh, it came out on a system that everyone hated when when it was launched. Yeah. It, so it, that it, stigma also. And but the fact that it was able to strive through that, the fact that everyone's saying, "Oh, the best Xbox One game now has been Killer Instinct sure. for a long time," and the fact that in terms of all the Xbox One exclusives there are, Killer Instinct is the one that usually people will mention mm-hmm. because it was yeah, it was really it was really fun and had some of the best netcode and all that stuff. I think. Without that stigma, you just have a, a Capcom thing that a lot of people have been asking for for a long time mm-hmm. with a low barrier of entry. Number one, you have to put it on everything. You have to put it on Switch. You have to put it on <laughs> PC. And if you're, if, you're, if you're avoiding all the platforms at this point, you're just losing out on on revenue. Right. They put Mortal Kombat on Switch for crap's sake. There's I bet no they made a lot of money anymore. off that too. Oh my God. Yeah. You better believe it. Regardless of how good of a port it is, it doesn't right. matter. The option is there and it still plays like Mortal Kombat. So... As long as people have those options and you can sort of share maybe some of your assets between all the versions and just make it like how KI was, sort of like once you had it on one, you had it on on PC as well. Just make it easy on people instead of harder and give people the options to spend more if you want. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a fair way of treating like a free game, a sort of, or a low barrier of entry price game. Because really like Street Fighter V when it came out, 
It's a twenty dollar game. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was not a sixty. Even when the story came out, I'm like, story's not even that good. Like, and much less it barely even had like the functionality of anything. It took like a year for the game to even feel like it was close to worth what it came out as, mm -hmm. and it still wasn't. To get arcade edition took two years. So. They have a history of already doing this stuff. Like right. it's like you can actually approach a similar situation. Just don't make it sixty bucks. Yeah, exactly. I think I think people will be understanding of a bare bones version if they can hop in for free or yeah. a very low cost. Yeah, I I think that was all extremely well said, Max. We have some uh, some questions from our patrons, and uh, some of them some of them are pretty fun. We've okay. had some intense discussions, so I think we're gonna wrap up by just being like a little bit more. Casual. Uh, this has been a blast, by the way. I just want to say before <laughs> we wrap up. Uh, but Eric Jackson asks, favorite cheese attack in a fighting game? Eric's is Shiva's down up stomp attack from Mortal Kombat 3. Uh, I got one, actually. Hit me. Uh, Eddie Gordo just pressing oh. square. I'm a pro. Yeah. Just do, 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 X do, and do, circle do, do, do. and yeah, Eddie yeah. and Tekken 3. He just would he would just repeat oh, his yeah. loop of oh, the yeah. ground as low to mid to low to mid and it was oh, hard yeah. as hell to stop. Yeah. That's pretty Those cheesy. That's a good answer. That's yeah. that's like the answer. I feel um, like that's yeah. super good. I I would say personal favorite cheese attack when Bison is selectable in the old Street Fighter twos and doing Psycho Crusher. It was very hard. Just to across stop. the screen? Just across the screen. It was fast and hard to stop and safe on block and would leave you with enough hits to block stun in the end to get a mm -hmm. throw. So if you block Psycho Crush, you're taking damage. It was very cheesy. Uh, this is a recent one for me, and I, like I don't even think it's true anymore. But Soul Calibur Six, uh, I I played Nightmare and just felt dirty the whole time. <laughs> like like people out just shit. doing so much damage <laughs> from, from doing so little and just like you just <clears throat> just hitting triangle and watching that sword swing overhead and watching a huge chunk of their life bar. Nightmare is the perfect character in that game because he's really good yeah. but he's also like once you know right, he right, really right. breaks down. It was just like at launch yeah. I felt like I could see oh. people getting mad. Yeah, you could just, yeah. you could rip people apart just due yeah. just due to like this is gimmicky because it's not going to last forever. But right. damn, does it feel good? Right, right, right. Eddie Gordo is a perfect answer. I, I had the weirdest memory just now. Um, what's Steve Urkel's show? Family, Family Matters. matters. Yeah. Family Matters. There, for some reason, there was like a Mortal Kombat episode where Steve Urkel was in the game, and he had a move where he goes, "Have some cheese," <laughs> and he throws cheese at oh you. Oh my god, that is bringing back some weird, yeah. And like that kind of thing used to excite me out of my mind as a kid. Just like, what? There's a video game with Steve Urkel. Like that's so cool. Like, right. well, I mean, it's it's gotten to the point now where it's like you have Freddy Krueger in Mortal Kombat, so it's like. Guest characters have just become. Please send me that link. You know what's crazy? Huh. He, he became Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes. Wait, and what? he was good. Julia White. Ju Julia White was Sonic the Hedgehog, the voice. I was like, hey, some chili dogs, you know, like the smooth Sonic. Yeah, the, the Hedgehog. smooth Sonic. He was the voice. That's huh. a crazy, yeah, tidbit. <laughs> okay, but I think nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> I think nothing else after that. This yeah. is sad. Thing. I can't. I can't think of anything else beyond <laughs> that. Yeah. Um. Man, I said I was going to keep this light, but this is this is a little bit more serious of a question, okay. but I oh, like okay. it. Uh, Joseph asks, how much of a baseline do viewers need to enjoy watching esports? Even as someone who plays Overwatch religiously and watches tons of videos dedicated to strategies, it's sometimes tough to follow exactly what's happening in a live game between two well-oiled professional teams. So I can't imagine what it's like to watch for someone who normally plays more traditional shooters like Counter-Strike Go, or even worse, someone who doesn't play video games at all. Uh, I, I think the baseline exists for how much you want it to exist. Like, uh, like, do you casually like watch NFL if you're not a sports fan? You don't. Like, unless you're given a reason to, then you'll find a way to be invested for like a Super Bowl because you want to see commercials or something like that. And it's the same thing for esports. Like, I I'm not going to find myself watching competitive Overwatch at any point. Sure. So it's not it's, it's not going to make any sense to me with what's happening, you know, regardless of how much they explain it, unless I want to put in the effort to doing so. Right. So for for the sake of 
this is this ultimately boils all the way back down to how do you get people interested in being competitors for fighting games, mm -hmm. which boils back down to you put every damn character in the game to give right. someone a reason to start playing it to understand it. Once they start understanding it, then they'll want to see, oh, this guy's good with this character. He's playing at this event. I'm going to watch that. I'm going to go see how people do when they're good. It has to come, it has to trickle back all the way to the start of how good the game actually is. So. When Overwatch came out, yeah, I played a bit of Reaper and stuff and was just yeah. having fun. And yeah, I was watching people that were much better playing on teams and things like that. You joking about the edginess of, of Reaper is pretty funny. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I found much humor in wearing black lipstick. Yes. Uh, but yeah, that's, I, I think the overall like viewership and all that aspect and the spectacle boils down to people just have to give a shit. Like, you have to care about Street Fighter in some way. You have to care about Mortal Kombat in some way or getting better at it to eventually go beyond the story mode, you know? Yes. Max, I agree with you, and I think, like, you are largely... I Like, I'm on board with that 100%. However, I do think there are very smart things that can be done to improve that experience. So, like, mm -hmm. Tekken 7, for example, I love the slow-mo oh, and around stuff. Like, yeah. anything that you can do that can make it naturally feel closer or more exciting, I think that's good. I and think even, like, fatalities are... are a, Part of that, and I don't even feel that uh, the slow mo stuff is is even for like esports or viewership. It's just an awesome, right. cool. It's right. just like even even as a person that would never play that game, that's just awesome. Go, oh! Like everyone screams when that shit happens. Right. It's mm -hmm. so cool. So it, that it, to me personally, it boils down to just cool gameplay stuff. Yeah, this is why I don't like developers that design games, design fighting games for like like esports. I don't agree with that. I think your 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 fighting game should be designed for fun. Mm -hmm. The number one priority should be how fun is this character? How much cool stuff can we do with them? And the more cool stuff that is more fun and satisfying to do, the better. Because if the number one priority isn't fun, then I don't know what the hell is going on. Because this that's the ultimate uh, argument I have against like designing games, fighting games safe. Because sure. it should always be designed for fun. Our last question comes in from Parasite Paladin. Hello, panel. How do you go about finding your best or favorite character in a fighting game? Is playing and learning every character in a game a waste of time, or is it the only way to figure it out? Let me tell you, playing through Classic Mode and Smash Ultimate took some time. Mm. Parasite Paladin played through every character is in Classic? I think that is the implication. I'm going to go ahead and say that's unnecessary. Hmm. I don't yeah. think you have to play. I don't think you have to get good with every character to, to know which one is yours. Definitely, oh, don't. Yeah. I don't think you have to play every it's character. Fine if you want to. It's fine yeah. if you want to because it's like, yeah, you feel like you're com you're completing a game. But if you right. actually like want to get good, you don't need to like the the difference between understanding a game mechanically and then going beyond that to a level of comfortability where you know everything about your character and everything of how to fight the other characters. You can do that with just one. Like I just I know Marth, you know, right. in Smash, and I know how everything works against uh, against K. Roll, but now you have to apply that information to every single one of the seventy four other characters right. or seventy three other characters. So that's a lot of that's a lot of game. Like that's going to take you thirty years. <laughs> like that's going to take you a long time to actually be good at all the matchups in Smash Brothers. Much less like, even a game like Mortal Kombat Eleven, which is twenty five characters big, and learning the matchups there. It's going to take you a long time. Like yeah. even. Even at the end of the beta, which I only had four characters of MK11, I was just understanding all the matchups. So that's that's more than enough game to to eventually get to the point of understanding how people play those characters and then how the person actually plays. It'll take you. That's why fighting games can last forever. So uh, if he's, if he's, if you're playing a fighting game and just going through story mode and playing character in classic towers or you know classic arcade mode and seeing endings, that's that's cool. But the real, the real depth comes at you play one character and you know how to fight all of them. Right. For me, I don't even know if this is a good method, but it's a mix of like just conceptually interesting and viable. Like what I'll do is I'll be like, like Tekken 7 is a good example where I'm like, I'm playing King because everything about King speaks to me. I think he's awesome. Just watching him slam people into the dirt is cool. Mm -hmm. And he roars. Yeah. And I had fun playing with him. So it was like kind of an immediate, like, I think you look cool and I'm having a good time playing you. Whereas something like Soul Calibur 6, I tried a bunch of people 
where until I found Nightmare, it was like, oh, like I'm actually getting results with this things character. Things are working. Yeah, things are working, and I think they look cool. And so like that's where it stopped because I had found that point. Yeah. Where kind of both those things were lining up, and that's really how I go about it. MK11 was the same way. Like I was kind of just messing around until I got to Aaron Black. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is working, and I think he's cool. Um, and yeah, I I don't know. Everybody treats it differently and there's a lot of benefit in just going to practice mode and messing around but sometimes i think people overthink it too people like, overthink it a bit too much yeah because yeah, i think like if sometimes if you have the mentality of like okay i absolutely have to find the best character for me no matter what in all situations and people require a tier list when the game's out i need right. to play a character that's good it's like in, in my opinion just just start playing the game. Exactly, exactly. Because you'll do all this work, and yeah. then you'll burn yourself out before you even get to that, the... that, That's not necessary. Right. And I, I have my own personal attachments. A lot of it's nostalgia, because fighting games now are just based on legacy, for the most part. Like, a lot of newer fighting games are based on old characters. And I would just pick up a random character in a game that has a bunch of new stuff, like, yeah, fighting EX Slayer, much less, you know, a anything else that's sort of indie-made. And just, how do the special moves feel? How does it feel to go from this, can I, can I combo? Can I do this? Oh, wow, that felt really cool. That looked cool, and they bounce up, and I threw them the other way. Wow, I'm going to do that again. Yeah. And that's just that's just playing the video game. Uh, so fig everyone's going to have their different approach. That's how I approach it. And sometimes it doesn't work out great. Like, Biken came out in Guilty Gear x Hard Revelator 2, mm -hmm. one of my favorite female characters in fighting games. And she was a nightmare. Like, it was so difficult to get anything done and I like tried to persevere of just getting my complete ass whooped and right. dealing with the online and the character is like fundamentally just like sort of jacked up and I just didn't want to play anymore. So even though it's like I got my favorite character back, it if they don't play well and they look amazing, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like it, it became tough. So that's how I approach it, you know? And that was that was kind of a rough thing for me with um Strider Hiryu in, in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 when he was introduced in Ultimate. He wasn't that great of a point character. He was mostly like an assist slash X-Factor character. But I still played him, but I wasn't I wasn't thrilled with how he played, you know? Visually, and correct me if I'm wrong, Strider is like visually one of your favorites in oh, any yeah. game. Yeah, yeah okay. he's probably my favorite fighting game, individual like fighting game character next to like Rock Howard from cool. like SNK and like Canon stuff. But I think Strider just this cyber like future ninja. Mm -hmm. This is the sickest stuff. Uh, Kyle, do you have an approach for landing on a fighting game character? It is. It's definitely like on-screen personality. Mm. You know, it it's like so Smash Bros. Like I I was attracted to Lil Mac. Like Lil Mac's where I landed because I just love a big punch. I was gonna say pink hoodie. And the pink hoodie helps. Yeah. Out. You're up. It might help a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just like just like hitting someone hard. Like mm -hmm. Smash Bros. is just about punching, and like that's all he does. Yeah. I love the idea. Like he's just charging up a punch that'll knock you out in one hit. Yeah. If I land this, that's so fun. That's a mechanical thing that's actually attaching you to the character. Yeah. 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 And so yeah, it's, it's like everything all into itself. It's really cool. Uh, Kyle, I have to bring this up because I, I I legitimately thought it was such a cool moment. So we had a tournament for Smash Brothers, and I had been playing Smash Brothers and like really getting into it. But I had like played no against like pretty much no Little Mac. Mm -hmm. And Kyle went into this tournament and he just crushed me with Little Mac just because I just like wasn't prepared for a Smash character moving this way. Like it had yeah. just been too long. And I love that. I love those moments where like you get in one frame of mind, and either somebody's play style or the mechanics of somebody specifically just completely trips you up. It just feels like, oh man, there's still more for me to learn. I love that feeling. All right, this might be the longest frame trap we've ever done. Oh Ooh. no! It, no, 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 no! <laughs> I think it was worth it. Uh, this this show is a, is a test of endurance. We're of, only one hour away from the five hour frame right? trap. We're one hour away from the five we hour can't, frame trap. We can't trap. stop now. <laughs> Uh, dude, thank you so much for dropping no down here and, and just like talking about all this stuff and giving your perspective. I think it was extremely informative and I'm really grateful uh, that you made the journey. And of course, Kyle, thank you. Man, I, I feel bad because sometimes I feel like uh, you couldn't get a word in edgewise, but I appreciated you jumping in when you could, man. I was. It's a pleasure. It is. I'm a listener. Yes. Remember us talking are. about Mortal Kombat when we, were, when we were playing Bayonetta 2 or Street Fighter like way back in the day. Here's what I remember. You wanted a Ryu with gray hairs. 
We that's got M. Right. Bison with gray hairs. That's right. But I, I remember that. And I, I was, was like, like, man, this guy's a genius. I want, I want an older, like, grizzled Ryu. Yeah, and they and did, like, they like, did do Beardo Ryu. Which yeah. was, they did do which Hot Ryu. Awesome. Which is yeah. which should have been the main character. How the hell was bearded, like, Hot Ryu not... They the messed up. They, they messed, messed up. up. They messed up. They messed up. It was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we took questions for Frame Trap uh, this episode from Patreon. Normally, we do it uh, via email. If you'd like to send in a question, please email askeasyallies at gmail.com. Um, one more time, big thank you to Max. Big thank you to everybody who made it through the, these four hours. Um, and yeah, we will be back with a regular episode next time. Until then, I messed up the ending. <laughs>